Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Exile's Valor, a novel of Valdemar, by Mercedes Lackey, narrated by Paul Woodson. 1. Muted light, richly colored, poured gold and sapphire into the sparsely furnished sitting room in Harold Alberich's private quarters behind the training sow. Now that the colored window was installed and the protective blanket taken off, it made that little room look entirely different. Alberich hardly recognized it. The four journeyman glass workers who had helped their master install the piece were gone now, leaving Alberich alone with the artist himself. Both of them gazed on the finished product in silence, while behind them a warm fire crackled on the hearth. It was a staggeringly beautiful piece of stained glasswork. In fact, Alberich thought, it would not be exaggerating to say it was a masterpiece. Not that he had expected less than a fine piece from the master of the glassworkers' guild, but this was over and above those expectations. The artisan responsible for its creation stepped forward and gave the top right-hand corner a final polish with a soft cloth, removing some smudge not visible to ordinary eyes. He flicked off an equally invisible dust mote as well and stepped back to view the expanse of blues and golds with a critical eye. A man gone gray in his profession, he was tall, but not powerful, with wiry, knotty muscles rather than bulging ones. His expression was unreadable, a square-jawed, hook-nosed fellow whose face might have been stone rather than flesh. "'It'll do,' he grunted finally, his long face betraying nothing but a flicker of content. A work of power and beauty it is, Alberich replied, unusual warmth of feeling in his voice. It is exceeding my expectations, which were high already. Your skill is formidable, Master Kewlin. It'll do, the artisan repeated, but with just a touch more satisfaction in his voice. I'll not praise myself, but it'll do. This was such understatement that Alberich shook his head. In so many ways this was a piece of artwork that went far, far beyond even the monumental works that only the great and wealthy could afford, be they individuals or organizations. It was the care to every detail, as much as the design, that showed that expertise. For instance, to protect the fragile leaded glass, made up of pieces no larger than a coin, the panel had been installed against the existing window. Now the bars holding those old panes in place could have cast distracting lines across the new pattern, except that Master Kewlin had taken that into account in his design, and the shadows had been integrated in such a way that unless you looked for them, you did not notice them. Yet Master Kewlin seemed no more than mildly pleased that everything had worked out as he had planned. Alberich knew that tone, not only from working with Master Kewlin on this window— but from working with others who shared the same obsessive drive to excellence that marked the man's work. No point in heaping him with effusive praise, for it would only make him uncomfortable, and he would begin to point out flaws in the work not visible to anyone but him. "'Very happy you have made me,' he said instead. "'Never shall I weary of this piece.' And although he had paid Master Kewlin already— when he shook the man's hand in thanks, a heavy little purse that had been in his hand slipped quietly into the master's. That was the way of doing business in Carsey, when one was pleased with special work. Some things, Alberich felt, were probably universal, an extra consideration for work that exceeded expectation being one of them. Evidently the custom held true in Valdemar, because Master Kewlin did not seem in the least surprised. He said nothing only pocketed the purse with a nod of thanks. He dusted off his hands on the side of his brown leather tunic. All of his clothing, tunic, breeches, even his shirt was leather, because leather wasn't likely to catch fire. "'Well, if you're that satisfied, Harold Alberich, I'll be off,' the glassmaster said. "'I've that lazy lot of prentices to beat back at my studio, for no doubt they'll have ruined the cobalt plate I laid out for them to cut for the new Pothecary Guild window I, and muddled the designs I set them to copy, and complain I've assigned them too much work. Alberich shook his head in mock sadness. It is ever so, he agreed and sighed. The younger generation. We were never like that, eh? 
Master Kulin barked a laugh and slapped Alberich's back. The weapons master allowed a hint of a smile to show, and the glass master winked. Well, tis heavy work we have before us. You know what the old saw is. A boy's ears are on his backside. He heeds better when he's beaten. Since there was nearly the identical saying in Carsey, Alberich nodded, and with another exchange of pleasantries, he escorted the glass master out. Indeed, some things were universal. But since it was not yet time for the next class of heraldic trainees to arrive for their weapons training, he returned to his sitting room in the back of the training cell to admire his newly installed possession once more. This was more than a mere ornament. While there was a temple of Vacandis Sunlord down in Haven proper, though for obvious reasons it was referred to even by Carsite exiles as the Temple of the Lord of Light, Alberich seldom was able to get there for the daylight ceremonies. Certainly he was never able to arrive for the all-important sunrising rite. Contrary to what the current Carsite priesthood wished their followers to think, it was very clear in the writ, now that Alberich had seen copies of the old original versions, that any follower of the Sun Lord could perform the rites, with or without a sun priest. It was what was in the heart, not the words, that mattered and prayerful meditation at any time was appropriate. And now Alberich had an image here, a proper image, that would put him in the proper frame of mind. There had been a plain glass window here, but the presence of such an expanse of clear glass had made Alberich, on reflection, rather uneasy. It was fine for the former weapons master, Harold Daythor, to have such a thing, but Daythor didn't have to think about potential Carsite assassins peering through it or the far more common but equally annoying habits of the young, idle, and foolish offspring of Valdemar and nobles daring each other to spy on the dreaded weapons master from Carsey. Not that they'd see anything except Alberich reading, pacing, or staring at the fire, or occasionally entertaining a visitor, but it made him irritated to think of them watching him. It wasted their time, annoyed the companions, and made the back of his neck prickle for no good reason. If he sensed someone watching him, he wanted to know there was danger, not adolescent curiosity behind it. But he hadn't wanted to block off the window either. Very useful light came in there by day, although the view was nothing spectacular, just one of the groves of Companion's Field. It had been Harold Elkarth who had suggested the stained-glass panel when he had mentioned the annoyance of looking up to see lurkers in the bushes one night. It had nearly been former lurkers in the bushes, and it was a good thing for them that he had Cantor out there to warn him it was only some unaffiliates and a bardic trainee, because his hand had been on the one-handed crossbow he kept under the table, and he had no problem with shooting out a window, especially not his own window. A bit of broken glass was a small price to pay for your life. He hadn't mentioned that to Elkarth, however though he thought he saw some understanding in the other's nod. Perhaps that was why the Herald had suggested the stained-glass panel. And at that moment Alberich had realized how he could bring a kind of Vacandis chapel into his own home, make this place truly his home, and solve that problem of the huge window in a single stroke. Elkarth hadn't known where to obtain such a thing, but Harold Jadis had, in fact, Jadis had pointed him to the particular glassworks involved in creating most of the stained and etched glass windows for the various temples in and around Haven, whenever a generous patron was moved to donate such a thing. Until he went to the workshop and saw some of the designs, Alberich hadn't been entirely certain of the exact shape and image of the design, only that it should have some link, somehow, to the temples that he had felt most comfortable in. As soon as he realized what Kulin specialized in, heraldic rather than heraldic designs, he had realized what his window surely must show. The sun in glory of the god of Carsey, of course. Vacandis sun lord in a form that few in Valdemar would recognize as such, and no one who mattered would likely take offense to, particularly as this sun in glory would be laid out not on the usual field of reds as in a similar window in Carsey, but on a field of heraldic blue. If Master Kulin realized just what the pattern was, he hadn't said anything. Alberich would not have wagered on his being ignorant, though. 
He had been doing religious glasswork for far too long not to have learned virtually every symbol of every deity worshipped in Haven, and every possible variation and nuance of each symbol. The Countess was worshipped here, and by Carsite exiles, just not under that name. The Lord of Light was what he was called here, all things considered, a title and a name less likely to evoke hostility from the good neighbors of those exiles. Alberich would not have taken it much amiss had Master Cullen delegated the work to his apprentices either. But he hadn't. He'd attended to it all himself. And the result was glorious, well worth the cost of the one indulgence that Alberich had permitted himself since he'd been made weapons master. Very nice for us, too, his companion Cantor commented, as Alberich sat down and allowed himself to drink in the color and composition. We get the best view of it at night, when the light is coming from inside. Clever of you to station lanterns with reflectors shining outward at the bottom corners. Gives us a lovely piece to look at. And prevents any shadows falling upon it and telling people what goes on in my sitting room, he pointed out. After paying no small fortune for such a piece, I've no mind to have it shattered by an ill-considered crossbow bolt from outside because I was foolish enough to show a target. Since there was no graceful reply to that, Cantor wisely declined to make one. The leaded glass was thicker and heavier than the window it had been mounted against, and Alberich realized after a moment of sitting there that the drafts he'd become accustomed to were gone. Well, an unforeseen advantage. And a third, as he bathed in the golden light from the sun in glory, despite the fact that on the other side of the glass there was a bleak winter landscape under overcast skies, he understood why Master Cullen had insisted that the sun dominate the panel. No matter what the weather outside, the light coming in would be warm and welcoming. Already Alberich felt his spirits become a little lighter. For which my gratitude to Master Cullen knows no bounds, Cantor observed dryly. Anything that sweetens your temper makes me grateful. Indeed, Alberich countered. Alas, that he cannot do me the return favor of creating such a thing for you, since you spend your days out of doors. Perhaps I should query Bardic Collegium about the possibility of serenading you on a thrice-weekly basis to sweeten your temper. Then who would chastise the greenlings properly? Cantor asked airily. Disciplining the youngsters requires a certain acidity of temper to deliver correction with the appropriate degree of sting. Alberich shook his head. He should learn never to try and exchange barbs with his companion. Cantor would always win. Cantor was at least as old as his chosen, probably a few years Alberich's senior, and twice as witty. Not that there wasn't some truth in what Cantor said. Cantor was to the young companions what Alberich was to the heraldic trainees in a way. Not so much the trainer in fighting technique, for a great deal of that was in the hands of the riding instructors, but as the disciplinarian of the companion herd. Normally that would be in the hands, or rather authority backed by speech and occasionally hooves and teeth, of the companion to the queen's own herald, the grove-born Rolan. But Roland's herald was Queen's own Talamir, who had very nearly died in the last battle with the Tedrils on the border with Carsey. Talamir's original companion Tavor had died, and one never spent much time in Talamir's presence without realizing that in many ways it had been no great service to Talamir that he had been brought back to life again. Though Cantor had never said as much in so many words, Alberich got the distinct impression that most of Roland's time was taken up in making sure that Talamir remained, well, sane. So a good portion of Roland's duties to the herd had been delegated to those best suited to the task. Not all of those duties had gone to Cantor, either. Some were the provenance of some very wise old companion mares— thus ironically echoing the hierarchy in a real horse herd, where the leaders were the oldest mares, not the stallion— as Alberich very well knew. Hmm, and human herds, though ye know it not. Your point being, Alberich replied, though you'd best not let Queen Selene discover you think of her as an old mare, wise or not. He sensed Cantor's snort of derision. Selene should be perfectly happy to be compared to a companion mare. 
Alberich let that one go. There was no use trying to explain to Cantor that no nubile young woman was going to appreciate being compared to a mare, ever, under any circumstances. Particularly not when her counselors, some of them anyway, were very diligently trying to make her into one, of the brood stock variety. Which was one reason why he had welcomed Master Cullen's arrival this afternoon to install the window, as the perfect excuse to avoid the afternoon council meeting. That particular item was on the table for discussion, and it was a subject that Alberich was particularly anxious not to get embroiled in. For one thing, no matter how publicly he'd been lauded and laden with honors after the Tedril Wars, no matter how trusted he was by most, by no means all, Valdemarans of note, he was still the outsider. He was, and always would, be so. It could not be otherwise. And for another, well, well, it was a subject where nothing he said or did was safe. Someone would take exception, whether he urged that Selene remain single, or weighed in on the side of those who wanted her to wed, and at this point he didn't need to add any enemies to a list that was already long enough. The atmosphere of the council chamber this afternoon was unwontedly subdued. Usually there had been at least three arguments by this time, and the kinds of icy, polite catcalling that made people who were not used to council debates blanch and wonder if a duel was about to break out. Today, however, was different. The atmosphere hadn't been so edgily cordial since the first tentative sessions after Selene's coronation. Around the horseshoe-shaped, heavy wooden table not a voice had been raised. The representatives of the bardic, heraldic, and healer circles, in their red, white, and green uniforms respectively, had been extremely quiet, as had the Lord Marshal's herald and the Seneschal's herald, and of course her own, the Queen's own herald, Talamir. As for the rest, well, they had been nervous— they didn't really know her, although she had been in their midst all of her life. They were her father's counsel, really, not hers. They were his friends, advisers, and peers, and none of them had expected to serve her at all, much less so quickly. So they often argued and battled among themselves as if she wasn't even there, or was no more than a token placeholder. Except on the rare occasions when what they wished to do was going to have to involve her. Then they generally acted as they did today, becoming very quiet and rather nervous. These elder statesmen and women were apparently unaware that they gave themselves away acting as they did. Queen Selene knew why they were nervous, of course. They didn't know she knew, which might have been funny under other circumstances. In the throne that had been her father's, with the chair at her right hand empty— Selene watched her counselors behaving as if they were good little schoolchildren, debating beneath the strict disciplinarian eye of their teacher. This was, of course, because they were shortly going to unite in a totally uncharacteristic burst of single-mindedness, and do their level best to force their queen to do something she had no intention of doing whatsoever. Marry. Worse than that, to marry someone they, not she, had chosen. The potential candidates were as sad a collection as Nightmare could have conjured. The youngest was ten, the oldest ninety. Among them were a number of young men, but even these were impossible. Some she had heartily detested from the moment she'd met them, others she didn't even know, and from their reputations had no desire to know. A very few might be reasonable fellows, some were pleasant enough company on a casual basis, but that was no reason to marry any of them. Some were even heralds, or at least trainees. But the heralds all had lives of their own that she was not a part of, and as for trainees, well, they seemed like mere infants to her now. Her counselors, however, did not see it that way. It hadn't been like this when her father had sat in this throne, but Sendar had ruled as well as reigned. She reigned, but only the backing of the heralds made it possible for her to command much of anything. She knew that. She had expected it from the moment she took the crown. She was much too young to be a queen, much too young to command the respect of men and women old enough to be her parents. Not even the white uniform, proclaiming her a full herald, managed to gain her that respect. 
Well, there were ways around that. But she was getting weary of the artful dodges, of setting her words in the mouths of others, and she had not even reigned a year. And these marriage plans were more than a mere inconvenience. They were an attack on her autonomy. Her good counselors would not be happy with a mere prince consort. They wanted a king. She tapped her index finger idly on the stack of papers just under her right hand, and smiled a grim little smile. Her counselors, the non-heraldic ones anyway, were not aware that she had come prepared for this afternoon's meeting. She knew what every man and woman around the table was about to put forward, for not all of them had been close-mouthed about it, and Talamir had gotten wind of it and let her know what was planned. That had given her ample time to prepare for what they were about to unleash on her. They had no idea that she had come forewarned and forearmed. For that matter, other than Talamir and Elkarth, she wasn't sure the other heralds at the council table were aware that she'd been engaged in laying the groundwork to defend her freedom. It was nothing less that she had done, for her counselors were determined that she should not reign alone, and each and every one of them had a particular candidate to place in the running, sometimes more than one, all of them, of course, with the best interests of the kingdom foremost in their minds or so at least they would tell themselves. Of course, every candidate would have blood ties or ties of obligation to the counselor who put him forward, but never mind that. They would put such things out of their minds, telling themselves that they were doing this for Valdemar, and not for any selfish reasons. There was no heir. Selene had been an only child, and the crown now rested on her fragile head alone. She must marry and produce children quickly. Of course, if the chosen spouse happened to be helpful to friends and families, well... Every one of them had given over whatever disputes they had to settle on that list of potential consorts, arguing and trading without any consideration for what she wanted, until they had mutually agreed on enough men that if they couldn't bully her into taking one, they could wear her down until she agreed out of exhaustion. When Talamir told her what the plans were, Selene had gone straight to Herald Chronicler Second Misty, who was surely the only person in Haven who had the esoteric knowledge to help her out of the trap. And although she had not really expected a great deal of sympathy from Misty, the Herald had amazed her by reacting with indignation to the plans. By Keranos! Misty had exclaimed, her eyes behind the thick lenses of her spectacles going narrow with speculation. That's obscene! You haven't been a queen a year, girl! Shouldn't they at least wait until you've settled and gotten comfortable with your place? Apparently not, Selene had replied, seething with anger. And apparently none of them want to see a foreigner brought in as consort either. Or at least they don't seem to have taken much thought about that particular possibility. Insane, I'd call it. Not that I particularly want a foreign consort, but Father used to have serious talks with me about the possibility of needing to cement a foreign alliance with a marriage. Idiots, Misty had muttered under her breath, pushing her lenses up on her nose. The hand of a queen's too damned valuable to waste. What if, as your father said, we need an alliance? What if we just need to keep five or six princes dangling on promises? Selene had countered. And besides... She didn't add the besides, which was that she wanted to be able to love her husband, not merely tolerate being in the same room with him. Misty probably guessed it, for she'd given Selene a shrewd look, but she hadn't said anything except, Well, if they haven't got the sense to see past their own interests, it's up to some of the rest of us to see to it that they can't meddle. And Misty had outdone herself on the Queen's behalf, spending every spare moment locked away with dusty law and record books going back generations. The result was the pile of neatly written papers under Selene's hand. Aside from the two exceptions of Talamir and Elkarth, there wasn't a single person around the council table that had the slightest inkling that they were about to see what Selene could do when she was not in a mood of sweet cooperation. In point of fact, no matter who was brought up, the various candidates for potential spouse were going to be mown down like so many stands of ripened grain. Misty had not even told Alberich. She had sworn herself to secrecy before Selene had even asked. There was no tighter-lipped creature in Valdemar than Misty when she opted to take that particular path. 
It's too bad Alberich isn't here, Selene thought, still tapping. He might enjoy watching me dispose of this idiocy. She missed his craggy, scarred face at the table today. Although he did not have an official position on the council, as Talamir's right-hand man, and in no small part hers as well, he could and did sit in on it whenever he chose. When he did, he usually took Elkarth's seat as the representative of the heraldic circle. The weapons master knew of the plans, of course, though not how she intended to counter them, and she thought that he would take great pleasure in how she was going to discomfit them all. Or maybe not. In Selene's limited experience, a confirmed bachelor like Alberich had a tendency to panic when confronted by the question of potential matrimony, regardless of whether it was his or someone else's. Besides, he's probably concerned that if I flatten every other possible consort, someone will suggest him as an alternative. The mere thought made her stifle a smile. While the heralds would welcome the idea, and possibly even the bard and healer would as well, the rest of her counselors would have apoplexy. They'd suggest she take an illiterate fisherman from Lake Evendim before they suggested Alberich. Not that she'd mind an illiterate fisherman from Lake Evendim half so much as she disliked some of the so-called candidates for her hand her counselors were going to suggest. The counselors had been well aware from the moment they started their plotting that this was a subject their queen was not going to entertain gladly, which was why they were intending to surprise her with it in hopes of taking her off guard. As they disposed of some final trivial business, they kept glancing at her out of the corners of their eyes, and there was a certain nervous tone to their voices that would have been amusing if she had not been so very angry with them. Her father had not been dead a year, and already they were at her to marry. As if she could not rule by herself, or at the very least, rule with the true counsel of those who were loyal to her, and not merely devoted to their own interests, and rule well and wisely. You can rule with more wisdom than some of their choices, her companion Cario said into her mind. Not that some of their choices would be allowed to rule at all. They wouldn't be chosen by a companion if every living male in Voldemar were to drop dead this moment. A stinging indictment indeed coming from Cario. And there was the real rub. What some of her counsellors seemed to keep forgetting was that any husband she took would be nothing more than Prince Consort unless he was also a herald. Only then could he be a co-ruler. Of course, they probably assumed that a young woman would be easily led by her husband to give him whatever he wanted, which would certainly make him the power behind the throne, if not an actual monarch. Some of them probably assumed that she could make a companion choose him, if she wanted it badly enough. The more fools they, said Cario. Well, they have a poor opinion of how strong a woman's will can be. Selene reflected as she gathered her nerve that it was a very good thing that Cario was of a mind with her. It would be a great deal easier to resist both bullying and blandishment with Cario behind her. And don't forget, you have Misty too, Cario reminded her. Yes, indeed, Misty, her secret weapon, who not only had supplied her with this vast and intricate report, but was currently mewed up in the library with every book of Valdemaran genealogy in Haven at her fingertips, and a page to bring her whatever she needed for as long as this meeting lasted. No, her counsellors surely could never have reckoned on Misty. The last of the minor business was disposed of. The counsellors put up their papers, some of them poured themselves wine, and there was a great deal of coughing and shuffling of feet. Then, as she expected, really, it was Lord Garthazer, more portly now than he had been before the Tedril Wars, and more florid of face, who cleared his throat awkwardly and put the subject on the table. About the matter of your majesty's marriage, he said and stopped. Selene smiled sweetly, a smile that went no farther than her lips, as she looked down each side of the horseshoe-shaped table before she allowed her eyes to rest on Garthazer. He makes a poor conspirator, she thought. It was from him that Talamir had learned what was coming, though Garthazer himself was probably completely unaware that he had betrayed anything. 
but he gave himself away, according to Talamir, in a hundred ways, by little nervous ticks, by being unable to meet a person's eyes, by dropping far too many hints when he was satisfied with himself. At that point, both Talamir and Alberich had gone to work, and no secret was secure when those two were ferreting it out. Though it occurred to her that Talamir had probably not done nearly as much work as Alberich, Talamir's sympathy was probably at least in part with the council. Well, give credit where it was due, he had told her in the first place. My marriage? she asked in feigned innocence. I wasn't aware I had been betrothed, much less that there was a marriage in view. Certainly King Sendar never said anything of the sort to me. Ah, well, your majesty, that's the whole point, Garthazer managed. You haven't one, you see, betrothed, that is. She took her time and looked carefully around the horseshoe-shaped table again, making sure to look each one of her counsellors steadily in the eyes. The silence was deafening. No one moved. Indeed. And you, that is, we thought, that is— Garthazer couldn't look her in the eyes any more. He dropped his gaze and stared at his hands and stumbled to a halt. We have some candidates in mind, Selene. Lord Ortholan took up the thread smoothly. Ortholan looked the part of the senior statesman. He had retained a fine figure, and the silver streaking in his dark blonde hair in no way detracted from his handsome appearance. Women younger than Selene threw themselves at him on a regular basis, though she had never heard so much as a whisper to indicate that he was unfaithful to his wife. You really must marry as soon as may be, of course. A young woman cannot rule alone. Indeed, she said levelly, hiding her rage with immense care. She wanted to scream at them, then burst into tears, and nothing could be more fatal at this moment. But the others took that lack of objection on her part as the signal that she was going to be properly malleable, and took heart from it. Only Elkarth and Talamir understood that Selene had her own plans. Elkarth winced a little at her tone. Talamir's lips quirked, just a trifle. The first, and indeed the most eligible candidate, is my nephew Ranulf, Garthazer said brightly, who is not eligible at all, I'm afraid, she interrupted smoothly with feigned regret. He's related to me within the second degree, on his mother's side through the Lycalis bloodline. You know well that no king or queen of Valdemar can wed a subject who is within the third degree of blood relationship. That is the law, my lord and nothing you nor I can do will change that. She raised her eyebrows at them. The reason is a very good one, of course. I shall be indelicate here, for there is no delicate way to say this. As my father told me often, the monarchs of Valdemar cannot afford the kinds of difficulties that can arise when a bloodline becomes too inbred. And with you and yours marrying cousins and cross-cousins with the gay abandon of people blind to consequences, that's the reason half of your so-called candidates are dough-faced mouth-breathers who couldn't count to ten without taking their shoes off, she thought viciously. Harsh, with justification, but harsh, Cario observed sardonically. Garthazer blinked, his mouth still open, and stared at her. Finally he shut it. Ah, he said at last. Oh, are you quite sure of that? She opened Misty's report to the relevant page. Ranulph's mother is Lady Elena of Penderkeep. Lady Elena's mother was my father's cousin through his mother. That is within the second degree. Oh, Garthazer said weakly. Then there is my nephew, Chris, said Ortholan quickly. Related to me within the third degree on both sides of his family, as his mother was a cousin by marriage of my father, and his father was a cousin by blood to my father, she said briskly, already prepared for that one. Besides being so young that there is no question of consummation for at least eight years, she smiled dulcetly at Ortholan, which does rather negate the entire reason for marrying with such remarkable speed in the first place, before my year of mourning is over, doesn't it? To his great pleasure, Ortholan was left so stunned by her repost that his handsome face wore an uncharacteristic blank look. Not that she wanted to humiliate him. She was really awfully fond of him, after all. 
but it gave her no end of satisfaction to make him understand in no uncertain terms that just because she was fond of him, she was not going to allow him to manipulate her into something she did not want to do. And blessings upon Misty. She suspected that not even Ortholan knew about the nearness of her blood relation to his nephew. He proved it in the next moment by saying cautiously, I assume you have the particulars of these degrees. She went to the second page of Misty's notes and gave him the genealogical details, chapter and verse, in a no-nonsense, matter-of-fact tone of voice. Ah, he said, and wisely said nothing more. So it went. Every single candidate that any of them brought up she cut off at the metaphorical knees, including the ones that she had not given Misty to research. That was why Misty was shut up in the library. She would leaf through her thick sheaf of papers to give Misty the chance to trace pedigrees, then pretend to read what Misty sent to her. At last they ran out of names, or at least of names that they could all agree on. Now the daggers were out, and the looks being traded across the tabletop were wary. Any new candidates would be men and boys that had already been rejected, because one or another of the counselors objected to them for reasons of his or her own. She could sit back and let them play against each other, which was the better position to be in. At least, that was true among the high-born counselors. The guildmasters were a different story entirely. None of them— and no candidate outside of the nobility would be related to her, which eliminated that argument. However, she thought she could count on the highborn counselors to fight tooth and nail against any common-born man being put up as a potential prince consort. There was an advantage to snobbery. Mind if she did happen to fall in love with a commoner, she wasn't going to let snobbery stop her. That would open up a whole new set of problems, which she wasn't going to think about right now. The current set was more than enough to deal with. It's too bad Albrecht isn't there now, she thought, letting her anger begin to die. This is the part he'd really enjoy, watching them cut the legs out from under each other. Ah, well, she hoped the installation of his window had gone well. She was looking forward to seeing it. It would be the only part of her day she was able to look forward to. Why would anyone want to be a queen? Who wouldn't want to be a queen? demanded the rather drunken tart, sitting at the table next to Alberich's. Larking about, doing whatever you please, getting waited on hand and foot. Not from Haven, thought Alberich to himself. Though you have the accent, it isn't quite good enough, my girl. And you aren't nearly as drunk as you seem. What's your game? And who put you up to it, I wonder? Now, perhaps at any other time, perhaps in another year or so, she might have gotten away with such an ill-considered remark. But not now. Not when barely six months had passed, and Selene had been making herself very popular with little gestures like the Queen's bread. People down here had a lot of trouble keeping their children fed, and one guaranteed free meal a day, at the trifling cost of lessons in rudimentary literacy and numeracy, was a small price to pay. A youngling down here couldn't earn the price of that breakfast himself in the course of a morning. It was good economics to send your younglings to a temple until noon, then put them to work. Here now, a man just near enough to have overheard the speech stood up, glaring at her. Our Selene ain't like that, yo drab, and if you was a man, I'd a thrashed you for that. The woman shrank back, and well she should have. He was big and broad, and looked as if he knew very well how to handle that cudgel at his belt. No offence, meant, I'm very sure, she said hastily. I didn't mean Queen Selene, I just meant a queen, in a general sort of way. The man glared at her. He was as drunk as the whore pretended to be, and he was at the very least going to say his piece. Ah, oh, Selene ain't no layabout, he insisted. Why, I seen her. I talked to her a couple nights before the last battle. Come right to our fires, she did, having a word with our officers, seeing we had good treatment. Oh, yeah? And she talked to you, did she, you old liar? jeered someone else, ill-advisedly. The drunk rounded on the skeptic with a roar and grabbed the man's shirt in one ham-like fist. 
Only the intervention of the peacekeeper that the proprietor of the broken arms had seen fit to hire prevented mayhem from breaking out. But there was the start of a fight, and under cover of it the woman slipped out. Alberich followed. She wasn't at all difficult to follow, the silly wench. She paid absolutely no attention to what was behind her. The man she accosted just outside the alleyway next to the tavern was a little more careful, but not enough to spot Alberich. He was a darker shadow in the alley. People always thought that wearing black would make them blend in with shadows, but it didn't. It made them into man-shaped black blotches in an almost black place. Alberich was wearing several shades of very, very dark brown and gray. Each leg was a slightly different color. So was each arm, and his tunic was blotched. There was nothing about him that was man-shaped when he stood in shadow. I'm not doing that no more, the woman shrilled at a contact, just as Alberich eased within listening range. You go do your own dirty work from now on. There was a murmur, too low for Alberich to make out the words. I didn't get but a word out, she said sullenly. And up jumps this drunk bear and nearly thrashes me. More murmuring and the clink of coins. The woman departed, muttering. Alberich followed the man. There had been a lot of money exchanged there for such simple services, a lot for this part of town at any rate. Alberich hoped that his new quarry would try another quarter, one where such payment would be the norm rather than the exception. And lo, as if his wish had flown straight to the ear of Vicandis, that was precisely what his quarry did. It wasn't a wealthy part of town, working class was more like it, but working class that got work regularly of the sort that came with weekly pay packets and a little something extra on the holidays, a place in short where there were city guards and constables on patrol regularly, a place where Alberich could manage to do something to get them both arrested, which, as soon as a constable hove into view, Alberich did. He nipped back around the corner so as to be able to intercept his quarry coming, apparently from the opposite direction. It wasn't hard. He knew this part of Haven better than the back of his hand. There were few yards with high fences, and even fewer with dangerous dogs tied up in them. Once he came back around, he saw that the constable was strolling along at a leisurely pace that would take him past his quarry before Alberich reached the man. Good. He didn't want the constable to actually see what was going on between him and the stranger, only hear it, and make some inferences that, as it happened, would be entirely unwarranted. You're enjoying this, Cantor accused. Hush, I'm busy. The fact was, he was enjoying this. It was the first hint of trouble, real trouble, his sort of trouble, that he'd had in moons. As he approached the man, he stared at him, easy enough to do since there were street lamps here. Then he contorted his face into an expression of rage and roared, You, you bastard, thought you could ruin my sister and run away, did you? and then he flung himself at the startled man. As he had expected, the man was not startled for long, and he was armed. So what the surprised constable saw when he turned was a man with a knife attacking an unarmed man. Since he couldn't know which of the two of them the accusation had come from, he assumed, as any good constable would, that the man with the knife was the attacker, not the defender. That Alberich was in no danger from a mere knife was something he couldn't know. So, to his immense credit, he waded in himself, wielding his truncheon and blowing a whistle for dear life to summon help. He was aiming most of his blows for the head of the knife-wielder, and Alberich helpfully positioned the target so that by the time the help arrived, his quarry was out cold and he was able to protest feebly that he didn't know what the madman was talking about. He'd just jumped for him with a knife, screaming about a sister. We have to stop meeting like this, Harold said Captain Lakar of the city guard with a feeble attempt at humor. People are going to start talking. I fervently hope not, Alberich replied, rubbing his wrists where the conscientious constables had tied them, being too wise ever to take one potential miscreant's word over another's. He warmed his hands on his cup of tea but did not drink from it. The herbal teas consumed by the night shift of the city guard were not drinkable, even by the standards of a former Carsite sons' guard. If talk they do, my personae will in danger be. 
Yes, well, I wish you'd find some other way of catching your lads without getting the both of you thrown in jail, the captain replied wearily. Since this was only the third time that Alberich had used that particular desperation ploy, he held his peace. Keep him safe, was all he said. Speak with him under truth spell, I wish to, when he awakens. The captain did not ask why. The captain did not want to know why. The captain was an old friend of Harold Daythor, Alberich's mentor in this business, and he knew very well that he did not want to know why. And Alberich knew that he knew, and both were content with the situation. Now, if this had been Carsey, he reflected soberly, as he left the city jail by an inconspicuous exit, making certain that there was no one to see him leave. If this was Carsey and you were an agent of the Sun Priests, that man would be in extreme pain for a very long time, and at the end of it he would be dead, Cantor said. He may still be dead when this is over, Alberich replied grimly, making his way toward the stable of the Companion's Bell. But if he is, at least it won't be by my hands. If he's lucky, we'll find out he's just a troublemaker. Cantor didn't sound as if he really believed that would be the case. Yes, and if that happened to be true, well, there was no law against speaking out, or having someone else speak out against the monarch. Laws like that only made for more trouble. Some people always had to have a grievance, and making grumbling illegal was a guaranteed way of ensuring that grumbling turned into resentment, and resentment into anger. If that was the case, he'd be let go, with the vague memory of having proved he didn't know anything about anyone's sister to the satisfaction of the city guard. If it was not the case? Well, there was one herald in the circle who had no trouble with dirtying his hands with difficult jobs. Alberich would find out who had sent this fellow down into the dark parts of Haven to foment discontent, and he would follow that trail back as far as it would go. And the man would still be let go. But this time, with the very clear memory of having been questioned under truth spell by a herald, Chances were he would cut and run, and hope his employers never found him. That would be convenient, because it would take the problem off of his hands. And if he didn't run, his employers would probably take the problem off Alberich's hands a little faster. He collected Cantor, and the two of them made their way up to the Collegium, Alberich feeling the effects of the truncheon blows that had connected with him, and Cantor brooding. Alberich didn't press him as to the subject of his brooding, Whatever it was, Cantor would talk about it when the companion was good and ready, and not one moment before. And, in fact, as Alberich hung up his saddle, Cantor finally spoke. I hope this doesn't mean it's all starting again. Alberich sighed. My good friend, I hope this doesn't mean it never finished. 2. Why is it always me? Misty asked as Alberich made his second trip of the night down into Haven, this time with her in tow. The scholarly herald pushed her lenses up on her nose and shivered beneath her cloak. Because you have the strongest truth-sensing ability in the Collegium, Alberich said. And because the two of us can speak in Carsight. If our naughty boy doesn't understand Carsight, he won't know what we're talking about. And it will make him nervous. And if he does, you'll know it, and we'll have him where we want him. Bloody hell, she said with resignation, and pulled the cloak tighter around herself. She hated cold, she hated winter, and she hated being dragged out of her study, and he knew all of that. He also knew that unless someone dragged her out of her study periodically, she would hibernate there for as long as the cold lasted, which was, so far as he was concerned, just as valid a reason for making her his assistant in this case. The city jail was not bad as such places went. It was clean, insofar as you could keep any place clean, considering the standards of hygiene of the inhabitants. It smelled of unwashed bodies, with a ghost of urine and vomit, for no matter how many times the cells were cleaned, someone was always fouling them again. It did not smell of blood. If anyone was so badly injured as all that, they went under guard to a separate set of cells that had a healer in attendance. And it went without saying that no one here, at least among the jailers, spilled the blood of the prisoners. 
Of course, the conditions were spartan and crowded, and no prison was a good place. But compared with those jails that Alberich had seen in Carsey, not to mention the ones that were rumored to exist. Misty grimaced as they rode in at the stable, and grimaced again as they walked in through the front door. Alberich was wearing his whites. No one looked at a herald's face, they only saw his whites. The prisoner would see the whites and not even think that the man inside the white uniform might be the madman that had attacked him. They were taken to a little room, windowless, lit by a single lantern that held a single chair. The chair was for the prisoner whose legs would be tethered to it. Misty and Alberich would be free so that they could evade any attacks he might try. The prisoner was brought in, and his legs shackled to the legs of the chair. He was as pale as a snowdrift when he saw who was there to speak with him. Slowly and carefully, Alberich outlined exactly what he had observed, while the man listened, jaw clenched, eyes staring straight ahead. So, Alberich finished, what have you to say for yourself? He half expected the man to flatly deny everything, but after a long, tense silence, he spoke. I cannot tell you what you wish to know. A candle mark later, Alberich and Misty left the jail. There was a frown of frustration on Harold Misty's round face. Alberich didn't blame her. The man certainly had been paying people to try to foment discontent against the Queen, quite a few of them, in fact, but with, by his own admission, limited success. And he had been doing so on the orders, and with the money, of someone else. The only problem was, he didn't know this someone else. He had never seen the man's face. Misty had not even needed to cast the truth spell to force the truth out of the man. Her own innate truth-sensing gift had told her he was telling them everything he knew. He himself had a grudge against the crown in general, and Selene in particular, for when she had served her internship in the city courts of law with Harold Mirilin, she had made a ruling against him. So there was his personal motive. But who had sought out this man with a grievance against Selene? Who had supplied him with the money and the idea to foster rebellion? And why? Only one thing was absolutely certain. The trail came to a dead end now. It was unlikely that the man would ever be contacted again, for someone astute enough to find him in the first place would certainly be sharp enough to discover he had been arrested and know not to use him again. Now what will you do? Misty asked as they neared the collegium. Keep looking, he said and shrugged. There seemed nothing more he could say or do. The closing in of winter always brought one definite disadvantage to the weaponry classes. Much of the time practices and lessons had to be held in the salle instead of out of doors. This limited the kinds of lessons that could be given and the way that practices could be held. Every season brought its difficulties for a weapons master. In spring and summer there were torrential rains to deal with. It was difficult to muster enthusiasm for heavy exercise in high summer. And in the winter, of course, there was the cold and the snow. Well, if the job had been easy, anyone could have done it. Alberich still held some outdoor archery classes in the winter, but when, as today, snow was falling thickly, with a wicked wind to blow it around, there wasn't much point in keeping the youngsters at the targets. Yes, they would find themselves having to fight for their lives under adverse conditions, but adverse conditions affected the enemy, too. And as for needing to hunt, well, no herald was going to starve because he or she could not hunt in a blizzard. Waystations were stocked with sufficient supplies, and every herald on circuit carried emergency rations. During their last year, each trainee would get an intense course in survival hunting and disadvantaged combat, and there was no point in making the youngsters utterly and completely miserable for the sake of showing them what it was like to be utterly and completely miserable. Not even the Carsite Officers' Academy did that to its students, and having seen what life was like at the Collegia, Alberich knew that the lessening he'd gotten at the Academy was harsh, and not at all conducive to training youngsters like these. Besides, with the Tedrils gone, and Carsey itself essentially neutralized for a while, the only enemies that heralds were likely to encounter in the field were bandits and brigands. Now, as Alberich well knew from long experience, bandits and brigands are humans. 
they're essentially lazy, or they wouldn't be trying to steal rather than earn an honest living, and they're just as attached to their own creature comforts as any other humans. Given a choice in the matter, they wouldn't attack under adverse conditions either. By night, certainly. In ambush, definitely. In a blizzard, a flood, a raging storm? Not likely. In fact, in all of the time that Alberich himself had led his men of the Sun's Guard against the bandits on the Carsite border, never once had he encountered a band moving against a target when the weather was foul. That didn't mean it was impossible, just unlikely. That made the circumstance something to guard against, but not something that required extensive training. So, when the snows began to fall in earnest, just after the noon meal, Alberich herded the next class to arrive into the cell itself which occasioned the inevitable delay in the cleaning of boots at the door, and the taking off of cloaks and gloves and hanging them up to dry along the oven wall before anything could get started. And then, because this was a mixed class of trainees from all three collegia and some blues as well, there was more delay as Alberich sorted them out into the limited space inside the cell. Although there was no fire actually in the room, Far, far too dangerous to have a fireplace in an area where someone could fall or be thrown into it. The sow was kept reasonably warm by a huge brick oven in one corner. A relatively small fire deep inside it was set alight in the first really cold days of autumn and never allowed to go out, night or day. That fire heated the great mass of bricks that made up the oven and chimney and the wall, and that mass in turn radiated heat into the room. It also wasted heat along the outside of the same wall as well, but unfortunately that couldn't be helped. And anyway, that outside wall was a nice place for the companions to come and warm themselves on a cold and sunless day. The cell wasn't cozy, but no one was going to freeze without his cloak. You could, and Alberich occasionally had, actually bake meals in that oven, if said meals were the sorts of things that required slow baking. You could, and Alberich did, quite often during the winter, leave a pot of soup or stew in there as well, to stay warm during the day. It was off-limits to the trainees, however, not by virtue of any orders, but by common sense. You couldn't open the cast-iron door without burning your hand unless you used a heavy leather blacksmith's gauntlet, and Alberich prudently never left any of those lying around outside. You had to go into his quarters to get one, or like the servant who tended the fire now and again. You brought one with you. Of course, on a day like today, every youngster in the class was doing his or her best to get close to the oven and the warmest part of the room, which meant that unless the weapons master took a hand in it, and remembered who had gotten that choice part of the room last, there were going to be difficulties right from the start of the lessons. Especially today, when devilment seemed to have infected all of them. There was pushing and shoving, teasing, and a few insults and counter-insults, and the general restlessness that showed he was going to have to be an autocratic brute today. He gave a purely internal sigh. What was it about adolescence that made them run wild at utterly unpredictable intervals? Maybe it was that all of the students in this class were boys. Girls were a steadying influence, at least in these classes. The boys in this age group didn't seem quite so willing to run about like idiots when there were girls around. Well, run, that was a good idea. He ought to have them run first. It would warm their muscles up, and might exhaust a little of that too plentiful energy. It would give him a chance to make a mental partner list and decide who to assign where. Run, he ordered, barking out the single word. Full speed, around the sal ten times. Grumbling, and in a straggling line, they ran, while he tried to remember who of this lot had gotten the prime spot during the last indoor session, and who hadn't gotten it in a decent while. By the time they finished their warm-up run, he thought he had it sorted, and before they could get up to any immediate devilment, he separated the most likely troublemakers and paired them up with the more tractable for this practice session. Short swords, no shields, he ordered. Single line for equipment by pairs. No pushing. Those who had headed for the storage room, eager to be at their practice, got the best choice of equipment, while the stragglers got what they deserved. Not that any of it was bad, Alberich saw to that, but those who got first choice got the padded armor and helms that fit them best, 
and those who brought up the rear paid for being laggards by getting equipment that Alberich would make them add extra padding to so there would be no slippage. With his pairs of youngsters distributed across the salle and trading blows, Alberich began his slow walk up and down the lines, giving the call. Every blow had a corresponding number, starting from one for a straight thrust to the center of the enemy's body, and the two students in a pair were designated odd and even. Alberich called out sequences of blows, beginning with odd or even for the students to follow, rather like a dancing instructor calling out a sequence of dance steps. Beginning students, of course, were taught one blow at a time, and specific parries for each. At the level these students had reached, the active student was given a pattern to follow, and the defensive student could use any sequence of parries he or she chose. Alberich began slowly, but as muscles warmed up further and reactions quickened, he slowly sped up the pace of the call. And as the students concentrated on what they were doing, the clatter of wooden sword on sword, which had started out rather ragged, became a single beat, just a fraction off the rhythm of the call. Meanwhile, Alberich circled the floor like a hunting cat, watching the students, alert for any weaknesses, any bad habits. He wasn't going to interrupt the call just yet to correct them. This was part of the business of making blow-counter sequences automatic and instinctive, but he watched for them and noted them for later. Now that they were up to speed, he added the next variation to the call. They had been fighting toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Now he ordered them to move. Odd. Five seven advance, four two retreat, five seven step right, one eight. Even, four three step left. Now it really did look like a dance, and with movement added, some parries were not always working, some blows were getting through. Still, he was not going to make corrections just yet. This was the point in the practice where experience was the teacher, and there was nothing quite like the experience of a good bruise to drive the lesson home. Again he sped up the call, forcing them to move a little faster than they were used to. But now they were beginning to tire. The response was getting ragged again, and some of the students began dropping some of the sequence, as weary muscles failed to keep up with the cadence. Time to stop and go on to individual lessons. Rest, he barked, and at that welcome command the points of a dozen wooden practice blades dropped to the wooden floor with a loud thwack. Kirton and Leedale, center. The rest, circle. That order called the first of his pairs into the middle of the floor with the rest around them to observe. It was not as unfair as it might have seemed to order a pair straight into the next part of the lesson when the rest were getting a breather. Kirton and Leedale were the strongest and had the most endurance. A blue and a heraldic trainee and as alike as brothers. They were still relatively fresh after the call. That endurance needed to be tested. They needed to learn what it was like to fight real combat while they were tired. Now Alberich took up a wooden longsword to separate them when he saw something that needed either correction or scoring. The two combatants squared off, standing warily, balancing on the balls of their feet. They'd fought often, of course. Though Alberich made a point of rotating partners in practice, he tended to put these two against each other more often than not, just to keep things even. They enjoyed the practices, too, and he had more than a suspicion that they practiced against each other recreationally. He held his sword out between the two. They tensed, waiting. One, he counted. Two, three, Hela. He pulled back the sword and jumped back in the same instant, and they both went on the offensive, which was what he expected from them. They were aggressive fighters, and neither one had learned yet that immediate offense wasn't necessarily the wisest course to take. He didn't separate them, even though they immediately tangled up in the middle of the wooden floor, with Kirton seizing his opponent's sword in his free hand, and Leedale grabbing the front of Kirton's padded jerkin with his. Neither could do anything against the other when they were bound up like that, and a moment later they broke apart by themselves, circled for a moment, then began an exchange of blows. Kirton got a hit, and Alberich stopped the combat for a moment. Nah, let me look. He made a quick judgment of position and strength. Leedale, you're losing the free hand. Struck it truly, Kirton has. Tuck it behind you. Hela. Let Leedale judge for himself that he had left that hand out there as an easy target. With the wooden blade the blow probably only stung a bit, 
but had it been a real short sword, even with an armored gauntlet, the hand would have been seriously injured. But Leedale wasn't taking this lying down. He launched himself at his opponent with a flurry of blows that drove Kirton back, and scored a hit himself that made Alberich stop the combat again. Nah. A flesh wound, but you bleed. If this goes on, you weaken. Hela. It didn't go on for very much longer. Leedale was at a disadvantage with that hand tucked behind him. It made him turn a little too far to the right, leaving his body more open to attack. Kirton saw that, and saw also that Leedale was going to go aggressive again. So this time he wisely let it happen, and by the way he avoided the blows, led Leedale in the direction he wanted, until he got a good opening for a body shot. He had to commit everything to that, but he made the full commitment, and the sword thwacked home against Leedale's torso with an impact that made him grunt in pain. Enough, Alberich called, although he hadn't really needed to. Leedale backed up immediately, saluted his opponent, and pulled off his helm in surrender. Curse you, he said amiably, though his face was a little white. I'm going to have a bruise the size of my head for a week, even assuming you haven't cracked my ribs. See the healers, Alberich directed brusquely, as Kirton pulled off his helm and extended his hand for his defeated opponent to shake. After lessons. He knew full well that no ribs were cracked. If they had been, the lad would not have been able to breathe, and what was more, the trainee's companion would immediately have told Cantor, who would have told Alberich. Leedale, observe. Kirton, you drop your point too often. Go to practice lunges at the mirror. Aldo and Triana, center. Two more students came out of the circle to face off against each other in the center, while Leedale took a vacant spot in the circle and his erstwhile partner obediently moved to the side of the room to face one of the full-length mirrors set into the back wall of the salle, and began lunging with his sword fully extended, watching his reflection the way he would watch an opponent. Those mirrors had utterly shocked Alberich the first time he had seen them. Mirrors were expensive, appallingly expensive, and that much mirrored glass at that size represented a sum of money that had made his head swim. But when he'd gotten over the shock, he had to admit that putting those mirrors there was a brilliant idea, for nothing enabled a student learning anything involving body movement to correct himself, like being able to see for himself as well as feel exactly what he was doing right or wrong. Right now, however, he kept his attention on the two students before him, a pair of the children of the nobly born. Trainees, that is, not blues, though a pair of blues would have worked just as hard as these two. Things had certainly changed there. Perhaps not in the attitude of those high-born toward him, but at least in the fact that they no longer expressed their contempt for him aloud, and no longer permitted their children to act on that contempt. The blues, for the most part, now worked just as hard in his classes as any heraldic trainee, and there were no more sneers or other expressions of disrespect in his presence. As for what happened outside his presence, he cared not at all. If they respected him, well and good. If they feared him, perhaps that was just as good. If neither, as long as they behaved themselves in his class, it mattered not what they thought, nor their parents. Let them revile him behind his back if it pleased them, so long as they maintained respect to his face. Discipline in the sal was what he demanded. So long as he got that, they might actually learn a thing or two from him. These two, greys both, were going at it with the same concentration and will, if not skill, as the previous pair, and with a touch less aggression. Not so bad a thing, since he preferred to seek caution over bravado. When one finally defeated the other, he sent them to observe, rather than to the mirrors. The third pair, healer and heraldic trainees, also bouted and retired. One went to the mirrors, the other to point practice on a ball suspended from the ceiling. The fourth pair, however, well, both of them were high-spirited most times, and today truly full of bedevilment. One was a heraldic trainee, the other a bardic trainee, and between them, the two were responsible for half the pranks that were pulled at the two collegia. Both were slender and agile, both possessed of so much energy that their teachers sometimes despaired over trying to get them to hold still long enough to learn something, and envied their inexhaustible verve at one and the same time. 
So Alberich knew he was going to have to be sharp to keep these two within bounds today. If he could, Aidan, the young bard, and Michael were harder to keep control of than a bushel of ferrets today. He saw that within moments of their bout. The two went at each other with the same concentration and will as the first two, and a great deal more energy and enthusiasm. As a consequence, they didn't stay inside the circle of observers, and those who had been quietly practicing found themselves scrambling out of the way as their combat ran from one end of the salle to the other. Alberich had heard some rumors that these two were in the habit of experimenting with new moves. Well, here was the proof that the rumors were true. It looked less like a practice bout and more like an acrobatic exhibition. Very few of their blows actually connected with anything. They weren't actually parrying each other. They were tumbling and spinning and jumping about so much that they never even got near each other with their wooden blades. Stop! Alberich roared, just as Aiden, by more luck than anything else, bound Michael's blade in a complicated corkscrewing parry, and with a wild flip of his arm disarmed his opponent and sent the wooden sword flying straight at one of the precious panels of mirror. Alberich opened his mouth to shout, and knew it was already too late. It was one of those moments when time slows to a crawl, and the coming disaster is observed in painful detail without anyone being able to actually do anything about it. Aidan's grin of triumph slowly turned to one of horror. Michael clawed the air in futility after his lost sword as it headed straight for the mirror its own reflection seeming to fly to meet it in mid-air. As the heavy-weighted stick flipped over and over in mid-air, Alberich just braced himself for the inevitable. And with a terrible crash, it came. The weighted end hit with the sound of a hundred hand mirrors hitting a pavement, the mirror spiderwebbed and shattered. A profound and dreadful silence fell over the cell, broken only by a belated series of musical chinks, as a few of the shards that were left detached themselves and landed on the wreck of the rest of the mirror. Chink, chink-a-chink, chink. Uh-oh, said Aidan in a very small voice. Chink. Alberich stood behind the two miscreants with his arms crossed over his chest as they faced the desk of the acting dean of Harold's Collegium. Elkarth was not alone. The dean of Bardic Collegium, Bard Arissa, had joined him for this particular conference. While Elkarth, slight and bird-like with an inquisitive face and mild manner, was not normally the sort of person who might inspire trepidation in a student, the look he wore today would have frozen the marrow of anyone's bones. The two boys huddled unhappily in their chairs. It was the first time within his knowledge that Alberich had seen these two subdued. Their shoulders, under grey and rust-coloured tunics respectively, were hunched with misery. Their dark heads were both bowed, and two sets of hazel eyes were bent upon the floor. What precisely possessed you two to demonstrate your new fighting technique today? That was Bard Arissa, a slim, autocratic woman, dark as a gypsy and resplendent in her full formal scarlets, and you could have used the edge in her voice to cleave diamonds. It seemed like a good idea, Aidan suggested in a whisper. And why did you not ask Harold Alberich if you could show him these things in private? asked Elkarth, his voice like a wintry blast from the snowstorm outside. Um, he's very busy? Aidan seemed to be doing all the talking. Michael was sitting like a stone. Alberich knew why. Michael was from a family prosperous enough to possess one or two real glass mirrors, and he knew just how expensive they were, although he probably had no idea that the price increased exponentially with the size. Aidan was highborn. Until he came to the Collegium, he had never had to pay for anything himself in his life, and he had no idea what even a hand mirror cost, much less one of the huge panels in the sow. Michael thought he knew, and he was scared just thinking it would cost about the same as a good horse. Alberich knew better, knew that you could buy a nice house with a garden in a good part of Haven for less than one of those mirrors. Never 
to my knowledge, did you inquire of me these new moves to observe, Alberich said from behind them. My duty it is to make time for such things. You wanted an audience, Arissa said in that same hard, sharp voice, which, given that she was a master bard, was certainly deliberate. And given that she was a bard, and so was one of the miscreants, her statement about their motive was probably correct. You couldn't bear not to have an audience. You wanted to show off what you thought you could do. Alberich's surmise that she had uncovered what had really driven the match today was borne out by the way that both the boys winced. Well, she continued, you got an audience. I trust you're pleased. You've made fools out of yourselves in front of that audience, not to mention the damage you did in the sal. Now it was Elkarth's turn. Speaking of damages, are either of you aware of just how difficult and expensive it is to replace a mirror of that size? Identical head shakes. Elkarth named a figure. Both of them went white as the snow falling outside. Even Alberich was impressed, hearing the exact cost. It made what he had paid for his stained-glass window look like pin money by comparison. Now, Elkarth continued, Naturally, some of this is going to come from your stipends. We shan't take all of your stipends, but you're going to be down to less than half of what everyone else gets. Michael finally said something. But we could never pay all that back, not even if we stayed trainees for a hundred years. He gulped audibly. Which is why you are both going to be spending all of your free time working for the master of the Glassworkers Guild until he finishes the new mirror. Arissa said flatly. We intend for you to see why at first hand such things cost so dearly. We intend for you to have a very proprietary interest in the replacement. When the mirror is finished, I trust you will have an entirely new understanding of your folly. And a new set of muscles, Elkarth added enigmatically. Now you may go and reflect on the fact that you will not have any time to get up to any more clever ideas for the duration. This will be your last evening with any leisure in it, because you'll be spending your mornings, your afternoons, and half of your evenings down at the glassworks for a while. Enjoy it. As if they could, with a sentence like that one hanging over their heads. The two rose, heads hanging, and shuffled out of the room, the very image of dejection. Elkarth sighed once they were gone, and ruffled a hand through his hair. I wouldn't mind so much if they'd gone about their little project sensibly, he said. He motioned to Alberich to sit. Alberich did so. Consulting with their instructors, for instance. Not that all of that Gymkhana nonsense would have worked, mind you. I wonder where they got such a notion. Out of their imaginations, I suppose— growled Orissa, sitting on the other chair, which are entirely too active if you ask me, or perhaps out of some idiot play or other. The two of them are always running down into Haven to see some fool drama whenever there's one to be seen. I presume they're going to be put to working the bellows at the glassworks for the next moon or so. It could be worse. This could be summer. It will be summer before they see the end of their labor, Elkarth said. I intend to leave them down there for more than a moon. Master Kulin tells me his apprentice is ready to go on to more complicated work, and he doesn't have a junior apprentice to start on the bellows or do any of the other simple labor in and around the place. So our lads can serve until he gets one. It could have been worse. At least it was only one mirror panel, not two or more. How often does this occur? Alberich asked curiously. Assume I must that accidents do happen. Stupidity probably rather more often than accident. Elkarth shrugged. About once every hundred years or so. I mean, we designed the sal to minimize the possibility of an accident, and you weapons masters rarely permit flying objects in the sal itself. It does happen, and it isn't always a trainee's fault. Though I must say that this time is probably going into Misty's Chronicles for sheer wrongheadedness. The panels are all a standard size, and the glassworks has the dimensions in their records from the last time, so Master Kulin won't even have to come up here to take measurements. I can't tell you how long it's going to take to replace the mirror, though. 
the master will have a lot of failures before he gets a success. I would interested be to watch, Alberich admitted, or at least to hear from the master how such a thing is made. Then deliver the criminals yourself in the morning, after breakfast, Elkarth told him. Someone will have to escort them the first time. Alberich took quick account of his schedule and smiled thinly. So I shall, he decided. Arissa laughed, her voice full of ironic humor. Oh, they'll enjoy seeing your face tomorrow morning. The snow was still falling all that afternoon into the night and the next day, and Alberich had sent word up to the Collegia that the trainees were to have a day and a half holiday from their weaponry classes while the sal was cleaned. A small army of Collegium servants were scouring the sal floor for the tiniest slivers of glass, and would not leave until the floor had been swept several times over, then washed down, huffed and lightly sanded, so that it wasn't slippery. The one proviso to this holiday was that the trainees were to spend the class time out of doors, but with this much snow he doubted that would be much of a trial for them. The first lot was already building a snow fort when he and Cantor left to escort the two troublemakers to their appointed labors, while snow continued to fall from a sky that was the same color as a pigeon's breast and looked just as soft. When Alberich got to the grounds of Harold's Collegium, the two boys were waiting for him on the road that ran among the buildings, mounted, Aidan on his companion and Michael on a sorrel gelding from the palace stables. There was a conspicuous absence of trainees anywhere near them. They waited alone in their disgrace. As Alberich and Cantor approached, he observed that Aidan and Michael looked just as subdued as they had last night, and even Aidan's companion drooped a little. They kept the hoods of their cloaks well up, and aside from a soft, Good morrow, weapons master Alberich, he got nothing more out of them. Not that he intended to try to get them to talk. It would do them good to contemplate their sins in silence. Snow drifted down now as fat, slow flakes. There wasn't even a breath of wind, and the air smelled damp. Most of the trees bore burdens of snow along their black, bare branches, and large mounds bore testament to bushes hidden under heaps of the stuff. Nothing had spoiled the pure whiteness yet, except for where the road had been cleared by the palace gardeners. By mid-morning people would be out playing in it, and the two boys would be painfully aware of that. A good thing. Better they should have to reflect on their sins in sorrow than congratulate themselves that today would have been a miserable one to be out in anyway. Alberich led them away from the palace and toward the wall that surrounded the entire complex. They left from the Herald's Gate, the guarded postern at the Collegium side of the palace grounds. Outside the walls, the road hadn't been cleared as yet. Heavy as the snow on the road was, the companions made easy going through it, and the horse was able to follow in Cantor's wake. By the time they got down through the manors of the highborn and the very wealthy, there were crews out starting to clear the road. Traffic was limited to a few riders and people on foot. Except for a few main thoroughfares, the streets hadn't been shoveled out yet either. Fresh snow was nearly up to the knee, and drifts blocked many smaller side streets and alleys. But people were already out with shovels and teams of horses pulling scrapers, and work was going apace. After all, it was in the interest of a shopkeeper to get the street in front of his place of business cleared quickly. So as they passed farther down into the commercial parts of Haven, there was more clean pavements and more activity. And by the smoke coming from the chimney of the glassworks as they arrived, things were busy in there as well. Alberich dismounted and gave a hard rap on the door to the glassworks courtyard with his fist. Two of the apprentices met them at the door. One took charge of their mounts, and with an evil grin the other took charge of the miscreants. Alberich understood the reason for the grin perfectly. The apprentice would now be put to doing something far more interesting and less labor-intensive than mere manual work, while Aidan and Michael took his place at the bellows. The furnaces were always going in a glassworks. The fire needed to be quite hot indeed, and at an even temperature. The least skilled job was that of keeping the bellows pumping air into those furnaces, so that the molten glass was always ready to use, 
cane for decoration could be melted, and glass being blown into vessels could be reheated. Alberich knew from his previous visits where to find Master Kulin, in the master workshop. That was where he headed. The glassworks itself was a dangerous place, and he was extremely careful as he made his way through it. Even now, in the dead of winter, it was very warm in here. Surrounding the furnaces were stations for molding glass, for those who decorated finished vessels, for bead makers, for glass blowers. The floor was of pounded dirt, the benches and tables made of metal and stone. There was very little that could catch fire, logically enough. It was surprisingly dark here, too. Alberich supposed there was a reason for that. Perhaps it made the hot glass easier to see while it was being shaped. Glass was both blown and molded here, and all manner of things were made. The most common pieces were molded discs, and the thick bullseye glass for inferior windows, made by dropping hot glass into molds and pressing it. That was a job for an apprentice. It was relatively easy, relative being the proper word when you were talking about glass, a substance that ran like melted wax and would burn you to the bone if it got on you. Bead-makers formed their amazing little works of art on mandrels at their own little benches, or spun out long thin tubes of colored glass to be chopped into bits and sand-polished in big drums when cool. Glass-blowers formed the molten stuff into every shape imaginable, and decorators took the finished vessels and shapes and embellished them with ribbons of colored glass. Alberich had been here once before, when he had commissioned his window— and then, as now, it had occurred to him how like a glass-worker Vicandis' sun-lord was. The glass had no notion of what it was going to be. It was melted in the heat of his regard, then molded or shaped, polished, turned into something that bore little or no resemblance to the grains of sand it had been. Sometimes mistakes happened, and when they did, he gathered up the broken shards with infinite patience, put them back in his furnace, and began again. The more conventional analogy, and the one that the sun-priests favored, was to compare him to a sword-maker. But it had come to Alberich that he was really nothing like a sword-maker. For one thing, the vast majority of the people he made were not creatures of war. And for another, few of them were tempered and honed. Most of them were simply made, humble creatures of common use, as perfectly suited to their lives as a thick, pressed glass window. Some were merely ornamental like a bead. Some were honed and polished like the glass scalpels the healers used for the most careful surgery. But they all came from the same hands and the same place. Better window glass was made in the same way as mirror glass and required a glass blower as well. Alberich had been rather surprised by that when Master Kulin told him. It had not occurred to him that one would use the same technique that created a goblet or a vase to make a flat pane of glass. But in fact that was precisely how it was made. Glass was blown into a bubble of the right thickness, the bubble was then rolled against a flat and highly polished metal plate to form a cylinder, the ends were swiftly cut off the cylinder, and the cylinder slid up the middle while the glass was still soft enough to relax, and the resulting pane unrolled itself onto the plate and cooled flat. A master of the craft created a flat, rectangular pane of even thickness, with irregularities so few as to be trivial. But of course the larger the pane, or mirror, the more difficult the task of blowing and cutting. Something the size of the mirror in the sal was going to be extremely difficult to do. And, in fact, it was Master Kulin himself who was taking the first tries at it. A pile of rejected shards to one side testified that he had already tried and failed a time or two this morning. "'Ah, I give over,' he said as Alberich arrived. "'I thought I'd give it a try, but have not the lungs any more. I'll stick to my colored glasses and let young Elkin here do what he does best.' But young Elkin, who was older than Alberich, shook his head, it won't come quick, Master Kulin, he said honestly. I've never done aught that big. I'll need to work up to it. I wouldn't expect anything else, my lad, Kulin told him. Give it time. You'll manage. Colonel Snow's so long as you don't make the mess of it that I just did. We can find buyers for the smaller panes and mirrors while you work your way up to the right size. Are you sure of that, Master? The other craftsman asked, surprised. 
Kewlin laughed and pulled off his leather gauntlets. Certain sure? You just wait. As soon as word gets out that we're replacing a Sal mirror up there on the hill, there'll be a stream of highborn servants at the door. If you'd happen to have a spare window glass, so by so, Master Kewlin, if you're like to have a mirror from a lady's dressing table, they know we have to work our way up to a pane that big, and they know they'll get a bargain they wouldn't get if they'd commissioned those glass panes and mirrors special. Then it'll be the polishing, and then the silverin', and that'll be a bit tricky as well. Master Alberich, I want to show you something that'll catch your interest, I, and you too, Elkin. I had the collegium servants bring me down the old glass, and when I got it, this is what I found. He held up a shard of silvered glass. This'll be from the top of your mirror, and a second, and this'll be from the bottom. Now what do you think of that? The top shard was clearly thinner than the bottom. Alberich scratched his head. Glass not so good as you can make it, he hazarded. Kewlin laughed. Oh, flattery! No, no, it was fine glass, and we'll be hard put to match it. But I'll reckon that mirror was over two hundred years old if it was a day, Master Alberich. Maybe more. And when it was made, top to bottom was the same thickness. He wanted Alberich to look puzzled. With some amusement... Alberich obliged him. Then how? he asked. Glass never quite sets, Master Alberich, Kewlin told him. It's like slow water, my old master told me. Believe it or not, it keeps flowing. Oh, slow, too slow to notice, but over a century or two, or three, you look, you'll see that any glass has got thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. Mind, most of it doesn't stay unbroken long enough to find that out— especially with lads like your two troublemakers about. But there you have it. You can tell the age of a piece by how thick it's got on the bottom compared to the top. Alberich examined the two shards, then passed them on to Elkin, and blinked at that, and tried to get his mind wrapped around the idea of something that flowed that slowly. I am astonished, he admitted after a moment. Astonished. Wonderful stuff, his glass. Master Kewlin said with pride and pleasure. And I'll see to it your lads get their heads stuffed full of more than they ever cared to learn about it. No point in exercising their arms and leaving their heads to come up with more mischief. I'll send them back up the hill on time for their classes, though. No worry. And... He took a slip of paper out of a pocket in his tunic and consulted it. I see I'm to expect them back down here at fourth bell and keep them until our supper time. We eat late, mind. Correct, Alberich said. Be here they will be. Fed they will be when they arrive. Then they must study for the morrow, then bed. Kewlin laughed. If they've strength enough to hold up their heads without falling into their books, I'll be main surprised. Alberich took his leave of the master with better humor than he had arrived in. Clearly Kewlin understood boys, and was quite prepared to handle them as they needed to be handled. Michael's horse and Aidan's companion were comfortably housed, as the weapons master saw when he went to fetch Cantor, so Alberich left them in peace. The horse was happy enough, the companion still looked subdued. An interesting place. Have you ever thought of glasswork as a hobby? Cantor asked as Alberich mounted. I think I would not be good enough to satisfy myself, Alberich replied truthfully. They rode out into the street. Already the industrious craftsmen here had gotten it cleared, and the snow had been piled up along the walls. Why was the boy's companion so quiet? Because he is as much to blame as the children, Cantor told him. Apparently he was in league with them. He is very young. Alberich snorted. He must be. I thought your kind had better sense. Cantor sighed gustily. Those of us who are older are. Some of us, like Eloran, are young. Have you got any plans for delivering some sort of chastisement to Eloran? Alberich asked after a moment, while he tried to sort out the meaning behind his words and couldn't come up with anything. Oh, yes, came the reply. Rolan and I have devised something quite appropriate. And since nothing else was forthcoming, Alberich's curiosity had to remain unassuaged. 3. 
Selene looked out of a window in the long gallery on the way to her lesser audience chamber and sighed with regret. The garden was alive with color and movement against the snow. The brilliantly colored cloaks, coats, and hoods of the younger members of her court, as they chased one another, flung snowballs, and generally forgot any pretense of dignity. Young men who had lately fought the tedrils had cast aside their adulthood for a few hours as they fired snowballs at pages safely ensconced behind the sturdy walls of a snow fort. Young ladies giggled and joined the pages in flinging missiles back at their suitors. Others were on the way to frozen ponds with skates slung over their shoulders, or moving toward the artificial hills in the wild garden with sleds. Selene would have given a year of her life to be down there with them. Alas, the queen had an audience with the ambassador from Hardorn, and there was no time for frolicking in the snow, no time for skating, no time for a fast run on a sled. Curse it. She nodded to the guards on either side of the door of the lesser audience chamber and went inside. She'd had the room repainted in softer colors than her father had favored, though she couldn't do much about the leather paneling, which had been there for decades and would probably be there for decades more. It was easy to keep clean and looked far more luxurious than anything she could install to replace it. She'd settled for painting the trim an ashen brown with silver gilt touches here and there. The ambassador and his entourage were already waiting, as was Talamir. Bless him. It was clear he had been keeping the ambassador properly entertained, although such gentlemen were notable for being able to conceal any evidence of impatience. The smile Ambassador Warrenton turned on her was quite genuine and warm, and his eyes were relaxed. He wore the fine shirt, tunic, trues, and floor-length open vest in the current Valdemaran style, which was a little disappointing. She'd wanted to see what the Hardornan mode was, for the talk was that the new queen was quite a fashion-setter. She gave him her hand, he bowed over it, and she was pleased to note that his hand was warm and dry, not cold or clammy. She took her place on the small velvet-covered throne on the sketchy dais and motioned to him to sit. This was a room meant to welcome rather than awe. The warm ochre of the leather-covered paneling and the aspect of it, situated so that it looked out into a sheltered courtyard, made it surprisingly comfortable for a formal room. The furnishings were all upholstered in leather that matched the paneling and the floor carpeted. There was a fine fire in the fireplace and servants with mulled spiced wine to serve. Everything that could have been done to relax the ambassador and his entourage had been. More of Talamir's work, no doubt. Ambassador Warrington, it is good to see you again, she said warmly. And I am glad that you were able to reach our court before this snow closed us in. As am I, Majesty, he replied. And my king wishes me, first, to tender his sympathies for your loss, and second, offer his apologies that he was not able to send me sooner. She smiled at him, and hoped that her weariness with all of the official expressions of condolence did not show. She knew very well that the king of Hardorn could have cared less about who was on the throne of Valdemar. He knew that Valdemar would always favor allies and peace over conquest. In fact, so long as that attitude prevailed, the king of Hardorn would not have cared if the council had elected a horse to wear the crown. Please, Warrington, the message of condolence arrived with the usual promptness of our friends and allies, and I can certainly understand how your king would be otherwise too occupied with his own defensive preparations against Carsey to think about sending you to our court. If Valdemar had fallen, or even been pushed back, Warrenton said apologetically and shrugged, We share a border with Carsey, as you know. The king was prepared, at need, to unite our force with yours, if it had come to that. As it was, the defeated Tedrils spread into our land, and we were forced to deal with them as one would any other plague. The king would not have bestirred himself unless his border lords forced him to. She translated to herself. In fact, it probably wouldn't have been the King of Hardorn who united his forces with us at all. It would have been the local Hardorn and border levies. And your king was right to concern himself first with them, and concern himself with other things second. 
Selene agreed. I am glad it never came to the point of asking our allies for help. She knew, and probably the ambassador did too, that the reason her father hadn't asked Hardorn for troops was precisely because there was no telling what the Tedrils were going to do for certain. Yes, Carsey had hired them to take Valdemar. But if Hardorn's border troops had been removed to bolster Valdemaran forces, leaving that border unguarded, the Tedrils would probably have taken southern Hardorn and come at Valdemar from the eastern flank. The king of Hardorn was a good man and served his people well, but he was not a very good strategist, nor were any of his military advisers, sad to say. All of them were old men and more accustomed to dealing with the odd bandit force than a real campaign. Carsey's long-standing and increasingly hostile feud with Valdemar had ensured that Hardorn had been very little troubled over the past two reigns. Her father had deemed it wise not to distract Hardorn's king with, as he had put it, conflicting needs. She had better say something flattering before her mouth let something unflattering escape. And am I to understand that congratulations will shortly be in order? Selene continued with a slight smile. We do expect the birth of an heir before spring, yes, Warrington admitted. He did not mention that the young queen was only a little older than Selene, nor that the king was older than Sendar had been, nor did Selene make anything of it. She was just grateful that the king of Hardorn had married before the death of her own father. Now at least there was one old man who was out of the running as a potential suitor. Had he still been single, his previous wife having died without producing a living heir, there soon would have been advisers on both sides of the border clamoring for a match between them. I will have to rack my brain to find a unique birth gift then, Selene replied. I'm sure that by now His Majesty has an entire room given over to silver rattles and ivory teething rings. The ambassador smiled politely as if to suggest that a royal infant could not possibly have too many silver rattles and ivory teething rings. Selene spent the better part of two candle marks with the ambassador, mostly taking her lead from Talamir or the ambassador himself as to when subjects currently under negotiation needed to be mentioned. There were some, of course. Hardorn badly wanted to take back some land that Carsey had overrun half a century ago— but if they did, the king wanted to be sure that Valdemar wouldn't take it amiss. Valdemar wanted warning if this was going to happen, so that when Carsey reacted, though given how unsettled things were there at the moment, Carsey might not even notice for a year or two, there would be extra guards on the border again. Hardorn wanted to know what Valdemar was going to do with all those Tedril children. Valdemar politely told Hardorn it was none of Hardorn's business but that, in fact, the children were more than halfway to being Valdemaran by now. Hardorn suggested polite skepticism, Valdemar offered examples, and pointed out the general ages of the children. There were some matters of trade to discuss, some concessions that both of them wanted. No few of these would have to go before the council, and presumably an equivalent body in Hardorn, but in a simple convivial discussion like this one, it was possible to get a feel for how such overtures would be met when presented formally. Finally, and none too soon in Selene's opinion, the ambassador gave signs that he had said all he needed to, and she politely decreed the audience was at an end. He withdrew. She turned to Talamir as soon as the doors had closed behind him and his entourage. Talamir shrugged wearily. He did everything wearily these days. He seemed to have aged twenty years since the end of the wars. His hair had gone entirely to silver-gray, and that lean, careworn face had lines of pain in it that had not been there a year ago. The eyes had changed the most, though. Now they were an indeterminate, stormy color, with the look in them of someone who has looked into places that mortal men are not supposed to see. Still, most of the time he was the same Talamir she remembered, stubborn and difficult to move once he had decided on a thing. No hidden agendas, I think, Majesty, he said judiciously. Other than the obvious, that the king waited to see if I'd survive six months on the throne on my own before sending a formal envoy, she said with a feeling of resignation. 
All of the envoys had been like this. It was disheartening to think that there were probably bets being placed on how long she would remain queen and sole ruler of Valdemar. Well, you could have wedded immediately, Talamir pointed out. From his point of view, there was no harm in waiting to see if you did before sending the ambassador. Or I could have been toppled by one of my own nobles, or assassinated by a leftover Tedril. She did not add, after all, I'm only a woman, but the unspoken words hung in the air between them. Well, you weren't, Talamir replied unexpectedly. And those of us who knew you also knew you wouldn't be. And if some foreign monarch is foolish enough to think that your youth and sex means that you are weak and foolish, well, I pity him. He'll take a beating at the negotiation tables. She flushed, feeling suddenly warm with pleasure. Thank you for that, Talamir, she replied. So Talamir really did think she was capable. It was a welcome surprise. She would not have been at all surprised if he had still been thinking of her as little Selene, who needed a firm hand on the rein and a great deal of looking after. He gave a little bow and smiled. He still had a charming smile. Credit where credit is due, he said simply. And by this point I'm sure the throne room is filled with impatient petitioners. So on to the next chore. She thought longingly of the fresh snow outside and ruthlessly pushed away the longing. Queens did not desert their court to frolic carelessly when there were duties to be done. Queens had responsibilities. Time to get to it. The sooner we clear the work out, the less likely it is I'll incur the wrath of the cooks by delaying luncheon. She rose and shook out her skirts, still startled, even after all this time, to note the trimming of black on her royal whites where the silver of the heir or the gold of the monarch should be. Speaking of wrath, she continued, as Talamir went to hold the doors of the chamber open for her, what's the outcome of that little disaster down at the sal? Talamir coughed to hide a smile, she thought. Alberich escorted the two miscreants down to the glassworks just after breakfast, he told her. They will be spending from now until, we're thinking, Vernal Equinox, pumping the glassworks bellows every free moment that they have. We're loath to keep them down there once the weather begins to get significantly warmer, because work switches to the night time once it becomes hellish to keep the furnaces going at full heat in the hottest part of the day. But we also want them to feel they're really being punished when the weather turns, and all their friends are enjoying themselves outdoors again. Poor things, she said, feeling rather sorry for them, seeing as she was in a similar situation with no hope for a reprieve. Talamir coughed again. This time it sounded a bit disapproving. Selene, do you have any notion how much the Crown's treasury is going to have to pay the glass workers for a new mirror? You could replace every horse in the Royal Guard with Ashkevron war stallions for less than the cost of that mirror. Personally, I think they're getting off lightly. If those mirrors cost so much, how on earth did the Crown manage to pay for all of them when they were first installed? she asked, as the two of them, flanked by a couple of guards, made their way down the gallery that overlooked the snow-covered gardens. If the legends are correct, no one paid for them at all, Talamir replied. The herald mages made them, supposedly, just as whenever one was broken, the herald mages fixed them. How very convenient, she said dryly. Did the herald mages fix plumbing, too? I've had an artificer in my bathing room twice now, and that drip still isn't fixed. When I was trying to sleep last night, that was all I could hear. Sendar used to say he found it soothing, Talamir said quietly. I am not my father, Selene thought, and felt a surge of resentment as well as sadness. But she was not going to say it. Just have someone send a different artificer, please, she replied instead. If I have to move into my old rooms for a few days until it's fixed, I've no objections. If I have to listen to that drip for many more nights, I'm going to go mad. With classes cancelled for the day, Alberich found himself with unexpected free time on his hands. In light of the frustration of pursuing inquiries to dead ends recently, he decided he had a good idea of how to fill some of it. At this point, all of his usual sources of information had run dry. 
It was time to find some new ones, but to do that he would have to create new identities. What I'm looking for is not going to be found around Exile's Gate, he decided. It was with a distinct feeling of pleasure that he noted that Cantor had followed his thought, and had altered his course, heading not for the Collegia, but for the Companion's Bell. This was a prosperous tavern that played host to heralds quite regularly, and to Alberich quite a bit more often than to most, although if you had asked the staff, they would have said truthfully that they didn't see him there very often. There was a secret room in the back of the stables where Harold Alberich would retire, and someone else would emerge, by way of a door that no more than a handful of people knew existed. In that room was a chest of disguises, which were apparently tended to by someone in the bell, for no matter what state they were in when Alberich left them there, the next time he returned they would be clean, or at any rate cleaner, since the apparent dirt and real stains were an integral and important part of some of them. Furthermore, any damage he'd done to them would be repaired, and the clothing neatly put away back in the chest. He'd inherited that room and that chest from Harold Daythor, his predecessor as weapons master, and he'd put quite a bit of wear on the disguises he'd found there. Enough that it was time to do something about the situation before he found himself literally without anything to wear. He'd have to do it in disguise, though. Even though he flatly refused to wear Harold's whites, his own gray leathers were distinctive enough to mark him as the Collegium Weapons Master. If the Weapons Master was noted visiting the used clothing merchants, it would be a short step for anyone keeping an eye on him to determine that he was purchasing disguises. Why else would he be making a great many purchases of used clothing? So, after leaving Cantor tucked into an out-of-the-way stall in the section of the stables reserved for companions, Harold Alberich retired into that room, and a persona he had never used until now emerged into the alley behind the inn. His clothing was well made, of good materials, but a little out of style, as befitting a prosperous merchant or craftsman from one of the farther or more rustic reaches of the kingdom. Good thick boots with a significant amount of scuffing and wear to the tops suggested that he was used to doing a great deal of walking in rough country. Leather breeches with little wear on the seat but a great deal to the legs and knees added to that impression. His heavy wool cape with an attached hood was significantly old-fashioned, though the material was very good, and it was lined with lamb's wool plush, which was quite a luxurious fabric. Beneath the cape was a knit woolen tunic that went down to his calves. Also significantly out of fashion, for it should have been, but was not, worn with a sleeveless leather or cordware jerkin if he'd been living in Haven for any length of time. All of this gear looked homemade rather than tailor-made, and every bit of it made him look rustic. If he spoke slowly and took care with his syntax, despite the odd accent he still had, He'd be taken for a farmer or craftsman, or just possibly a country squire, from some agrarian part of Valdemar with its own regional accent. It was a fine guise and very useful for what he was about to do, which was to buy used clothing. Such was easy enough to acquire, and it was easier to put mending and patching onto gently used clothing than it was to repair clothing that was getting far past its useful lifespan. It was easier to put on stains than remove them. That so helpful, completely invisible accomplice at the companion's bell was quite literate, as Alberich had proved to himself by leaving instructions with one of those disguises and returning to find that those instructions had been carried out to the letter. So he would buy appropriate outfits and leave instructions on how the items were to be abused if they looked insufficiently used. And finally, he would have things that fit him rather than Daythor. His predecessor had been slightly shorter and significantly broader in the waist than Alberich, with much shorter legs. It will be good not to have to wear my breeches down around my hips to keep them from looking too short. He spent a very profitable morning going from shop to stall to barrow, examining items with all the care that any thrifty fellow from the hinterland would use, exhibiting all the suspicion that he was being cheated by a city sharper than any haven merchant would expect from a shrewd bumpkin, eager to get his money's worth. He never bought more than one piece from any one place at the same time, 
though he did come back later, if he'd seen more than one item that he wanted. In this persona, Alberich was not particularly notable. There were several men like him, engaged in similar errands up and down the quarter where used clothing was sold. Most were alone, though a few had wives or older children with them. Whenever he had a collection of three or four items, he went back to the bell and left them, so that he was never observed carrying great piles of clothing. By doing this, he was able to acquire disguises for a good dozen personae, including one or two that were just a touch above his current character, good, solid citizens who would be welcome in any decent house or tavern in the city. Anything else he'd get from the palace. He had a notion he'd like to have a set of palace livery, perhaps a guard uniform, and clothing appropriate for the lower ranks of the highborn. And, under the guise of purchasing something for his wife, he bought some women's clothing as well. Not that he'd ever tried to impersonate a woman, but, well, he might need to. You'd never pull it off. Cantor said critically as he stowed these last purchases away, hanging them up rather than putting them in the chest, as even with all of the old guises taken out and left with a note to get rid of them, there was no more room in that chest. You'd need a wig, and how would you hide that face of yours? I've seen plenty of ugly women in this city, he objected. I'm sure you have, but none that looked as if they'd been through a fire, then fought in a dozen taverns and a war. Cantor argued. And you don't act like a woman. You don't know how to act like a woman. If you need to find out something only a woman can, then get a woman to do it. Misty would probably fit those skirts. But, he started to argue, then stopped. Misty would fit those skirts. And she was a native of Haven. And she'd come into the heraldic circle as an adult— which meant that she was used to being a civilian, acting like a civilian, and she had all the knowledge that an ordinary citizen of Haven had. He wouldn't want to take her down into the area around Exile's Gate, but— But she'd go if you asked her to. Think about it, anyway. There's Harold Karen, too. She'd go, and she'd fit in anywhere that was rough, including around Exile's Gate. Good gods, some of the clientele of those fishers' taverns in the ports of Evendim would frighten the way out of the loungers in the broken arms. Cantor sounded very sure of himself, but Alberich saw no reason to doubt that he was right. Karen was a tearaway of the First Order, and back in the day, if the Sun's Guard had permitted women to take up arms, he'd have had no objection to her in his cavalry unit. She made a fearless bodyguard for Selene. I'd have to find a way to persuade Ilsa to stay away, though. The two of them together would be a dead giveaway to anyone who knows anything about the Heralds. Pointing that out ought to be enough to persuade Ilsa, Cantor replied with a hint of humor. Wild they might be, stupid they aren't. Well, two excellent ideas in one morning, one from his own mind and one from Cantor. And didn't I tell you, back when we first came here, that you and I were a good match? Cantor asked smugly. So you did, and you were correct. So very correct that I don't even mind hearing you say I told you so. Cantor's only reply was a sort of mental snicker. Alberich finished writing notes on what he wanted done, or not, to each of the new disguises, left them piled atop the chest, or hung up on pegs around the room, went to the stable side door, and blew out the lamp. Don't worry, you won't be seen. No one here but us companions, Cantor told him, and he slipped the catch, moved out into the stable, and shut the door carefully behind himself. It locked with a soft click. There were indeed two other companions in stalls with Cantor. One was partnered with Harold Mirilin, who was one of the two heralds assigned permanently to dispense justice within Haven. The other assigned to that duty was Jadis, who, since losing his leg, could not ride for very long or very far, but whose insight and understanding of human nature made him very suitable for this job. Jadis's companion was not here, though. The third companion was not one he recognized. Not a herald you know, either. Someone just in off circuit and an old friend of Mirilin's. And something about the tone of Cantor's mind voice told Alberich that the old friend was female, and that neither Mirilin nor the newcomer would be found in the common room, but that they would be found with each other. 
Heh. <laughs> so Mirilin was human after all. Mirilin with a woman. Now that was a thought to hold on to. From the way that Mirilin usually acted, Alberich had the idea that he'd be very embarrassed if he was caught playing truant with a woman, and no matter if the woman was another herald. I believe, he said as Cantor turned his head to wink one blue eye at him, that I will have one of the bell's delicious pigeon pies, and I believe I will linger over it. It would do him no end of good to see the expression on Mirilin's face when the herald finally did emerge. Cantor snickered. There was no other word for it. The sound wasn't even remotely horse-like. I'll see to it that their companions forget to mention you're here. Mirilin and the stranger strolled into the smaller common room, the one usually used by heralds, with a careless and casual air, as of people who expect to find a room empty. And since Alberich had deliberately set himself in the most secluded corner of the room, which happened to be right beside the cheerful fire, Mirilin and his friend would not be able to see him until they were already well into the room. Hela, Mirilin, he said calmly and was rewarded when Mirilin actually jumped a little, startled. The other herald, an attractive little redhead, didn't jump, but did look surprised. The herald peered at his corner. To Alberich's further pleasure, he flushed and looked extremely discomfited. Not that there was anything at all wrong with two heralds having a quiet mark or two alone together, far from it. But being discovered by the enigmatic Alberich... That same Alberich that Mirilin had openly and avowedly not trusted at all when he first became Selene's bodyguard, and who was now one of the great heroes of the wars. And if Mirilin was not acting as a justiciar in the heraldic court, shouldn't he be up the hill at the Collegium at the moment? Again, there was no reason why Mirilin should not take a mark or two out of the day to please himself, but someone like Mirilin would feel guilty that he had— and moreover, he probably wouldn't want anyone to know he had done so. Ah, Harold Alberich, what are you doing in Haven? Delivering our miscreants to their place of punishment, he replied. Heard of the incident in the Salle, I presume you have? A broken mirror, wasn't it? Mirilin said after a moment. And a couple of trainees with more enthusiasm than sense? Mirilin was regaining his composure, which made Alberich smile a little. After all, he only wanted to discomfit the fellow a trifle, not humiliate him. Alberich uttered a dry chuckle. Well put, and no more free time in which to devise more such mischief will they have until well into spring. Pumping the bellows at the glassworks, Dean Elkarth has decreed, is to be their task. Mirilin smiled and winced at the same time. Well, at the least, they'll have stout muscles when spring comes. Make the punishment fit the crime. I like that, said the woman, not as young as Alberich had first thought. She wasn't as old as Mirilin, but she was older than Alberich. Are you the new weapons master, then? She left Mirilin and approached Alberich, her hand extended, somewhat to Mirilin's consternation. Sorry I hadn't met you before this. I've been on one circuit or another for almost six years, and when I come in, I usually stay here rather than at the Collegium. When I'm off, I'm a bit of a carouser, and why disturb people's sleep when I can have all the fun I like and not upset anyone down here? I'm Ravinia, mind speech and animal mind speech. Alberich rose, took her hand, and bowed slightly over it. And I'm Alberich, he told her, releasing it. Foresight, for whatever good it does. She smiled at him. Mirilin was very clearly discomfited again, perhaps because the lady he had come here to meet was being so very friendly to someone he used to not trust very much. So you are indeed the very famous Harold Alberich. It's a pleasure to meet you at last. Since I'm staying at least a moon this time, I expect you'll see me at the Sal. I could use some sparring practice. Can you find me partners at short notice? Is she flirting with me? He asked Cantor incredulously. No, she really does need sparring practice. Find some of the mid-level guards from Selene's bodyguard, or Karen or Ilsa. Cantor chuckled. 
She's not flirting, she's being direct, and she doesn't mistrust you. She hadn't met you at a time when you were under suspicion. You are not Alberich of Carsey to her, you are Harold Alberich. You will welcome me, and partners can be found, he replied, and decided to end Miralyn's discomfort by taking himself off. Rude I do not wish to seem, but my task and meal both being over, returning I must be. Certainly, Ravinia agreed. I expect we'll meet again in the next day or two. Excellent. He nodded at Miralyn. And fare you well in your afternoon's tasks, Miralyn. Perhaps the heavy snow will thin the plaintiffs. Miralyn shrugged. I wouldn't count on it, but I wouldn't be upset if you were right. But there was a change in Miralyn, a subtle one, but there it was. Perhaps because, for the first time, he saw Alberich through the eyes of someone he trusted, and he saw the man before him as Harold Alberich. Alberich took that as a dismissal, and took himself off, keeping his chuckle strictly internal. Well, well, well. Of course, neither of them could know that he knew the two of them hadn't just accidentally arrived at the bell at the same time. But Miralyn suspected Alberich knew, and Alberich was never going to let on one way or another. They let the stable hands take their companions in, Cantor told him. They had a great deal of catching up to do. Indeed, Alberich replied. It was interesting that Miralyn was clearly embarrassed, but Ravinia was not. Shaitany says that Ravinia isn't embarrassed by much, Cantor observed dispassionately. A very cool one, she says. I can believe that. Alberich paused at the door to swing his cloak over his shoulders and pushed out into the stable yard. Snow was still falling, but at least it was not much more than token flakes, and a single stable boy with a broom was doing a reasonable job of keeping up with it. He crossed the yard and walked into the stables again, and a bay horse in the stall nearest the door peered over the side of the partition and snorted at him. I trust that the boys are already on their way back up to the collegia, he added. Halfway there, and just in time for their classes— Cantor confirmed, as he picked up saddle and blanket from the side of the stall, and heaved them onto Cantor's back. Just about in the state of sore-muscled, worn-out wretchedness you'd hoped for. Not utterly miserable, certainly not feeling any desperation, but definitely feeling chastised. Good. He didn't want them to be desperate, but he wanted them to feel, well and truly, that they were being punished for making not one but several bad decisions. Not the least of which was that they made the choice to act recklessly in a place where mistakes would be magnified. Elkarth had made an excellent decision as to their punishment, and he and the Dean of Bardic had made it crystal clear that the boys were being punished by their respective collegia, not by Alberich alone. He finished putting on the last of the tack, and Cantor backed out into the aisle so that Alberich could mount. What had you planned for this afternoon? I believe I'll have a talk with Karen about that suggestion of yours, he replied. And perhaps with Misty, though I'd rather speak to Karen first. Good. Mind you, I'd feel better if you had more than one set of hands and eyes helping you. But the more people there are in on a secret, the harder it becomes to keep it. He felt Cantor's sigh of resignation beneath his legs as they trotted out into the stable yard, under the arched gate that led to the street and onto the thoroughfare itself. Cantor didn't argue with him, though. The companion knew just as well as anyone that if Alberich was going to do the covert part of his job effectively, it had to be kept secret. Heralds were humans, as witness, Miralyn, and humans talked, gossiped, let things slip by accident. That was one of the reasons why Alberich needed to do his job in the first place. The ride up to the Collegium was uneventful, and now that substantial inroads had been made on clearing the snow, it was a bit faster than the ride down had been. And Alberich noted as they rode that it wasn't only the trainees that had been infected by a spirit of play. There were snow fights and sliding, the building of snow sculptures and castles, and he saw no few people going by with skates over their shoulders. As they came into the region of private houses, larger and representing more wealth, the closer they came to the palace, there was even more sign of merry-making in the snow. Well, 
It isn't often that Haven sees a snowfall as heavy as this one has been. Personally, I've never seen anything of the sort, Alberich admitted. There are snows in my hills, but they're thin and dry. This is winter weather typical for the north of Valdemar, not so much here, said Cantor. I wonder... There was a long pause, as they wove their way among the houses of the highborn, and laughter and shrieks of pleasure and excitement echoed behind the walls and fences. You wonder, Alberich prompted his companion. Well, it's dreadfully soon, and the court is technically still in mourning, but a snowfall like this doesn't come very often, and there's going to be a hard, cold spell coming behind it. Cantor gave the impression to Alberich that he was musing aloud, though Alberich wondered for a moment where he was getting his weather information. The Terrily is going to freeze solid when that cold spell comes. That hasn't happened in fifty years. I just wonder if it's occurred to Selene to decree a snow festival. Although Alberich had never heard of a snow festival before, the name pretty much told him everything he needed to know. If the river freezes solid... Isn't something like that bound to happen spontaneously anyway? The very novelty of the frozen river would bring skaters, the skaters would draw vendors of food and drink, and those would attract musicians, skate sharpeners, skate vendors, and probably more merchants than that. On the whole, well, it wouldn't be a bad thing for an official festival to take place. Official mourning be damned. The wars had dragged on for years. Sendar's death had cast a pall over the entire country, but there was only so much grieving that you could do before you just wearied of it. Selene's coronation had been a triumph, but it had been a shadowed triumph. Well, you can hear it beginning for yourself, Cantor agreed, tossing his head in the direction of yet more laughter. And once the river freezes, people will come flocking down to the banks. If it were me... I'd go ahead and make the decree so that what is going to break out anyway gets some time limits to it. And while we're at it, something like this would create a number of excellent opportunities for you to nose about and listen. Cantor paused, perhaps to gather his thoughts. If anyone is going to try and foment discontent, oddly enough, a festival is a good place to do so. You can say things then that people will dismiss as the drink-talking but the words will stick in the memory. And should Selene or her council do something that people don't agree with, those words will be remembered. We really do think too much alike, Alberich agreed, as they turned in at the gate, with a friendly nod to the guardsman on duty. So to whom should we drop hints, and when? Leave that to us companions, said Cantor. It's what we're good at. The area around the Sal was extremely quiet, without streams of trainees coming and going. When Daythor had moved out, Alberich had gotten the carpenters to put in a good, stout, one-companion stable up against that oven wall for Cantor to stay in when he chose. It was immensely more convenient not to have to go all the way up to the companion's stable in order to tack him up, and this way he and Cantor could come and go without any fuss or anyone noticing. Cantor himself always went up to the main stable to eat and drink, and companions being companions and not horses, the interior of this secondary stable didn't need to be cleaned. Alberich being Alberich, he saw to Cantor's tack himself, except for the fancy show or parade tack, so it wasn't really any inconvenience to the stable hands either, for Cantor to have his everyday kit down here. Alberich dismounted at the door of the little lean-to addition, and Cantor followed him inside. It was pleasantly warm, thanks to that brick wall. "'I'm going up to the stable,' the companion said, as Alberich took off his halter and he shook his head and neck vigorously. "'I'm going to have some consultations.' Alberich bent to unbuckle the girth. "'I'll probably be here for the next mark or two. I want to think a few things over myself.' Cantor tossed his head, and when Alberich had a good grip on the saddle and blanket, walked out from underneath them. I'll let you know if anything gets started. And with that the companion trotted back out into the snow, leaving Alberich to wipe down the tack and hang it up to dry. It was less quiet in the sal than Alberich had thought it would be. 
He'd forgotten that there was going to be a crew of cleaners, making sure that there was not the tiniest bit of glass left behind, then setting the floor to rights again. The soft murmur of voices was rather pleasant. He slipped in without disturbing them and went back into his own quarters. The glory of his window took him by surprise. A blaze of gold and blue, color in a room that had been pale and faded in winter light before the window had been put in. It was going to be a while before he got used to the change, but the shock was one of pleasure, and he found that he liked it. He sat down where he got the best possible view of the glass, and was bathed in the golden light coming from the sun in glory. Ah, it felt good. It felt right to have the light of Vicandis about him. It felt like a blessing, and perhaps it was. If that was so, well, this was a good place for him to be when he was thinking about important decisions. Now the question about Karen and Misty was, should he take one or both women into his confidence concerning his covert work? Misty had the better knowledge of Haven. Karen would fit into rougher places. As he weighed the abilities of one against the other, it became clear that if he was going to do this, it would eventually have to be both. Neither had the ability or the skills to move in all the places that he could, but he thought that he would approach Karen about this first. It was, after all, the rougher places of Haven where most of his prowling was done. That made him feel easier. Later, perhaps, he could ask Misty if he thought he'd need her. She wasn't much good at anything physical, and he wasn't sure just how well she could conceal her feelings. He really didn't want to involve her if he didn't have to. No matter how good a notion Cantor thought it was, companions weren't always right. 4. Bloody hell! Harold Karen said in sheer admiration. She shook her head. All this time, you've been running around in Hell's own neighborhood all this time by yourself. Bloody hell! Karen had held Alberich in high esteem for his skill, but he sensed that this had not been anything she would have pictured him doing. So where's your wheelbarrow, then? Pardon? he said, puzzled, as Ilsa choked. But neither of them explained, so he decided it was one of those colloquialisms he wouldn't understand even if he knew what she'd meant, and dismissed it from his mind. Karen was probably Alberich's age, though with someone from Lake Evendim it was hard to tell. They were all lean, tall, and had the sort of face that appears not to change a great deal between the ages of twenty and sixty. She had been a herald for several years by the time Alberich came to Haven, and people swore she'd looked pretty much the same as she did now on the day she arrived. She was an oddity among the female heralds, as she wore her brown hair cropped close to her head, but then the only hairstyle she was interested in was how to braid up a companion's mane and tail for parade. Since Daythor his second made me, prowling the streets I have been, Alberich confirmed. Karen grinned at him, with a glint in her eye that made her partner Ilsa sigh and cast a glance up toward heaven. Ilsa was cut of a similar cloth to Karen, though her hair was an ash blonde and her jaw square rather than even dim narrow. Apparently they had been together from the time they were yearmates as trainees. Ilsa tended to be the one who exercised more caution than Karen did. Hardly surprising, really, since Misty claimed the Lake Evendim fishers were all descended from pirates. And just how often have you been doing this? she asked. Of late, perhaps every two or three nights. But during the worst of it, nightly could I manage it. Bloody hell! When did you sleep? Karen demanded. Infrequently, apparently, Ilsa muttered. He had known he would have to let Ilsa in on the secret of his double life the moment he'd decided to recruit Karen. He had learned as a commander that the only way to ensure perfect cooperation from his men, or now his women, was to make certain their partners knew what was toward. And although by the strictest Carsite creed what was between Ilsa and Karen was not to be thought of. Alberich had been a leader of men for far too long to know that things that were not to be thought of were commoner than the Sun Priests admitted. Back when he'd been a captain of the Sun's Guard, two of his men had had just such an understanding between them, though the rest of the troop had not known. 
and Alberich doubted that even the two in question ever realized he had discovered their association. They had been very good at keeping it all to themselves, but Alberich had been better at reading subtle body language than they were at concealing it from him. Never once had it affected their performance. Never once had they allowed it to affect their behavior in the troops. After careful soul-searching on Alberich's part, he had finally decided that what did not affect the troops did not matter, and ignored it. Several more of the men had clandestine marriages with women in one or another of the villages. Ordinary fighters were not permitted to marry at all, under any circumstances, only officers. Needless to say, those understandings, too, had been kept very quiet. Strange that whoring was tolerated, if preached against, but an honest marriage was absolutely forbidden, on the grounds that it was a distraction to the soldier. This had all conflicted with what the sun priests decreed, and as their leader his responsibility was to report every irregularity to the sun priests, except that if he did that, he'd earn the hatred of half of them and see the other half cashiered before six months was over. Eventually he had come to a decision on his own about what the men did or did not do. If some behavioral trait of one of his people did not affect performance and honor adversely, it mattered not at all. If it affected performance and honor positively, it mattered a very great deal. So when confronted by similar irregularities as a herald, he followed the same course, and that seemed to be the right way to go. It certainly fell right into line with the credo that there is no one right way. So far as he could judge, Karen and Ilsa were good partners. Karen gave Ilsa a boost to thinking imaginatively. Ilsa steadied Karen down, something that hellion badly needed. If they had lovers' quarrels, they kept it to themselves, or at least never involved anyone but a counselor. And although Karen was permanently stationed at the Collegium, there hadn't been a better riding instructor in the past fifty years, so it was said, and Ilsa was a special messenger which took her out of Haven all the time, neither of them complained about being separated far too often. If they'd been sons guard, he'd have called them fine soldiers, and written them up for commendations. As it was, since there was no such thing as officers in the heraldic circle, and thus absolutely nothing he could say or do that would get them any advance in rank, he merely considered it a pity that there weren't more heralds like them. And you want me to help you out, Karen continued, still with that glint in her eyes. From time to time, not often, but there are some things women tell not to men, and some places men are welcome not, he shrugged. That there is the greatness of threat to Valdemar that there was once, I think not. That there is the threat still existing, however, I do think. I know not why there was that man paying for grumblings against the Queen, for instance, and this troubles me. Valdemar was not impoverished in the wars as it could have been. Thanks to you, Ilsa pointed out. If you hadn't gone after those children and got the lion's share of the Tedril loot in the process, we would have been. He waved that aside. Still, seasoned fighters were lost. Valdemar hires not from the mercenary guild, so weakened will Valdemar be for some time. A weakened land is a land that others may seek to exploit. Hmm. Ilsa sat back in her chair and stroked her chin speculatively. That could be, though we've friends on the east and south. There is the north, Karen pointed out. Northern barbarians are always a danger, and the gods only know what Iftil might do. Just because it's been quiet for centuries doesn't mean it won't suddenly roar up and turn into a menace. And there's always the West. Pirates on Evendim. Bandit bands large enough to qualify as armies. Weird stuff out of the Pelagiers. Gods only know what comes farther into the West than the Pelagiers. Even so, Alberich nodded. The northern border and the western are fluid, Ilsa supplied him. And what's more, Selene inherited a kingdom where war has allowed other problems to be ignored. And I suspect you know that at first hand. She raised an eyebrow at him. Special messengers saw a lot, and were chosen as much for their ability to keep their mouths shut as their riding prowess. He shrugged. Indeed. The enemy I fear most lies within our borders, 
In Haven, the city guard shorthanded still remains. Opportunists come in all stripes and all ranks. Perhaps this is why someone seeks to agitate against Selene. While we look to that trouble, we miss some other evil he may do. Where there are fortunes to be made, men will seek to make them be the source never so vile. And once you start selling one vile thing, further vileness comes easier, especially when the price is good enough. Karen shook her head. Well, how would you like me to start? By learning to act a part, Alberich told her immediately. The hellion will not always welcome be where I would ask you to go. Sometimes the serving wench, sometimes the whore. Karen snickered at that. Me? I'd never pass as a whore. Nobody had looked twice at me. You're not old, not rattled with drink, have all your teeth, most of your mind, and no disease, Alberich said pragmatically before Ilsa could jump in. In the quarters where I go, that is enough. Karen snorted. Most of my mind, I like that. Ilsa laughed. You're a herald. You're volunteering to spy on the worst parts of Haven, dear. That's not exactly anything I see sane people queuing up to do. Karen made a face, but she didn't argue. So there it is. Can you act a part? Alberich asked. Can you act those parts? Karen scratched one eyebrow thoughtfully. I'm pretty sure I can. At least as long as you don't expect me to bed anybody. Not for days and weeks at a time, but then you aren't going to want that, I suppose. No, he agreed. If it must come to days and weeks, another solution sought must be. Not you nor I can be spared our assigned duties. A few hours at most is what we will need. And, no, if the whore you play, it is my whore you will be. For a few hours, I can manage anything, Karen decreed. I suppose I could even manage pretending to be a lady. I'd pay money to see that, Ilsa chortled. If it is a lady I need, to Talamir I should take myself, Alberich told them. Better to find one within the court who is a friend, and I assume that he has more than one such already. Probably, Ilsa agreed, and Karen nodded. There are highborn heralds, too. Probably no one would tell them anything directly, and since everyone would know they were heralds, they'd be useless as spies. But people do gossip, and gossip alone might be worth something. So there it was. He had agreement not only from Karen but from her partner, which basically meant that Ilsa agreed not to interfere. He felt a little of the weight lift from his shoulders. Well then, I thank you both. He stood up and motioned them both to remain seated. I shall let myself out. Not soon will this be. Nothing have I that needs a female at the moment. Better to have the gaff in your hand before you try to land the sturgeon, Karen observed. Take me with you a time or two when you've not got something on the boil, and I can get used to playing the doxy. I shall, he promised, and let himself out of their somewhat cramped quarters. They shared a room meant for one. Well, it probably wasn't as crowded as it could have been, since both of them tended to keep personal possessions at a minimum, and Ilsa was often away. But it felt very claustrophobic to him. All things considered, he wasn't unhappy about being down in the cell. If he wanted or needed more room, he could just add on, as apparently generations of weapons masters had done before him. Quarters in the Herald's Wing were best described as tight by his current standards, and he wasn't at all certain he would care to have neighbors on either side of his walls, either. That went very well, he decided, and knew that it could have turned out a flat failure. Karen might not have been interested. Ilsa might well have objected. And Karen's suggestion of going about in persona when there was nothing particularly that he needed to do was an excellent one. It would establish her personae and allow him to correct her if need be, at a time and place where breaks in the particular persona would not be dangerous. Better to clear all that up before it could be fatal. Prowling the slums when there was nothing in particular he was watching for could be tedious at times. At least with Karen along it might be less tedious. And having her with him when he changed into one of his varied costumes would also be useful. She could double-check the face paint he wore to cover his scars. 
The stuff was a damned nuisance. It had to be peeled off when he was done with it, and in hot weather it itched. But it was the only way he could keep from being recognized. He'd better warn her about the food and drink in the broken arms, though, before they entered what passed for its door. There were some things even Karen's famously iron stomach could not digest safely. Perhaps I should lure those whom I suspect there and buy them meals. After a single bite, I would have the truth out of them in no time. Selene chased the last of her servants out and closed the door to her bedchamber, even though she hadn't the least intention of going to sleep. It had been a long day, and unfortunately it had also been a very dull one. It had not helped that every moment of it she had been poignantly aware that just outside the palace walls, virtually every creature of court and collegia, with the possible exceptions of the two scamps who'd broken the sal mirror, was taking the time to have some winter fun in the heavy snow. Even the oldest of codgers was out there, standing by one of the braziers, watching the younger folk skate or stage snowball fights. It made her feel very forlorn. It had also made her miss her father very much. Sendar had loved the winter. Had he still been alive, he'd not only have chased her out to play, he'd have contrived a way to join her. At night, during a full moon, he'd have huge bonfires in the gardens and serve ice wine to the skaters. He was always the first one to inaugurate a sled run, and, as he said so often, royal dignity be damned. She bundled up in a fur-lined robe over her nightdress and took a book to the window seat in her bedroom, though she had no intention of reading it. Instead, she rubbed a clear patch through the frost on a window pane with her sleeve and looked out over the gardens. The moon was just up, shining through the branches of the trees as if it had been trapped there. It was just a half-moon, with a little haze around it, and a faint golden cast to its face. Light from other windows in the palace made golden rectangles on the surface of the snow beneath, with the occasional shadow passing across them as she watched. She had retired early tonight, but life in the rest of the palace went on as usual. Even as she watched, she heard a giggle from outside, and a vaguely feminine form bundled up in a cloak and hood ran across the snow, followed by a second, then a third, scudding across the white snow like clouds across the moon. Three of the young ladies of the court, out for a moonlight frolic? Were they meeting young men, or just having some girl fun? slipping out to skate on the frozen ponds by moonlight. Or were they servants, or even trainees? They couldn't be heraldic trainees, for the cloaks had been too dark to be greys, but they could be bardic or healer trainees. Perhaps not healers, who tended to be very serious indeed, and not likely to be out for a moonlit frolic in the snow. But bardic perhaps, or even, well, no, probably not three of the common-born female blues either the ones who got into the Collegia on merit. Those young ladies, fewer than the males by far, tended to be even more serious than the healer trainees, spending their evenings in study, except for taking the rare night off to go to the Compass Rose. Their positions were hard won. Many of them had come here over parental opposition, and they were not going to hazard what they'd gained by frittering it away. Selene sighed, feeling a wistful kinship to that handful of young women. She was in a very similar position, or at least it seemed that way to her. She and they were prisoners to their duty and their responsibilities. Except that they were self-imprisoned. She was bound by blood and rank as well as duty. Surely self-imposed bonds were less galling than ones imposed from the outside. She sighed again, more deeply, and rested her chin in her hand, and wondered what it would be like to be ordinary. That rather depends on what it is that you mean by ordinary, Cario replied. An ordinary herald, for instance. I suppose, she replied, unable to even think of what her life would be like without Cario. You've had some taste of it when you accompanied Harold Mirilin down to the city courts in Haven, Cario reminded her. The real difference between you and the other heralds is that you can never escape being queen— and they can sometimes escape being heralds for a candle mark or two. Exactly. 
Selene was relieved that Cario hadn't started in on a lecture about how she should be grateful, that there were hundreds of young women in her kingdom who had gone to bed hungry and would wake up with no better prospect of breakfast than they'd had of supper, that there were young women who had done extremely unpleasant things in order to get a supper or a bed and would do the same tomorrow. She knew that. Knew that very well, no matter how much Talamir and Alberich tried to shelter her from it. She also knew that there wasn't anything much she could do about it with the limited resources at her behest. She knew that children went to bed hungry and cold, or even curled up in a doorway without a bed at all. She was doing what she could about that, with what she had. The mandatory schooling was a help— as were the queen's bread meals she'd managed to get instituted, so that at least every child had one meal in a day that it could count on. But never mind that now. She was just grateful that Cario understood. Of course I understand. The wild songbird that's had its wings clipped and been clapped in a cage doesn't feel much like trilling, no matter how comfortable the cage is, nor how good the food in its cup. She felt her throat close a little and blinked back the urge to cry. She was tired of weeping, tired of feeling sad and beaten and alone. That was a pretty accurate summing up, and no matter where she looked it seemed that someone around her was trying to install yet another set of bars. She wanted some fun again. She wanted to be irresponsible for just a little while. She wanted to tell the council, the courtiers, the petitioners, to just wait for a candle mark or two while she went skating and sledding. It felt almost as if she was being punished. And not only had she done nothing to deserve being punished, she'd done everything she was supposed to be doing. She didn't remember her father being so hedged about... Wait a moment. She blinked and ran through that thought again. I don't remember father being so hedged about that he couldn't take a candle mark or two. But the counselors would be furious. There were so many things they wanted her to attend to, it often seemed that they even begrudged her the time she took to eat and sleep. Just who is the monarch here, anyway? Me or them? Are people going to die because I take a little time to relax and have some fun? Exactly so, Caryo agreed calmly. It would be one thing entirely if you neglected your duties to spend all of your time in pleasure and games. But since the moment the crown was put on your head, the most you've stolen was a candle mark or two at bedtime to read. But how do I... she began, then stopped, thinking back to her father. All right. Sendar had had the authority to simply stop everything and say, I'm going out for such and such. She didn't. So? I'll have to schedule it, won't I? Better still decree it in such a way that it becomes a duty, in their eyes, to take some pleasure. And as she tried to work out how she could decree a few candle marks to go off skating, Cario added helpfully, There is a cold spell, a very cold spell, on the way. It's already frozen the verges of Evendim out to almost a furlong from the shore. It'll freeze the Terralee solid, and it should last for a fortnight at the least. She blinked. She could barely remember the last time that Terralee had frozen solid, and when it had. I declare an ice festival, she hazarded. Announce there will be one if the Terralee freezes, and make the announcement public, Cario agreed. Your counsellors will be so certain it won't that they'll just smile and ignore the decree. Then when it does, it'll be all over the city, and they won't be able to cancel it. But what does one do? Leave that to the merchants for the most part, Cario said wisely. Once you make the decree, they'll do exactly what they do for a midwinter fair, except that they'll prepare to set the booths and tents up on the ice. And you know, merchants being merchants, if you don't decree a festival, they'll do this anyway. At least by making a royal decision out of it, you can set a time limit on it. All you need to do is send someone to rummage through the attics for some prizes for skating contests and other competitions, and arrange for a royal pavilion out there, with some provisions and cooks for the highborn, and talk to the deans. Perhaps the young bardic trainees could perform gratis. Certainly there should be at least one day off from classes. The more she thought about it, the more excited she became. But what if the ice starts to break? 
Just find some people that know ice to be ice wardens. If it starts to break up, there'll be plenty of warning. Competitions. There ought to be skating races, of course, short and long. Perhaps something for trick skating. A prize for the best ballad on a winter theme. One for the best spiced cider and mulled wine. And hot meat pie, Cario said with a mental shudder. There are so many wretched hot pies. Any encouragement to make them better would be a boon to your people. Ice fishing. There should be a prize for the biggest fish caught ice fishing. One and two horse sledding races. That was just about all she could fit in a single day, she thought with regret. And she wouldn't dare to take more than one day off herself. So have all of the elimination contests before the royal day, Cario advised. That way there will be some real anticipation building up, and you won't have to taste more than five or six final entries in the food and drink contests. Or listen to more than five or six ballads on the subject of winter. And end with a feast and entertainments by moonlight on the ice, with the feasting supplied by the crown, Cario said. Have a royal ball at the pavilion to coincide with the common feast. It will be very romantic. Some of your young ladies have been trying to get their young men to come to the question since you were crowned, and if this doesn't do it, nothing will. She thought of those giggling girls out in the snow and sighed wistfully. The last year of the Tedril Wars had put paid to a great many romances and placed obstacles in the paths of many more. Young men who had survived that last battle had sometimes not the heart for much after what they had been through. She could certainly understand their frustration. Not that she had anyone she wished would come to the question with her. Far from it. No, she wished mostly that for once a courtship didn't consist of her counsel shoving names and portraits at her. It would be so nice to listen to poetry, even bad poetry, about the beauty of her eyes. It would be wonderful to listen to stammered, clumsy compliments in the moonlight, and to pull away from an attempted kiss at the last possible and most coquettish moment. Was it so wrong of her to hanker after romance, to long for a circle of adoring young men who didn't adore the crown rather than the girl? Oh, she knew that most young women of her court went off to arranged marriages rather than romantic ones, but still they usually weren't bartered off to the highest bidder like prize cattle. They usually had some choice in the matter. Well, she had one choice, she supposed. She could always say no. They could badger her and nag her, but they couldn't force her to marry anyone. Think about your festival, Cario advised. You've taken all the steps you need to about the marriage plans. Think about something pleasant. But would Talamir and Alberich approve? They were in charge of her safety, after all. Alberich has already supposed that you were going to do just this, and has been making his own plans, Cario said instantly. Also Cantor tells me. What? Her head came up, like a hound suddenly sniffing something it did not expect on the breeze. But how? Partly knowing you, partly knowing you need some pleasure in your life about now, but mostly I suspect that foresight of his giving him a nudge in the right direction. It doesn't always have to be a disaster that he foresees, and when it isn't, he probably doesn't realize that it's foresight. Well, that made perfect sense to her, and it was comforting, knowing that someone she trusted as much as she trusted Alberich thought this was a good idea. Oh, yes! For the people as much as for you, there's been too much sadness. When you mourn for too long, you start to forget how to feel joy. She bent her head at those words, feeling sadness overcome her again for a moment, and felt Cario sighing with her. That struck to the heart of the matter, and had been something she had not felt comfortable voicing aloud. It had felt somehow disloyal to her father's memory to be weary of weeping for him. And yet... How many tears could she, should she, shed? So Alberich, who had been as loyal to Sendar as anyone could have asked, felt she was ready, and Valdemar was ready, to let go and move on. Perhaps she didn't need to feel guilty then. But Talamir? Roland says that Talamir will have no problem with this. Well, she wouldn't expect Talamir to participate. It would be unkind. 
She wouldn't really need the Queen's own for something like this, just some good bodyguards. Alas, she wished she could have done without those as well. But probably the monarchs of Valdemar hadn't been able to do without bodyguards since, well, for as long as she could think, certainly as long as there had been difficulties with Carsey. So there was one good thing. If she had to have bodyguards, they could at least be people she knew would be able to enjoy the festival with her. Heh, <laughs> Cantor said, just as Alberich was choosing a book to read by his fire before going to bed. I doubt that you're going to be surprised at this. Cario has just told me that Selene has decided to hold that ice festival. He settled down in his favorite chair and adjusted the lamp behind him so that the light fell properly on the page. His window had an interesting look to it, with the light falling on it rather than through it, rather like colored stone set in a mosaic. No doubt the glassmaster had considered this as well when he'd chosen the glass and the colors. He hoped no one would ever take a shot at him from the other side of it. Getting those colors matched would be impossible. He'd probably have to have the whole thing made again. At least it would take less time to craft a new window than that blasted mirror. Good, he said firmly. It will be good for her and good for Haven, but we'll need to slip it past the counselors. So tell Cario to suggest that Selene wait until she's holding public audience— then make a decree tomorrow that if the Terrily freezes solid, there will be the festival. What difference will that make? Cantor asked. Alberich sipped his hot wine. First, the decree will be in public, which will make it more difficult for the councillors to object. Secondly, they'll applaud this in public as being a grand gesture, and think in private that it's about as likely as pigs flying. Then, since the decree will have been posted all over the city— when the river does freeze solid, it will be too late for them to do anything about forbidding any such festivities. He was rather pleased with this. He wanted Selene to have a victory without having to fight for it. The more of those she got, the more her counselors would become accustomed to the idea that she was the queen and was a ruler. Sooner or later she was either going to have to rule in truth or become the mouthpiece for her council, a figurehead but not a leader. The sad part was, he could see even the heralds who were on her council gently maneuvering her into that role, all the while telling themselves that it was for her own good, that she was still too young to take the burden of the crown, that they would just guide her. It was always easier to hold power than to give it up. That was how the Son of the Sun and his strongest priests had come to rule Carsey, and look where that had gotten them. Cantor seemed to be following his thoughts. Good idea. I'll tell Cario. And after a moment, Who do you want for Selene's bodyguards? I doubt she'll be able to take more than a day away from her duties, but she'll need guards when she does. Bodyguards. Someone out there was trying to cause trouble over Selene's rule, and even if he was doing it as a distraction, it was still possible that his words would find fertile ground in some poisoned mind and bear unexpected fruit. Maybe she wasn't in quite as much danger as she had been during the Tedril Wars, but maybe she was. He was in charge of her safety. He could not take the chance. So that meant very good bodyguards all over again. Good question. Who he should assign, assuming that the Collegia would be taking a full set of holidays, the various teachers and their assistants wouldn't be needed up here, but the Royal Guard would, in its full strength both at the palace and at the festival. They would be busy keeping watch over all the highborn. He needed someone watching over Selene and only Selene. Might as well make it Karen and Ilsa for the daylight hours. He gave some more thought to what this festival should involve for lowborn and high as well. I suppose she'll have a feast and entertainment for the highborn in a pavilion on the ice the same evening that she attends the games? Or should I say... There will be two feasts, one for the common folk and one for the court, and I mean all of the highborn, as many as can come at short notice in winter. It would be good for building loyalty. Cantor was taken by surprise by that question. I don't think she'd even considered a court feast for the entire roster of the highborn throughout the kingdom, but it's a good idea, a very good idea. I'll pass it on. 
Alberich felt a certain amusement that he, born poorest of the poor and bastard to boot, should be the one to be making suggestions about what the great and grand would find appropriate. Still, he'd been raised on tales of it after all. Virtually every child had. And he'd been watching this court for years now. A grand feast for the court will help lighten things considerably. Midwinter was shadowed, the first one without Sendar and Selene still in mourning. I don't think anyone had the heart for it. But this won't have any memories, any connotations. It's the sort of thing that ought to make the councillors happy with the whole idea, since they'll be able to haul in all their so-called eligible candidates for her hand, and hope that one of them charms her. He added that last with just a touch of sourness. Sourness because, truth to tell, it annoyed him to see these supposedly sensible men trying to force the poor young woman into a destiny of their choosing. And because they were wasting so much time and effort on the project, time and effort that could be going to some task more useful. If they would put half the concentration they put into working together that they put into finding a mate for the queen, three-quarters of the current difficulties besetting the kingdom would vanish overnight. And for just a little while, it was a relief to think about something other than plots and intrigues. He had never been very comfortable in dealing with plots and intrigues, except for his singular talent of being quiet and unreadable. He was better at it now, but that didn't mean he enjoyed it. Well, except for the occasions when he had an excuse to let off some of his tension by breaking a few heads. Hmm... This festival just might give him a chance at that form of relief. He quickly sealed that thought away from Cantor. She can be impartially charming right back to any would-be suitor without giving any of them hope, Cantor agreed. I wish that more of them were worth being charming to. So do I. The fact that so many potential mates had been systematically disqualified by Selene in public meant that anyone who was dredged up and hauled in for the ice festival was bound to be marginal at best. Unsuitable in the extreme, unless some distant cousin out of the back of beyond happened to get dragged out of his manor, chosen on the spot, and proved to be the man of Selene's dreams, if she even had any dreams on the subject. It was hard for Alberich to tell. Selene's mind was often opaque to him. He didn't have a great deal of experience with young women. Come to that? He didn't have a great deal of experience with women in general. And whatever suitors are hauled in will probably be stone deaf and ninety at worst, Cantor sighed. Poor Selene. It will be a shabby lot of dancing partners she'll be getting. Another aspect that hadn't occurred to him. With things so subdued at midwinter... She hadn't seemed to want any dancing. The Selene he remembered had loved dancing. Well, maybe he could do something about that. I think at an occasion like an ice festival, she ought to dance every other dance with a herald, don't you? He asked Cantor. In fact, isn't there some sort of mandate about that somewhere, so that no highborn can claim two dances with her in an evening? If there is, Misty can find it, Cantor replied, with a chuckle. And if there isn't, Misty can still find it, he replied, thinking with real pleasure of how Misty and Selene together had foiled the entire council plan to get her safely betrothed to someone of their choice. It had been a thing of beauty, according to Misty. He was just glad that he had kept himself out of it, so that when he'd been asked he'd been able to truthfully disclaim any knowledge of it all. Not that he'd wanted to be anywhere near the room at the time the entire thing unfolded, Whenever certain members of the council were thwarted, they always looked at the car site as the source of their troubles. Funny, they suspected his hand behind even this, without his being anywhere near the council chamber that day. They'd entirely overlooked Misty. I'm not entirely certain about all those cross-cousin links Misty was finding. Surely the highborn of Valdemar aren't that closely inbred. Chosen, you don't think Harold Misty would concoct information, do you? Cantor asked, pretending to be aghast at the thought. You're forgetting she was a clerk before she was a herald, he replied. They spend a quarter of their lives writing things down, a quarter finding what other people have written down, a quarter hiding what was written down, and a quarter making sure if it should have been written down and wasn't, it is now. 
Cantor had no real reply for that, but Alberich didn't really expect one. And no, in the case of something important, he really did not think that Misty would stoop to forgery. But in the case of something like this, where nothing was hanging on a little judicious creativity but Selene's all-too-rare pleasure, Misty could and would unbend her rigid ethics in order to ensure that the tradition existed, even if it hadn't been a tradition until a few moments ago when he'd thought of it. Apparently Cantor agreed. Consider it a tradition that's been in place for centuries. You know, Misty is very good at aging documents. Well, she had to be. She had to know how to forge them in order to detect forgeries. And it wasn't as if she'd be doing anything really unethical, like forging the great royal seal. She could just insert it in a list of protocol from the last ice festival, hand it to the seneschal as the guide to how he should conduct the feast at the end, and no one would be the wiser and Selene would get dancing partners that she could relax with. In fact, he'd hand-pick them. Or rather, he'd hand-pick them after consulting with someone who knew which heralds were adequate dancers. Which reminded him of something else. Don't the wretches generally sneak off to some private, heralds-only party as soon as they can, when there is an enormous fate like this one? He demanded, recalling that they had done just such a thing at Selene's coronation. Um... Cantor began with overtones of guilt. Well, not this time. And that is an order, and have Talamir enforce it, he said firmly. Not until Selene is ready to leave. By Vacandus's crown, if she doesn't get to enjoy most of this affair, it'll be no fault of mine. And it won't be for lack of good company, friends among the rest, as well as dancing partners. Yes, sir, Cantor replied, for once with no hint of mockery or irony whatsoever in his mind voice. Hmm. He settled into his book with a feeling of satisfaction, as Cantor and the other companions, and whatever heralds would be involved in the plot, coordinated themselves. Misty, Talamir, the Seneschal's herald, presumably. Those here at the Collegium, who were young enough to make decent conversation with her, good dancers, or both. And he wouldn't have to worry about a herald as a risk to her safety, either. Not that it was likely that anyone would try anything in so great a throng, but... Grand, something else to worry about. What about... Cantor interrupted his pretense at reading. If we concoct another point of protocol, that any final year trainee of appropriate age and gender can serve as the Queen's dance partner. He thought about that for a moment. It would effectively double the number of young faces at the occasion and what was more, they would be people Selene already knew and would feel comfortable around. It wasn't that long ago that she'd been a trainee herself. Perfectly reasonable. While we're at it, throw the doors open for the bards and healers as well. No reason why they can't be included. Every reason why they should be. And bards and healers were just as trustworthy as heralds. With any luck, there would be so many of them that no one else would even get a chance at taking a dance with Selene. He felt Cantor's approval. Good. Bards make better dancers anyway. And once again, he sensed Cantor's withdrawal. He felt himself smiling. There was something to be said for this particular kind and purpose of conspiracy. It made everyone who was involved in it feel good, and it got their minds moving in directions that had been sadly unfamiliar for far too long. Poor Selene had been spending the last six moons, and more, thinking only of the welfare of those around her, and dependent on her. It was about time that they all returned the favor. If Karen and Ilsa are going to be her bodyguards, shouldn't she have an official escort? Cantor said, coming back from wherever he'd been. Good God, another sticking point, another point of vulnerability. Not one of the suitors. Oh, no. That would be opening the door to all sorts of potential trouble and danger. But who? Since this is a festival, what about a bard? He asked, thinking about all the really handsome-looking bards he'd seen in and around the Collegia. Besides, with a bard around, you never lack for conversation. It's their job to be witty. Good idea. Then she can't be accused of favoritism for the heralds but she won't be stuck with one of the suitors. Cantor vanished again, and Alberich was left alone with his book. He might even manage to get a page or two read, 
in between thinking of yet more security holes and coming up with schemes to block them. While she was up here behind her walls, she was secure. But down there, for the gods' sake, out on a solid sheet of ice. But her people love her. Even down there in the worst part of Haven, there was anger when that whore tried to make trouble. He had to take comfort in that. Had to remember that this was not Carsey, and Selene could move among her people without fear. Most of them, anyway. He sighed and put down the book. No point in trying to read now. It was time to start making some lists, or his mind would be buzzing and he'd get no sleep at all this night. When do you sleep? Infrequently. He sighed and fetched a pen and paper. Five. Clear sky of a brilliant, cloudless blue, and it was cold enough to freeze the— well, it was colder than Alberich had ever been without also being wet clear through. It got cold in Carsey, but never quite like this, a dry, biting cold that didn't penetrate so much as stab. He was grateful for the extra pairs of socks he was wearing, as well as for the peculiar contraptions that Karen had cobbled up for everyone at the Collegium, leather straps with five or six tacks in them that you could strap on over your boots to give you traction on the ice. She said that people used them for ice fishing on Lake Evendim. Well, he would take her word for it, because if it was cold enough to freeze that lake this thick every winter, he never wanted to go there. He'd never learned to ice skate, and at this point in his life, he was a bit dubious about the odds of his success if he started, so it was a good thing he had these so-called ice cleats on his feet. They kept him from measuring his length on the slippery river ice more than once. He just wished there was something for sun glare off of ice and snow that made him wear a squint that was beginning to feel permanent. He had his hood up and a hat on top of it to shade his eyes, but that did nothing for the reflected glare. It was also beginning to give him a headache. Still, this ice festival was something to be seen, and worth the cold and the rest of it. He didn't often get out during the day down in Haven in one of his disguises, and for once he wasn't even down here on business. Whoever the jolly lad had been who'd been paying for people to foment dissension over the Queen, evidently getting his hireling arrested had frightened him off. Not a rumor, not a sign, not a breath of trouble had there been since then. Talamir reckoned that the whole scheme had been hatched up to create a distraction at some point, and that the hatcher of said plot had gotten cold feet when his agent had been unmasked. Maybe, maybe not— but thanks to the festival, Selene's star was very high with the common folk, and grumbling was going to get someone's head broken. And that would quickly bring the city guard and constables, which meant that Alberich's job was being done for him, at least in part. So, if this excursion, intended so that Alberich could listen to people talking, spend some time in and around the places where liquor flowed freest and tongues were loosest, wasn't entirely pleasure— it wasn't entirely business, either. As he traveled with the flow of the crowd down the improvised street of booths that had been built on the solid ice of the Terrily, he was covertly watching the reactions of those around him to his current guise. This costume represented more of a middling class of working man, someone who was, unlike many of his personae, not a particularly dangerous fellow, and he wanted to make sure he had the nuances down. The last thing he needed to do was to alert people when what he wanted was for them to be careless and at their ease around him. Normally he would have worn a clever cosmetic paste that covered his scars, but that wouldn't pass muster in the daylight. Fortunately it didn't have to, not when he and almost all of the other people down here had their faces wrapped in scarves against the cold. He was experimenting with false beards and other facial hair, but those didn't stick too well in the cold. That meant a lot of work on his part, moving easily, schooling his eyes and eyebrows into a vacantly pleasant expression. People reacted to the language of body and expression without even realizing that they were doing so. He knew very well how to read those things now. He'd been good as an officer, but now, thanks to no end of schooling, he was very, very good. That instruction had been not only at the hands of his mentor Dathor, but with the help of Jadis— 
who before becoming a herald had been a trainee of Bardic Collegium, where the trainees were taught drama and acting as part of the curriculum. It had taken him years to get to this point, where he was willing to try going about among the middle classes, attempting to be unnoticed. He thought, judging by the way that he was jostled, shoved, and occasionally grumbled at, that he was succeeding. None of his bully-boy personae would have been blundered into like this. The folks of the daylight hours would have taken one look at him and given him a wide berth, assuming they didn't report him to the city guard as a suspicious person. It was too bad he couldn't find a thief, especially a pickpocket, to teach him how to blend in. If there was one person whose very life depended on blending in, it was a petty thief. He'd been on the lookout for those, just to keep his hand in at spotting them, but oddly enough he hadn't seen any. Possibly that was because they were keeping to the nighttime hours in order to work the crowd in more safety. But possibly the issue was that they were no better on the ice than he was. If you had to run for it, well... You couldn't run for it. If I was a petty thief, Cantor observed, I would work the booths on the bank and stick to the night time. A couple of hours past sunset, and it's not only dark enough to make a good getaway, people are a lot drunker than they are now. Glad you aren't out here, Alberich asked. Profoundly. I shudder to think of me on the ice. Karen hasn't yet come up with cleats for us, and neither has the blacksmith managed shoes that will work out there. Cantor did not mention how much he disliked the cold. That was a given. Alberich had taken pity on him and hadn't even ridden him down to the bell today. He'd borrowed an ordinary horse from the palace stables. Alberich snugged the hood down around his ears, adjusted the scarf, and pulled the floppy felt hat down tighter. There was another thing to feel grateful for, and that was the quality of his costume. The good, thick homespun wool with the old-fashioned hood was better than anything that the young bucks were sporting out here, and his clumsy-looking boots had room for three pairs of socks. As he had predicted, the councillors had thought the idea of the river freezing solid enough to hold the ice festival extremely amusing when Selene brought up the idea before them. They ignored it in council, and chuckled as she issued the proclamation in front of the court. Well, the ones that weren't heralds did, anyway. The heralds already knew it was going to happen, but nothing would have convinced the councillors of that. The news got down into Haven, and with a feeling of anticipation, people began making quiet preparations. Then the cold wave rolled in silently at night and everyone woke to find ice in the water jugs on their bedside tables, ice so thick on the glass of windows that you couldn't see out, and down along the river reports that it was frozen over. And all of the townspeople, who had, of course, been certain that anything the Queen made a proclamation about would come to pass, had sent watermen out to test the thickness of the ice daily. It had taken three days until everyone was certain that it was strong enough for the festivities. No one wanted accidents, however much they wanted a holiday. Then, overnight, an entire fair sprang up, with the more timid arraying their tents on the banks, and the boulder setting up right on the ice. Predictably, the merchants on the ice were heavily weighted in favor of hot food and drink stalls, while the ones on the banks featured fairings and other goods. The midwinter fairs, not only in Haven but all around the countryside, had been something of a failure for the weather had been bleak, and no one had had much heart for frivolity. This was going to more than make up for it, if the merchants had any say in the matter. There were stalls doing a brisk business in crude skates, basic wooden blades with simple straps to hold them to the soles of the shoes. They could be made for you right there on the spot and fitted to your shoes or boots. There were several more booths set up to wax or smooth the blades. Then there was a knife grinder who'd set up to sharpen the blades of good steel skates. Those were blacksmith made, of course. No one in the crowd that Alberich was moving in now could afford such things. Those with the money for steel skates who hadn't already gotten a pair were queuing up to get theirs, though, and the blacksmith who'd had blades going a-begging at midwinter was getting double the price for them now. There were two kinds. You could get the ones that strapped on as the wooden skates did— or if you really had money to spare, you could bring the blacksmith a pair of your boots or shoes, and he'd fasten the blades permanently to the soles. Anyone with those, though, was someone dedicated to the sport. 
A kind of protocol had sprung up in the first day of the festival about who got what part of the ice, since there were both skaters and walkers among the booths. Skaters got the middle of the lane, and those who were slipping and staggering about on their own shoes kept to the sides. The lane had been laid out wide enough that there was room for both, though occasionally a skater would go careening into the crowd, and the walkers would curse and try to cuff the skater. Most of the time people took it in good part, and if they saw someone skidding toward them they often did their part to rescue him before he cracked his skull. The contests had begun as soon as the booths were set up. Informal races at first, which soon weeded out those whose bravado exceeded their skill. By the time that the palace had sent down real judges, the would-be competitors had been winnowed down to a manageable number. There had been those whose skill exceeded the limits of their equipment, but Selene had a good plan to take care of that. She'd ordered preliminary races and games among those with the cheap wooden blades only, and the winners of those got steel skates still of the strap-on sort, but made stoutly and of good steel, as prizes. That put the competition on something like a level field when the real contests started. The booths began at the largest bridge across the river, where there were steps built into the banks. The race course began and ended where the booths did, going up river for a set distance, carefully marked on both river banks, then returning. Anyone who cared to come to the bank along the race route could see the races, some enterprising souls along the bank were renting their rooms for the final day of racing, so that people could watch in comparative comfort. Alberich couldn't quite see the point of that. Being crowded up to a window that gave you less of a view than the worst spot on the bank itself? But then from what he was hearing, there would be so much in the way of drinking and carousing going on in those rooms that no one would be paying much attention to the races anyway. Then there were the competitions in trick skating being held in a particularly smooth section. Real seats had been set up there, and there were contests in jumping over barrels, fancy skating in singles and pairs, and sprint racing. When the trick skaters weren't performing or competing, someone had come up with a strange game involving two teams of eight men each, armed with brooms, a ball, and two goals. There didn't seem to be many rules, except that the participants evidently needed to be drunk enough not to care when they fell down or crashed together, but not so drunk they couldn't manage to play. Fights frequently broke out, but no one got seriously hurt as far as Alberich had been able to tell. There were black eyes, a few lost teeth and broken brooms, but no broken bones. Perhaps that was due at least in part to all the padding that the players wore in the way of extra clothing. The games tended to have no set duration, lasting either until everyone was too tired to go on, or the fancy skaters wanted to use the ice again and got the guard to chase the gamers off. Whereupon the gamers would pick up their goals, made of eel traps, and move to rougher ice until the good patch was free again. To Alberich's inexperienced eyes, the game looked something like a game played on ponyback by some of the hill shepherds, who had allegedly got it from the Shinain. There weren't any prizes for the broomball game, so the people playing it were doing so purely for the sheer enjoyment of the mayhem they were engaging in, and perhaps for the hot wine and mulled ale that their supporters brought out for them whenever they took a break. It never failed to amaze Alberich how much effort some people would go to for a free drink. Skating competitions weren't the only ones that had been announced. Ice and snow sculptors had been hard at work, too, with their creations ranged wherever the artist's fancy had chosen to put them, with the traffic left to deal with them. Alberich had never considered ice as a sculptural material before, and he'd never seen anything made of snow other than a child's snowman. But these pieces were quite astonishing, and he thought that it would be a pity when they finally melted. There was one entire snow castle, with blocks of ice for windows, and furniture made of ice and snow, and a clever tavern keeper inside selling ice wine in glasses made of ice. Some people were said to be paying him for the privilege of sleeping on the ice beds, but to Alberich's mind that was going more than a bit too far for novelty. Still the place was pretty at night, with light from colored lanterns making the walls glow from within. Probably the most popular places of all were the warming tents, prudently set on the river bank, where braziers of coals kept the worst of the cold at bay and allowed frozen feet and hands to thaw out. 
Sellers of hot wine and hot pies provided the tents, and the benches inside. The crown supplied the fuel, a gesture of goodwill that was much appreciated, for otherwise it would have cost something to be admitted, so even someone without the penny for a pie could get warmed up. And if you were clever, you brought your own drink in a metal can and your own pies from home to warm at the brazier. The pies themselves were something new to Alberich. Not that he'd never seen them before, but in this cold they served a new and dual purpose. The pie itself served as a hand warmer, in fact. Most people made or bought sturdy offerings with a hard crust that could stand a great deal of abuse, wrapped them in a scrap of cloth as soon as they came right out of the oven, and tucked them into pockets and muffs to act as a heat source until the owner got hungry. By that time, the pie would probably have suffered enough that the owner could gnaw through the tough crust without losing a tooth. And if it had gotten too cold, you could always rewarm the thing without worrying too much about it. Or as one old fellow said to Alberich, With my wife's cooking, a little char improves the flavor. And the pies were as universal as the snow and ice, even for the denizens of the Collegia. If they presented themselves to the Collegia cooks before coming down, the trainees were given pies as well, for the same dual purpose but nothing like the common sort, which could have stood duty as paving stones. Alberich had one in each pocket right now, as a matter of fact, providing a comforting source of heat for both hands. You know, that might be another reason why there are so few pickpockets, Cantor said. Your purse is somewhere inside your coat or your cloak and hard to get at. Your pockets are full of pies of a dubious nature. Besides testing his disguise, a matter of curiosity had brought Alberich down here today. The dean of Bardic Collegium had intercepted him yesterday to tell him that she thought she knew where the two mirror-breakers had gotten their mad ideas for gymnastic fighting. Her information had brought him down to the booths at the bridge-end where, as part of the festival, a troop of players had set up a tent to display their talent. There weren't many of those— it was, to be honest, too cold for anything but unaccompanied singers to be performing out of doors. And as for the sort of acrobats and dancers that plied their trade at fairs, they'd be risking their skins to bounce about in their usual skimpy attire. This set of players, however, usually performed several times in a week at one of the bigger inns off the trade road. They'd moved to this venue just for the festival and as Alberich neared the canvas walls that held their makeshift theater, he saw that the move must have been very profitable for them. He joined the end of a longish line just forming up for the afternoon performance with some interest. Well, tent was something of a misnomer, he discovered, as he got to the entrance, paid his entry fee, and filed inside with the rest. Only the area over the back half of the stage was roofed over and curtained. The rest was simply canvas walls to prevent the show from being viewed by those who had not paid, with an overhead scaffolding of rigging for stage effects and nighttime lighting reaching out into the area of the audience. Crude benches in rows fronting the stage were supplied to the public, and the show must have been popular, for the tent was half full when Alberich arrived, and by the time of the show the benches were packed, and so was the standing room area along the walls. The drama was called or so the banners outside proclaimed, the unknown heir. The banners could have fit any one of a hundred standard stories, and probably served for every play these actors ever put on. They looked superficially new, but Alberich could tell that they'd been freshly touched up just for the festival. The audience was ready to be entertained, and when the back curtains finally parted and a single actor took the stage, they erupted in cheers that must have gladdened his heart. Alberich sat back on his bench, arms folded under his cloak, and prepared to see just what it was that had corrupted two trainees. First came the declamation of the prologue. The plot, what there was of it, concerned a highborn child, stolen from his cradle and sold to slavers, subsequently bought or rescued, the prologue was rather unclear on the subject, by a troop of poor but noble actors and raised by them to adulthood. All of this was laid out in a spirited fashion by that single actor before any of the real action took place. Alberich had to admit that the fellow knew what he was doing. He had the right mix of flamboyance and humor to keep the audience's attention. He finished his piece, gave an elaborate bow, and retired to great applause. Then the curtains parted on 
a sylvan glade, represented by two rather sad little trees in pots, and a painted backdrop against which marched the troop, portraying the actors on their way from one town to the next. The real action opened immediately with the unknown heir and his adoptive family being attacked by bandits, and the heir proceeding to single-handedly, acrobatically, drive the bandits off. But not before the bandits had managed to mortally wound the heir's adoptive father, though how they got a knife blade through the four or five layers of costume he was wearing was beyond Alberich's comprehension. This worthy managed an amazingly long set-piece while dying in his son's arms. He explained the young man's circumstances, presumed high-born heritage, and handed over the medallion the child had inexplicably still been wearing, even though it was solid gold, when taken from the hands of his kidnappers. It was an astonishing monologue, especially from the lips of someone stabbed through the heart quite some time ago. None of this evidently stretched the credulity of most of the audience. With tears and histrionics, the heir proclaimed that he would regain his rightful place and wreak revenge for his father's death. Riotous applause called up many bows from the actors before the action resumed. The rest of the play consisted of one improbable fight scene after another, taking advantage of the acrobatic abilities of, Alberich guessed, roughly four of the actors in question and there was no doubt in his mind before the first act was over that this was indeed where the two miscreants had gotten their misguided ideas, and given the wild applause that these bizarre fights managed to garner, he was a lot less surprised that the boys had become enamored of the idea of fighting like that. As the heir and his best friend, both in love with the same girl, of course, battled their way through throngs of evil henchmen attempting to keep them from claiming the heir's rightful place as the Duke of Dorking. Alberich had to admire their stamina, if not their style. In the conclusion to the first act, the heir plummeted off the top of a cliff to flatten half a dozen evildoers, then engaged four at once, sword to sword, and after being disarmed, defeated his enemies with a bucket. In the second act, the heir and the friend— ambushed in a peasant hovel, made the most creative use of a ladder, a table, and a stool that Alberich had ever seen. In fact, what they most closely resembled was not a pair of fighters at all, but a pair of ferrets trying not to be caught. In the third act, the best friend met the end that Alberich had expected from the first, after yet another acrobatic exhibition, dying in the arms of the air and bravely commending the air and the girl to one another with the air vowing revenge once again. You know, Cantor commented, I'd steer clear of that man. People trying to kill him seemed to keep missing and hitting his friends instead. But it was in the fourth act that something entirely unexpected happened, and it had nothing to do with the script. Now Alberich had noticed something a bit odd just before the play began. In the front benches just off to one side was a group of young men in clothing far finer than anyone else here was wearing. When the action started, he quite expected them to begin jeering and catcalling, but to his surprise they did nothing of the sort. In fact, they were quiet and attentive to a degree all out of keeping with the quality of the drama unfolding, and it wasn't as if they weren't used to better fare either. He recognized two of them from having seen them moving in the fringes of Selene's court. Now that was odd. So odd, in fact, that he felt a tingle of warning and kept his eye on them all during the play. Then came the fourth act, and the grand climax and exhibition of sword play with astonishing feats of strength and skill never before seen on any stage, which was laid in the grand hall of the Duke of Dorking's castle. The heir's enemies held both the heir's real parents and his true love captive, and were engaging in a spot of gloating and the air swung in over the heads of the front of the audience on a rope. Alberich had to give them credit. It was a spectacular entrance. Not a very bright one for a real fighter, since while the air was swinging about on a rope, he was an easy target for anyone with a knife, crossbow, spear, or lance, all of which were in evidence among his enemies. But it was a spectacular entrance. The air let go the rope, did a triple somersault in the air, hit the stage and came up fighting. No mistaking that move, which was one the boys had tried, in vain, to copy.
The actor might be a phony fighter, but he was a superb athlete and tumbler. There was more of the same wildly unrealistic combat, and Alberich noted in passing that the actor who had been playing the best friend was now, with the assistance of a beard, playing the chief villain. And then, then came the break with everything Alberich had expected. If he hadn't been watching so closely, and watching the audience in particular, his lot of young nobles, he might have thought it an accident. But in the middle of the duel with the chief villain, a prop sword went clattering across the stage right under the lead actor's feet. He apparently stepped on it, because the next thing that happened was that his right foot shot out from under him, he staggered and tried to catch his balance, and then he went blundering right over the edge of the stage and down onto the audience in the first row, landing atop the same young highborn that Alberich had noticed, to the gasps and shrieks of the crowd. But all was not as it seemed. The thing was, someone as good a tumbler as that actor was shouldn't have gone off the edge of the stage at all. What was more, he hadn't stepped on or tripped over the sword. No, as Alberich saw, just before he surged to his feet along with the rest of the audience, the actor had actually kicked it off to the side before making that spectacular fall. Furthermore, the young men he'd landed among had been tensed and ready to catch him. If he'd really fallen by accident, they'd have scattered instinctively away from his path, not gathered under him, broken his fall, and set him down. He was up in a trice, as the audience applauded, bowing to them, apologizing to his victims, even brushing one of them off, which was when Alberich distinctly saw a folded set of papers pass from the actor to the young highborn man, vanishing inside the latter's cloak before he could blink. Great gods! Cantor exclaimed, as Alberich struggled to keep his expression precisely like that of everyone else around him. What in the nine hells? I don't know, Alberich said, as the actor got back up on the stage and resumed the play. But I'm going to find out. And I do not know who it was, Alberich told Talamir, feet stretched out toward the fire in Talamir's somewhat austere chamber. He had come here directly from the festival so directly that he hadn't even had a chance to properly thaw out, though he had stopped long enough to change out of his disguise at the bell. But Cantor had warned Roland that Alberich needed to speak to Talamir, who had in his turn informed Talamir that Alberich was coming and was in serious need of defrosting. And Talamir had arranged for hot drinks and a well-stoked fire as well as getting free long enough for this quick meeting. A young man you've seen in the court? No one you clearly recognized. Talamir frowned. I wish the young people were a little more distinctive, or at least wore the same badges they put on their retainer's livery. Your description doesn't resonate with me either. Alberich shrugged. That being the case, until I discover, I'm going to have to spend more time around the court than it is usual. Most probably it is you who shall have to identify him for me, once his face I see. I can do that certainly, but what do you suppose was the meaning of this? Talamir asked, leaning over to refill Alberich's tankard. Alberich shifted a little and shrugged. What it probably wasn't, much more easily can I say than what it was, Alberich replied, absently taking another drink and half emptying the tankard again. Not an assignation, do I think. Better ways there are of passing love notes than the midst of a play. Not contraband of the usual sort. Papers, these were, nothing more. Unless the contraband is too large to hand off, and the papers were directions telling where it was, Talamir observed. It could be something less than legal. Stolen goods, perhaps, a valuable horse, or perhaps money to pay for it. Only papers, Alberich countered. And what would the purpose be of the poorer actor paying the highborn rather than the reverse? He shook his head. No and I think not the papers were directions to something stolen, which leaves information. Paid for by the highborn, gotten by the actor. So why the exchange in the midst of the play? Because our highborn fellow does not want to be seen making clandestine visits to a mere player. Talamir seemed very certain of that point. Someone like that would never come up the hill or be allowed even in the gates of one of the manors. Let me tell you, there is nothing more certain about the great houses than access to them. 
Surely as an actor, easy would it be to feign to be the servant, Alberich hazarded. Again Talamir shook his head. Every servant in a great house will either have worked for the family for generations, have come from the family's country property, or have been personally vouched for by other servants. Every delivery person will be from a particular set of shops and will be known to the servants. Even the folk who come to take off the trash are personally known to the servants. What the highborn discard is picked over by dozens of lower servants before it gets to the bins outside. And then the right to cart off what is left is jealously guarded. Hmm. Alberich blinked. He hadn't known that. Well, so much forever trying to insinuate himself into a great house as a servant. And the boy could not come to the actor in a more secret way? Ha! Talamir raised an eyebrow. Not where they are, and people take note when they see someone richly dressed hanging about a common venue. No matter how careful he was, someone would see him. Unless, of course, he was as practiced in deception as you are, which is highly unlikely. And the resources have as well, Alberich reminded the older herald. Without the bell, my movements could not possible be. Talamir's lips formed into a thin line. The question is, what information? Why, and to whom is it going? And does the crown have interest? Alberich added. It could be we need do nothing about it. It could be this is only to do with the rivalries among the titled. Talamir looked thoughtful as Alberich put the empty tankard aside on a little table that stood between their chairs. It could be, I suppose, he admitted. But it seems a great deal of trouble to go to simply to acquire information about a rival. And why the connection with a troop of common players? He shook his head. No, I don't like it. I sent something else here. Alberich was willing to bow to his experience. So you think it is something surely to do with a larger issue? Still, it could signify only that someone has an interest and is not hostile. Or not. The Carsites are not our only enemies. Talamir looked pensive. Or it could be agents of a putative ally who wishes to learn more than we've told him, in which case we need to establish if there is any harm in letting him continue to operate. Alberich snorted at that. Allies can cause as much harm as enemies, and are less suspected. Hmm. There are times, my suspicious friend, when I am glad that you are who and what you are. Talamir replied after a long silence. That had not occurred to me. Alberich shrugged. I am what I am, he replied. In Carsey one keeps one's friends close, and one's enemies closer. And in Carsey suspicion is no bad thing. Talamir pinched the bridge of his nose and closed his eyes in a grimace. Let us start with the obvious. You might as well add yourself to Selene's bodyguards tomorrow. The entire court will be down at the festival, and I've no doubt that your mysterious young man will be in the midst of the throng. You'll have your best chance to spot him then, and I can identify him for you. That was a shortened version of, You'll show him to Cantor, who'll pass the image to Roland, who'll show it to me and I'll put a name to him. Alberich nodded. But he wasn't happy. Hoped I had, the crush to avoid, he sighed. He still wasn't comfortable rubbing elbows with the titled, even when he was playing so invisible a part as that of a bodyguard. Well, you can't, Talamir retorted, with an unusual level of assertion. I won't be around forever, and it is well past the time when you began taking up the duty of spy within the court as well as down in Haven. If anything, that made Alberich even more uncomfortable, because no matter what he did, he couldn't take Talamir's place within the circles of the court. For one thing, even if he'd been Valdemarin, he wouldn't fit. For another, no one was ever likely to confide anything in him. He just didn't have the face for it. But he held his peace. There were more ways of undoing a knot than splitting it with an axe. There were heralds permanently assigned to the collegium who might serve as his eyes and ears among the highborn, especially the women. Ilsa, perhaps. And there were trainees coming up who were highborn themselves who might be trusted to play clandestine agent. My best I will ever do, 
was all he said, and he and the Queen's own got down to the business of trying to find other ways for Alberich to set eyes on the young man in question again. Just in case, against all probability, he did not show his face at the festival. Because in Alberich's experience, the thing that you planned for always turned out to be the one that was least likely to happen. And the one that you had never thought of was the one that landed in your lap. 6. Selene's day at her festival dawned cloudless, bright, and bone-chillingly cold. Alberich and the others had planned on foregoing formal whites for the sake of warmth, but the ever-resourceful seamstresses had provided the entire escort with heavy woolen capes lined and trimmed with white fur, white fur mittens, fur inside and out, and heavy stockings trimmed at the top with fur, which would make the boots look as if they had been lined and trimmed with fur. As a result, they all looked smartly turned out and entirely festive. When they had all arrived to escort Selene down to the river, one wag suggested that they ought to have their capes festooned with the same bridal bells as were on the companion's parade tack, a suggestion which had earned him a handful of snow down his back. After that he kept his thoughts on costume to himself. This made quite a little parade going through town— Fortunately, no one had thought it necessary to make a real procession out of it, though people were lining the streets, waving and cheering the whole way. "'I think your people love you, Your Highness,' said one of Lord Orthalan's hangers-on, patently hoping to curry favor, for he still had his mouth open to continue with a compliment when Selene laughed. "'I think they love the Queen's bread they're getting today, and the feast I've arranged for tonight.' she replied, and Alberich smothered a smile. For this, the final official day of the festival, although people would probably stretch things out for as long as the ice held, she'd arranged for bread to be distributed in the morning until the supplies ran out, and meat, wine, and bread for the same time as the court feast this evening. If the fountains weren't running with wine instead of water, it was because it was too cold— Instead, there would be hot wine available in huge cauldrons along the bank, alongside fires where various beasts were roasting on spits, and more of the bread that had been baked well in advance and stored cold. Although the notion of whole roasted oxen was a romantic one, for practicality's sake, what was going to be offered was just about any beast that could be spitted and roasted and would provide enough meat to satisfy a portion of the crowd. There were quite a few sheep, for instance, and a great many pigs, domestic and wild. Selene had been as generous as her purse would allow. If anyone had seen these creatures alive, he would have been well aware that they were all, well, not exactly prime. Most of them had come from the royal farms and were past breeding or working age. Still, they'd been well tended all their lives, and if they were going to provide somewhat tough eating, well, as one old man once told Alberich, for by, much chewin' makes it last the longer, and tough be tasty. Most of the people who would be swarming the fires didn't taste meat more than a few times in a year, and it was almost never anything like beef or mutton. And as for those who could afford better, well, they could take their purses and go buy it. In fact, the fires were already being set up for the cauldrons, and the carcasses turning over their flames when they arrived at the river. It occurred to Alberich, as the scent of roasting meat filled the air, that the food merchants were not going to do badly out of this after all. The meat wouldn't be ready for hours, but people would be hungrier with the scent of it in their noses. For all that he disliked the crush, the sidelong glances, the discomfort of his position as Selene's shadow, Alberich could not begrudge the queen a single moment of her day of relative freedom. All he had to do was to catch a glimpse of her face to know that she was enjoying herself for the first time in, well, in far too long. She was smiling a great deal, even laughing, and there was a glow on her that made her look more alive than she had in months. It didn't take a mind healer to know why, either. This day at her ice festival was perhaps the only time she had spent since her father's death that wasn't shadowed with memories. Sendar had never presided over such an occasion. Guided only by old chronicles, her friends, and her own imagination, this was something that Selene had created for herself. It had taken Alberich a little aback to see her smiling. 
with special nail-studded shoes to give traction on the ice, for the blacksmith had finally come up with something that worked as well as the ice cleats. The queen, her escort of heralds, and their companions came down onto the rock-hard river, just about a candle mark after dawn, to view the ice sculptures. When a winner had been chosen and rewarded, she went on to watch the children's races and present medallions, money, and skates to the winners. Alberich enjoyed that. The children were enthusiastic and excited without turning it into the cutthroat competition he'd seen watching the preliminary races of the adults. The losers were disappointed, but consoled by the sweet cakes Selene passed out to all the competitors, and the winners so bursting with joy that they could hardly contain themselves. By mid-morning she was ready to taste the three finalists in the meat pie, the mulled ale, the spiced cider, and the hot and ice wine competitions. Then, fortified, she returned to the exhibition area for the fancy skating. By this time Alberich was both cold and frustrated, for he hadn't yet seen the young, high-born fellow he'd been hoping to identify. When Selene retired to the royal pavilion set up on the ice for a hot meal and a chance to catch her breath, he left her in the guard of Karen and Ilsa and went prowling. Selene never had her noon meal in the presence of her court. By the time she had a chance for that respite, she was generally sick to death of most of them, and wanted nothing more than a little privacy to go along with her food. She wasn't going to change that habit now, so Alberich had a good candle mark to roam about the royal enclosure to see what, if anything, could be seen. There wasn't much. Just a few of the younger set, who were already sport-mad, and some of the older ones, who never missed a chance to hover in the presence of royalty— and had done so even in Sendar's time. Alberich decided that he would have the best luck if he sidled in near the former and tried to eavesdrop on their conversation, so he got a skewer of basted meat from one of the cooks serving up food al fresco and stood just behind a likely pair, slowly eating and staring off at nothing in particular, doing his best to be ignored. Joe Castel may think he's clever taking the whole house for the day, one of them sniffed but they shan't see anything but the middle of the races. Well, none of them will, except for Redrick. He took that warehouse. The other nodded at a warehouse on the opposite bank, whose docks were festooned with greenery, and a few pouting girls wrapped up to the eyes in expensive furs. Oh, yes. Well, trust him. That entire set is gambling mad. They'll be there all day. And so will Joe Castles, and I doubt that any of them will be watching even in the middle of the races. A knowing tone crept into the young man's voice. Redrick may have snared most of the ladies, but Jocastle got the keys to his father's wine cellar. The first one snorted. Idiots, the lot of them. You can guzzle wine any time, but when is there likely to be another ice festival in our lifetimes? The last one was over fifty years ago, and every champion skater who could get here in time is going to be in the races today. Listen, the big races will begin as soon as the Queen comes back out. I'm for hunting down one of those broomball tournaments I've heard of. The Terrily might thaw, but the pond up at the old pile will hold for months yet, and I've a mind to get a bunch of the lads together and try the game out for ourselves. Oh, now there's a plan, enthused the second, and both of them moved away, gesturing at each other. Well, that explained why there was no one here to speak of. A gambling party in a warehouse, a drinking party in a rented house— and that pretty much accounted for most of the youngsters of the court. Alberich wandered over to the vicinity of a quintet of older men, who were glaring at the young ladies on the dock with disapproval and muttering at each other. What are their fathers thinking? grumbled one, just as Alberich got within earshot. The idea! Going off to some rented hovel unescorted. Oh, it isn't the daylight hours that I would be concerned about, said another sourly. But who's to say what's going to happen when the feast is going on, and some of them slip off unsupervised? Alberich eavesdropped shamelessly a little more, learning only that most of the younger sets weren't even planning to come down to the royal enclosure until the sun set. The older courtiers would be trickling in during the late afternoon, but they weren't the ones Alberich was concerned with. He returned the skewer to the care of the cooks, and drifted back to Selene's royal pavilion, feeling heartily annoyed at humankind in general, and that feckless lot of highborn in particular. Hang it all, 
Why couldn't all those eager parents insist that the young men come down here to dance attendance on the young and eligible queen? Why were they allowing their offspring to gamble and drink away the afternoon without even trying to steal moments of Selene's time? What were they thinking? They're probably thinking that if Selene hasn't indicated her interest in any of them by now, there's no point in freezing their manhoods off to try to impress her today, Cantor observed dispassionately. Hmm. Alberich nodded to the guards at the entrance and pulled back the door flap, feeling entirely disgruntled. Then there's no damned point in my being here now. The royal pavilion had been set up with a kind of antechamber to keep out the coldest air. He parted a second set of door flaps just inside the first. Yes, there is. It will get everyone used to seeing you playing bodyguard, so that no one will think twice about it tonight, Cantor retorted. It wasn't much warmer inside, but at least there were carpets laid over the ice, and braziers of coals on sheets of slate atop them that provided little pockets of warmth. The light in here was a lot more restful than out on the frozen river, too. The pitiless sunlight glowed through the painted canvas, rather like the light coming in through his precious colored window. And it was out of the wind. Albrich! Selene called from amid a heap of furs and cushions piled on a high back settle that had been brought down from the palace, her cheeks glowing, her eyes sparkling. What's to do between now and the feast? More races, he replied. The really serious ones. All the champion skaters that could get here in time are going to be competing. Out there will be some intense rivalry. The prizes for the adult races are considerable and to claim one bragging rights will bestow for a decade. Really? She looked entirely pleased. How exciting! Have we referees along the course? Absolutely, Karen replied, before Alberich could answer. Not only is there the prospect that someone is likely to cheat, there's the fact that if someone goes down there might be a fight over it. He'll probably claim he was fouled, and he might take a part of the field with him. We have this sort of thing every midwinter where I'm from. And there is, I hear, much gambling over the outcome, Alberich added. So, more incentive there is to cheat. And if someone's accused of cheating? Selene looked from Karen to Alberich and back again. What do I do? Whoever is accused will deny it, no doubt. Depends on how and where in the race, and if a referee saw it, Karen said judiciously. Let the referee handle it. Unless enough people got taken down, then, if you're inclined, you can have them run the race over again. Presumably everyone would be equally tired, so they'd all be on the same footing. If I were a betting person, I'd lay odds you'll have to rerun at least one race this afternoon. This is going to be the climax of the festival for a lot of people. Not even the feast is going to eclipse it. Feelings will be running high. Which is why I have plenty of the guards stationed on the course and off it, Selene replied, nodding. The Seneschal warned me about that, after he watched the semi-finals. You won't be able to jail everyone who starts a fight, Karen began dubiously. Selene laughed. And we won't try. Instead, anybody who gets out of hand is going to find himself hauling wood and chopping wood for the spits and the cauldrons. Karen laughed, too. Good enough. Work the energy out of a hothead and leave him too tired to fight. That was the plan, the queen agreed, looking pleased with herself. So, besides the races, is there anything else for me this afternoon? Only a skating pageant, Alberich replied, having seen the preparations going on for the thing nearly every day since the festival began. Like a street pageant. Only instead of you riding along the street and stopping at every display, you'll be the one sitting, and the groups doing the displays will pass in front of you, stop and make their presentations. Karen said helpfully. Selene made a face. I suppose, she sighed, that everyone would be very disappointed if I didn't watch the whole thing. Alberich didn't blame her. There were only so many badly rhymed peons to one's beauty and goodness, sung by shrill and slightly out-of-tune children's choirs, that a sensible person could stand. Very! said the seneschal, who had just entered the pavilion himself in his finest voice. "'Can I watch it on Cario instead of in the grandstand?' she asked hopefully. "'It's warmer on Cario.' 
but the purpose of the pageant is as much for you to be seen as for you to view the presentations, the seneschal pointed out, in a tone that made it very clear that Selene would not be watching the affair from her saddle. She sighed. I hope you have lots of these furs, she said. The races were just as exciting as Karen had predicted, and a great deal more dangerous for the participants than Alberich had anticipated. In fine, the contestants were no longer holding back at all to save something for the climax. This was the climax, and every one of them was determined to go home bearing the champion's medal. The putative honor of entire villages depended on the results, at least for the next year or so, and the skaters were in competition not only for themselves but for all of their backers. They wore a lot less for the actual racing than Alberich would have thought wise, but then moving at the speeds these folks did, perhaps they burned up so much energy they simply didn't feel the cold once they got moving. Or maybe their exertions kept them warm. Whichever it was, when it came time to form up along the starting line, they all left off coats and cloaks, keeping only thin knitted woolen trues bound closely to their calves, and thin sleeved knitted woolen tunics, with scarves wrapped close around face and mouth, and knitted hats and gloves. They all looked somber, focused, and purposeful. By this point, anyone left in competition had steel blades on their feet, and they were wickedly sharp, too. It was when he was looking at those blades glinting as the skaters warmed up before the first race that Alberich suddenly realized that the races could be dangerous as well as competitive. These folk were wearing knives on their feet, and if they went down in a heap, well, they must know that. Presumably they would take care if they did go down, or at least as much care as could be taken. The idea just made him shake his head, though. He couldn't imagine taking the chance of getting a leg or arm slashed to the bone for the sake of a race. Interestingly enough, it was the longest of the races that started first, because by the time this race of several leagues ended, the shorter races would be long over. They called it simply the Long Race, and those who competed in it were specialized skaters indeed, and would not take part in any other race today. It was a lonely sort of race, far, far down the river and back again, a test of endurance as well as speed, and the organizers had supplied each of the volunteer referees stationed along the route with a fire, blankets, and restoratives, so that they could go to the rescue of any racer who failed. That race began with a preliminary scramble, but as the skaters passed out of sight beyond a bend in the river, it was clear that the pack had quickly sorted itself out, and the race turned into an orderly skate, in which each man would play out a strategy that he had predetermined for himself. Then the fast races began. First the sprints, which were very fast indeed, and just as contentious as Karen had promised. There were falls, and the predicted fights among both skaters and spectators, and some sorting out by the guard. Selene declared that two races would be rerun. Then came the longer races, which was where Alberich got a good look at the sort of pace that could rival that of a companion at full gallop. The skaters bent low over their feet, with their hands clasped behind their backs, making strong, sure, gliding strokes that were most like the oar strokes of men in skulls. Only at the beginning and at the end did any real fight for position take place, although there were some minor exchanges back in the pack. It was fascinating to watch, and the slightest mishap could change everything. More than once a bit of bad ice caused a fumble that could drop a skater one or more places, and once a fall took out the entire back half of the pack, with the resultant scrambling that meant there was no chance that any of them could fight for one of the top positions. The dock at that warehouse was full of people the entire time, and high-born though they might have been, they were shouting, gesticulating, and jumping up and down, just as much as any of the commoners on the banks, until all but one of the races was over. And the crowd settled down to wait, eyes straining to the bend in the river, ears cocked for the first sounds of approaching blades. Then, at long last, the first of the exhausted endurance skaters hove into view. That is, Alberich assumed they were exhausted, though the ones in the lead showed no signs of it, just gliding on with long, sure strokes, swinging their arms for added momentum, looking neither to the left nor the right. 
The crowd bellowed encouragement, and in the last few furlongs the final bits of strategy played out, and a skater who had been steadily in third place, hanging so close to the man in front of him that it looked as if they were bound together with a rope, suddenly pulled away. As people screamed and shouted, he put on a final burst of energy. He passed the man in second place. The man in first heard the shouts and made the mistake of looking behind him, faltering for just a moment. That was just enough. The fellow behind him somehow found the strength to surge ahead. And he crossed the finish line with scarcely the length of his forearm ahead of the man he had just passed. The crowd went mad and flooded toward the skaters, screaming wildly, while the rest of the skaters staggered over the finish line. Only then did exhaustion hit the skaters, as friends swarmed the ice with blankets and cloaks and legs gave out, sometimes with breathless cries of pain. Alberich found himself shouting and screaming along with the rest. There was a brief period for the skaters to recover. Then, wrapped warmly in their cloaks again, there came the moment of their glory, when Selene rewarded the first three finishers with medals, purses, and pairs of the finest skating blades made. It was at that point that, much to his shock, Alberich realized that he had screamed himself hoarse. The skaters were all taken away to recover, and Selene and her bodyguards settled into the reviewing stand, her ladies around her, and Alberich under the stand to ensure nothing could get to her from that point. Then came the pageant, and Selene sat in the reviewing stand, patient as a statue, with a foot warmer under her boots and a hand warmer tucked into a muff someone had brought for her, smiling while her servants showered the participants with sweets and small coins by way of reward. Alberich felt sorry for her. She was musical by nature, and the kind of cold they were experiencing did not do good things to instruments. Nor did all the screaming that the singers had been doing during the races help the quality of their voices. Yet when the afternoon wound to a close, and the sun sank over the river, lending everything a tinge of red, he thought that Selene looked as if she would have gladly sat through another three or four pageants, rather than see the day come to an end. But of course it hadn't. Not yet. As the horns sounded to signal that the common folk could begin queuing up to the roasting beasts and simmering cauldrons, Selene retired once again to the royal pavilion to exchange her clothing for a gown created for this particular event. A floor of wood had been laid over the ice, and a special tent pitched over it. Tapestries and hangings brought down from the palace to hang against the walls of the tent provided further insulation from the punishing cold. While it would not be warm within the canvas walls, it would not be nearly as cold as it was outside. Outside there was music, and a peculiar and very attractive kind of ice dancing, skaters carrying torches either in round dances or following one another in a close file through intricate figures that were made up on the spur of the moment by the skater in the lead. Inside there was also music, and fires in fire pits, and candles and oil lamps, wherever it was safe to put them. Outside the common folk feasted on meat and bread and well-watered wine drunk hot. Inside? Inside it would be another court feast like so many others, the only novelty being the cold. Alberich waited on guard just inside the main entrance to the royal pavilion until the queen appeared, newly attired and ready for her feast. When she emerged, he saw that Selene's gown, white, of course, was of heavy quilted velvet, with a fur-lined surcoat and a heavy gold belt at her hips. Her hair was surmounted by a fur hat rather than her crown, with one of the great cloak brooches of the royal regalia pinned to the front of it, a great blazing diamond surrounded by lesser diamonds, and instead of slippers she wore boots. Most of the garments would be like that tonight, he thought and the wind would shake the canvas walls, reminding all the courtiers present that although they might mock winter by holding their feast on the ice, the winter could take them if it chose. Still, when Selene emerged from the back of the pavilion, she was still smiling, and Alberich thought that she looked both charmingly young and utterly regal. He took her arm himself and led her out into the torch-lit darkness. He brought her over the treacherous ice as far as the door to the feasting tent, where her official escort took over. 
He found himself a little reluctant to let her go. But that could have been because of the man she had chosen to partner her at the feast. Her official escort for the feast was Lord Ortholan, who had had his tailor copy Selene's garb in a lush and warming golden brown. He looked extremely handsome, and the surcoat, his ending at his calves rather than trailing behind in a train as Selene's did, suited him very well. To Alberich's mind, he looked rather smug as well. Hmm, Cantor commented. He does, doesn't he? One wonders why. Well, it could only be because Selene was showing him such preference tonight. Alberich hoped so. Fortunately, Ortholan was safely wedded, and there was no way that he could divorce his faithful, fruitful, and obedient wife without a major scandal. So there was no way that he could imagine this sign of preference to be anything but Selene's choice to honor her uncle, Ortholan, in what was essentially a meaningless gesture. Meanwhile, he had a job to perform, and he set about doing it, following immediately behind the pair as they walked up the aisle between the rows of lower tables. The two heralds he'd chosen to play bodyguard at the high table were already waiting there, flanked by royal guardsmen in their blue formal uniforms. He and the other two heralds he'd picked as bodyguards for tonight, Alton and Shanate, had taken the precaution of purloining some dinner from the cooks before the feast began, just as the guardsmen had. So they were able to keep their minds on the surroundings and not the food. Not that there was even the slightest hint of trouble. Just a great many excited, animated people, who were showing clearly with their high spirits that this entire festival had been a very good idea. No one looked at this high table with that shadowed glance of regret. The very different setting kept any memories of Sendar's high feasts from intruding. So did the food though not as much as the setting. There were some novelties, which was only to be expected. A soup served iced rather than hot, many small ice sculptures on the tables, and clever combinations of chilled food seasoned with hot spices. There were sherbets and shaved ice with fruit and syrup spooned over the top, something that would not have survived more than a moment in the heated great hall. There were other concoctions that were actually doused in liquor and set afire, that made a fine show as well, though those made Alberich more than a little wary until they'd been doused. With Ortholan on Selene's right and Talamir on her left, unfortunately Selene could not have gotten much novelty in conversation. Well, she couldn't have everything, and she did appear to be enjoying herself. On the whole, Alberich thought about halfway through. He and his fellow bodyguards had gotten the better part of the meal— by the time the stuff got to the table, with the exception of dishes served flaming, quite a bit of it was lukewarm at best. He scanned the tables for his suspect, but the full court wasn't here. It wouldn't have been possible to serve them all under these conditions for one thing, so those at the table were the most important members of the most important families, and his young highborn wasn't among them. Alberich stifled his disappointment. The time to really look for the elusive fellow was coming. Finally, the last subtlety was served and eaten. Selene and her escort parted company with smiles, and everyone cleared back to huddle around the fire pits and braziers to let the servants swarm over the place and clear out all of the tables and most of the benches, setting some against the tapestries so that those who were not dancing would have a place to sit. Now the evening could really begin. And now people literally poured into the grand tent. The royal pavilion was even now being laid out with refreshments to save room here, for this was where the dancing was to be held. The small dais where the high table had stood now held a single proper seat, Selene's portable throne, which she took as soon as it had been set up. The musicians, teachers at Bardic Collegium All, sat near her on stools, where she could give them instructions she might have on what sorts of dances to play. The musicians carefully tuned their instruments, and at a nod from Selene the first notes cut across the milling crowd. Those courtiers who did not care to dance cleared away to the side, the rest, including most of the younger ones taking the floor, forming up into four rows of couples, waiting expectantly for Selene to take the lead spot. And Selene's first dancing partner came forward. A very tall, very clever-looking fellow in full bardic scarlet. 
he bowed over her hand, she stood up, and they took their positions. Every dance had been arranged in advance, of course. The only deviation would be if Selene elected to sit any of them out, at which time her partner would be expected to attend her and offer conversation. Alberich doubted that Selene would do any such thing, though. She loved dancing, and she'd been keyed up all day without having much of an outlet for her energy. If ever his young nobleman was going to appear, it would be here, but not, Alberich thought, among those nearest to the queen. And, in fact, the evening was half over before he caught a glimpse of the young man. It was only a glimpse, too, too quick to be certain, much less pass the sight along to Cantor, but Alberich was good at remembering details, and the young man was wearing a hat that was reasonably identifiable. Alberich kept an eye on that hat, watching as it swam through the crowd, as it swayed and bent in a dance, as it huddled with several more hats off to one side. And for one horrible moment, he thought it was going to duck out of the entrance. But it hesitated, then bowed to an elegant plume. It joined with the plume, escorting it, and the pair moved along the side of the dancing floor until at last they moved out onto it. As luck would have it, it was a round dance, and eventually the figures brought the hat and its owner into Alberich's line of sight. He felt Cantor absorb the young man's image through his own eyes felt Cantor absent himself for a moment. Then Cantor returned. Devlin Garreton, third son of Lord Stevel Garreton, Cantor reported. Talamir will tell you what he knows about the young man and his family later. It isn't much. It's an old family, but not particularly prosperous. And they haven't done much to draw attention to themselves or distinguish themselves. There's only one thing— there's no reason why this young man should be so interested in common plays or actors. His eldest brother's a sound amateur poet, and the only thing that Devlin is known by is that he has a good ear for poetry and letters and is considered a budding expert in drama. Well, wasn't that interesting? Wasn't that very interesting indeed? 7. Selene woke just before dawn. If she had had any dreams, she couldn't remember them. Yesterday everything had gone perfectly, with one exception, one glaring, aching exception. Her father hadn't been there. A weight of crushing depression settled over her. She opened her eyes and lay quietly in her bed as thin, gray light crept in through the cracks in her curtains. She closed her eyes again, and hot tears spilled from beneath her lids and down her temples to soak into her hair. Her throat closed, and a cold, hard lump formed in it. Selene tried to fight back the sobs, but one escaped anyway, and she turned over quickly and muffled her sobbing in her pillows. She didn't want to wake her attendants, or alert the servants on the other side of the door. She didn't want anyone to know she was crying. They wouldn't understand. They would think that she should be thrilled, not choked with tears. After all, her festival had been a triumph, and people would talk about it for years. The court had loved it. The common folk had adored it. Even the seneschal and keeper of the treasury had been happy, for she had been very frugal, extracting the maximum benefit from every coin she'd spent— either overseeing the preparations herself, or sending people with stern demeanor and sharp eyes to do so for her. The feast for the common folk had been a wild success, going on long into the night as folk brought or bought food of their own to extend that supplied by the crown. As for the entertainments for her court, their feast and dancing had been as much of a success, and for once she'd had nothing but perfect dancing partners. Alberich had been right. Having heralds and bards, and even a few healers, alternate with her young nobles had made all the difference. Her gown, the first time she'd been out of mourning, had made her look beautiful. She hadn't needed dubious compliments to tell her so, for her mirror and the frank gazes of the bards and heralds had made that clear enough. But Sendar hadn't been there, and it might just as well have been a total failure because of that. She'd tried to lose herself in the preparations, then to immerse herself in the happiness of other people. And she'd actually forgotten for a little, just a little. 
She'd smiled and even laughed, and when she'd come back here to her rooms, she'd been so tired she'd fallen straight asleep. But she'd known the moment that she awakened that one day, one week, hadn't changed anything, hadn't filled the emptiness, hadn't given her back the part of herself that was gone. Her father would have loved this. He'd have reveled in her triumph. He would have had so many ideas for the festival, so many more than she had. The brief respite she'd had was just that, a moment of forgetfulness, nothing more. And now, with nothing but day after day of gray sameness stretching ahead of her, she missed him so much she thought she was going to break beneath the weight of grief. So she sobbed into her pillow, inconsolable. How could anyone console her for this? She and her father should have had years and years together. She should have had him to cast stern eyes over would-be suitors, to advise her how to deal with the council, to scold her for working too hard and send her to read a book or ride. And if she ever married, he should have been there to see it, to see his grandchildren, to spoil them as he'd often threatened to do. All of that was gone, taken from her before it ever had a chance to happen. She didn't want anyone to hear her crying. They wouldn't understand. They'd tell her stupid things, that it had been long enough, that she needed to pull herself together, that it was time to move on. How could they know? How many of them had a beloved father cut down in front of their eyes? How many of them were facing what she faced, the rest of her life, without the man who had been father and mother to her, and friend, and counselor? None of them understood. None of them could. None of them wanted to. What they wanted was for her to be something else, some biddable creature they called Selene that had no feelings but the shallowest and no thoughts of her own. Her feelings were an inconvenient obstacle to that. Or worse than telling her to get over this, they'd spew some kind of platitude about how he was surely watching her from somewhere and was proud of her, but would be unhappy that she was still mourning for him. How could they know? How could anyone know? It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. Sindar had been good. He'd given up so much. He'd always done so much for others. It wasn't fair. She'd always thought that when you did good, good came to you. What kind of a cruel god would do this to her? And to him? For that matter, she wasn't entirely certain that there were any gods out there, not after this. And if there weren't any gods, then that meant that when you died, you just died, and her father wasn't out there looking after her. He was just gone, and all those platitudes were nothing but empty lies. Damn them. Damn them all. And their needs, and their platitudes, and their plans. They would never, could never understand. She'd lost her best friend as well as her father. She'd been cheated out of years of things that they all took for granted. How could she possibly get over that? There would be a great gaping wound in her for the rest of her life that would never be properly filled. Except with tears, the tears that never seemed to heal anything inside her. She had tried, these past moons at least, to do things that would keep her moving, keep her busy, keep her too concentrated on things outside herself to think. For a while, the sheer desperation of having to learn how to rule, of having to outwit her counsel when they tried discreetly to shunt her aside or maneuver her into something she didn't want to do, had filled that need to keep moving. She would work and plan and learn until she fell asleep, exhausted, and wake early to work again, and that had helped at least to keep things at bay. Keep moving. Keep busy. Keep her mind full. Keep it all at a distance. Then, just as the urgency of all that began to ease, there'd been the preparations for the festival to fill the silences, to force her to work, think, and not remember. But now, she had awakened this morning, knowing there was nothing, nothing between her and that vast, aching void that used to be filled with her father's presence. And anyone who found her crying like this would just never understand. They'd wonder why, after yesterday, she could be unhappy. Even if she tried to explain, they'd stare at her without understanding, then tell her that it was time she moved on, that it was time to leave her grief behind her, as if she could. Of course you can't, Karyo said very, very quietly. And you shouldn't. That would be wrong. How can you leave it behind you when it's a part of you? 
The feeling that Cario had somehow put comforting arms around her only made her sob harder. But Cario didn't seem to think there was anything wrong with that. They keep telling me stupid things, like time will heal it, she said around the sobs that shook her entire body. There was an ache in Cario's mind voice that matched the aching of her heart. Time doesn't. All that time does is make it more distant, put more space between you and what happened. It doesn't heal anything. I don't know how or what does the healing, but it isn't time. Oh, Cario, I miss him so much, she cried. So do I. Somehow that was exactly the right thing for Selene to hear. It let loose another torrent of weeping, but this time it seemed as if she was weeping herself out until at last she lay there curled in her bed, her nose stuffed and her eyes sore, her pillow soggy. Turn your pillow over, love. She sniffed hard and obeyed without thinking, and closed her aching eyes. She was exhausted now, limp with crying, and if the ache in her heart didn't hurt any less, at least she was too tired to cry any more. I keep thinking if only I'd gone after him. If only... Those must be the two saddest words in the world, Cario sighed. The best thing that I can tell you is that there is nothing that could have happened that would have allowed you to follow him, and there was not one scrap, one hint of knowledge or even foresight that any of us had that would have let us guess what he was going to do, or enabled us to prevent it. If there was ever a moment in history where a man took his own fate in his own two hands, that was it. Then I wish I could go back. But there was no use in pursuing that line of thought. She couldn't. No one, not even in the tales of before the founding, had ever said anything about being able to go back into the past and change things. I don't want to get up, Cario. And she didn't. She didn't want to move. She didn't want to leave her bed. Ever. The weight of depression pressed down on her and filled her with lethargy. She wanted to close her eyes and fall into oblivion and never come out again. She didn't exactly want to die, but if only there was a way to not live. And Cario didn't say any of the stupid things that other people might, about how she had to live for Valdemar, or how she was being hysterical or overreacting. If you don't get up, I'll miss our morning ride. She said instead, wistfully, as if she was deliberately misunderstanding the I don't want to get up as merely meaning this morning and not forever. Maybe she was. But the thought of the morning ride, another of those times when she could forget for a little as Cario moved into a gallop, and she could lean over that warm white neck and let the movement and the rush of air and the rhythm all lull her into a kind of trance, that same state of not being that she was just longing for, that broke through the lethargy. It was hard to tell why, but it did. It made her decide that she had to get up, to keep moving, to try for another candle mark another day. And as she forced her legs out from under the covers, it occurred to her that as long as she just kept moving, even if she didn't find any peace or escape in movement, she might at least find a little more distraction. Distraction. She had to distract anyone from knowing she'd been crying, or they'd want to know why. And then there would be all that stupid nonsense that she didn't want to hear. She slipped out of bed and went to the table where a basin and pitcher waited. She splashed some of the cold water into the basin and bathed her face until she thought that most of the signs of her tears were gone. Her eyes were probably still red, but with luck no one would remark on it. After all, with all of the snow glare out there yesterday, probably they'd think it was that. If anyone said anything, she'd claim it was snow glare. And maybe she could claim a headache, too, and cut the council session short. She blew her nose and went back to her bed and crawled back into it, feeling as exhausted as if she hadn't slept at all. Just close your eyes, Cario advised. They'll expect you to sleep late after last night. You really did look lovely, you know. All of the young heralds, at least, were saying so. I can't speak for the bards. They don't have companions to gossip about them. But the heralds were very taken with how you looked. They were. That was, if not comforting, at least it was satisfying. Nice to know that she did look as good as she had thought. 
believe it or not. Even Alberich thought so. In fact, I think he might have had just a twinge of jealousy when he handed you off to Orthalan. Well, that penetrated the lethargic depression a bit. Alberich, surely not. And anyway, it was probably only that he disliked Orthalan. Well, apparently the feeling was mutual, and there wasn't anything she could do about that. When two men decided to take a dislike to one another, there really wasn't anything to be done about it. It was like trying to get a pair of dominant dogs to be friends. No matter what you did, each of them was going to be certain that he should be head of the pack, and all you could do was to try and keep them separate as much as possible. Orthalan was one of the few people who didn't say anything stupid about her father. He didn't even say that she ought to be over her grief by now, and that made him one of the few people she felt comfortable being around, even if he did tend to treat her as little Selene instead of the queen. Besides, it wasn't Alberich that she wanted to make jealous. Though on second thought, there really wasn't anyone in her entire court or the heraldic circle she wanted to make jealous. Honestly, if the whole business of trying to get her to marry someone who was tied to a whole pack of special interests was put aside, the real reason she didn't want to marry any of the council's choices was that they all bored her. There wasn't one of them that was worth spending an entire afternoon with, much less a lifetime. There wasn't a single unattached male in the entire court that even gave her a flutter of interest. She was just so tired of it all, tired of the ache in her soul. Tired of the loneliness, tired of trying to outmaneuver the people she should have been able to lean on. It seemed as if her entire life was nothing more than dragging herself through an endless round of weariness and grief, and she just wanted an end to it all. She buried her face in her pillow, not to muffle more sobs, but to block out everything, if only for a moment. It was when she woke again to the sounds of her servants and attendants bustling around the room that she realized she must have fallen asleep again. And if she didn't feel better, at least she felt a little less tired. Enough so that she felt she could probably face the day. She didn't want to, but she could. I think, she told Cario as they came to get her out of bed and dress her, I think we'll have our morning ride before breakfast. Good, Caryo said simply. I'd like that, thank you. Keep moving, that was the only answer, just keep moving. And if that wasn't an answer, at least it was a way to keep her from just stopping, stopping and never starting again. For Alberich, the day after the festival's climax began just as any ordinary day did, the only differences being that now, at least, he didn't have to concern himself with making preparations for Selene's appearance, and now that he knew the identity of the young man he'd been looking for, he could concentrate on thinking of ways to find out what was going on. But as far as the young trainees went, apparently, the end of the festival meant restlessness and discontent. They'd had an unexpected break in their routine, and as Alberich was woefully aware, any break in a youngster's routine generally meant trouble in getting him back into that routine. As a consequence, the first class of the morning was a disaster. Far too much time was wasted in trying to get his students back on track after the excitement of the ice festival, and they fought him every step of the way, performing their warm-ups lethargically, running through the initial exercises in a state of distraction, and wasting time in chattering about the pleasures of the day before. And part of him was still puzzling over the question of Devlin Garretton, why he would be receiving information from a play actor, and what that information could be. It took real effort on his own part to put that aside and concentrate on getting some results out of the class. But it was a futile effort. The trainees were utterly disinclined to settle down and work, and finally, in desperation, he decided that if all they could do was chatter about ice sports, well, he'd give them an ice sport they would never forget. After all, they were going to have to learn to work together in coordinated teams. Silence, he barked. Weapons down. Startled, they shut off the chatter, dropped weapon points, and stared at him. Weapons put away. Get the staves, he ordered grimly. Now. Then on with cloaks and follow me. 
Now looking apprehensive and guilty, they obeyed. He snatched up his own cloak, hid a little surprise inside it as he did so, and stalked out, followed by a suddenly subdued tale of trainees of all four colors. Out into the snow they went, out past the practice grounds and into Companion's Field, following a path beaten by others into the thigh-deep snow. It was another cloudless, bone-chilling day, and sunlight poured pitilessly down through the skeletal branches of the trees. He led them to one of the frozen ponds in Companion's Field, one that had been cleared off so that it could be used for skating, but was far enough from the palace and the collegia that it wasn't in use very much. In a welcome release for his temper, he kicked three basket-sided holes in the snow at the edge of the ice, one at each point of an imaginary equal-sided triangle laid on the pond, then divided the class into two teams. He made sure that the trainees were fairly evenly distributed between both teams, and he made a point of dividing up friends as much as he could. If they were mad for sport, well, he'd give them bloody sport indeed. Chosen, I hope you aren't releasing a wolf from a trap here, Cantor said, full of amusement. Are you sure you know what you're doing? No, he said honestly. But at least they'll get some stave practice out of this. Then he dropped what he had picked up onto the ice in front of them. It was one of the little round cushions that they used over their knuckles when they were practicing bare fist fighting. They looked at it, then at him, then back down at it, without any comprehension at all. Pah, you are two teams of fighters now. There are your goals. First team there, second team there. He pointed. He thought he saw comprehension beginning to dawn. He hoped so. They'd all seen the broomball competition. He hoped they weren't so dense that they couldn't figure this out. The third goal neutral is. Either team may score there. The cushion into the opposite goal or into the neutral goal you are to put, he said icily and moved carefully off the slippery surface of the ice, with as much dignity as he could muster, heaving a sigh of relief when he reached the bank and could stand there with his arms folded over his chest, under his cape. But is this like broom ball? What are the rules? someone asked, and, But we don't have skates, protested another. There are rules in war? I think not, he retorted. Skates you will be carrying in the field? Enough. No rules, the cushion in the goal you will put. How it comes there your problem is. Hit it you may, kick it, carry it I care not. You have staves, use them, fight with them, no rules. He hadn't been altogether certain what their response would be. On the one hand they were trainees, and had a modicum of training in organization. On the other hand, they were overstimulated adolescents with too much restlessness to settle down. They could settle in and make some rules, assigning tasks and responsibilities, before they set to their new version of broom ball. They could, but they didn't. With a yell, someone broke and swatted at the cushion with his stave, and the melee began as someone else jumped for the cushion, and half of the other team piled onto the one making the move. It was in a sadistic sort of way, rather entertaining for the onlooker. Staves went everywhere, though not as successfully as if the fighting had been on solid, unslippery ground. Bodies went everywhere. Most of them ended up sprawled on the ice. The cushion tended not to get anywhere near a goal. He had been counting on the ice to ensure that no one was able to get in any dangerously hard blows with the staves, and the ploy worked. Even the ones that were good skaters found the going slippery, and none of them were used to trying to stay balanced on the ice while simultaneously swatting with a stave. And all of them were fairly good at stave work to begin with, so if someone swung for an opponent instead of the cushion, there was a good chance that he'd find the blow blocked. But none of them were doing much in the way of coordination or teamwork. It was pretty much every man for himself, and Alberich had ensured that the little amount of teamwork that might have occurred naturally was sidelined by breaking up friends into opposite teams. It got pretty wild out there, though, before it was all over. He didn't know if any of them were keeping track of the number of goals that were made. He certainly wasn't. All he was interested in was to make sure that no one was injured beyond falls and bruises and bumps on the head. Putting them on the ice had another effect. Even when someone connected with a stave, 
Most of the force of the blow went into sending the opponent flying like a giant version of the cushion. Oh, they were going to be aching and stiff when it was over. There's going to be competition for the bathtubs today, Cantor observed, sounding highly amused. And calls for liniment, I suspect. They wanted excitement, he told his companion. So they did. If they were going to act like a lot of wild hill brats, then by the Sun Lord, they were going to learn why discipline and organization were necessary if you wanted to win a fight. By the time that class was over, more to the point, by the time he broke up the melee that the game had turned into and sent them all back to their other classes, it didn't appear that the lesson had sunk in yet. But he was relatively certain that eventually it would, as they thought back over the chaos on the ice. Certainly they were, one and all, winded, weary, aching in every limb, and there wasn't one of them that wasn't sporting some sort of injury. There were a hefty number of black eyes, and lots of bruises in places that didn't show, and a strain or two, and lumps on the skull. And he would have laid money on the fact that not one of them was going to give the other instructors any trouble for the rest of the day. But most of all, for the sake of the lesson in teamwork, it was painfully clear that no one had any idea who had won. So when the next class showed the early symptoms of the same disease, he administered the same cure. It was only when he got the final year students that he got any signs of sense and steadiness out of them, and managed to run a normal class. He didn't have the option of thinking much past the fact that at least he'd gotten some work out of them, and a lesson of sorts, into them. After classes were over, some of the guard appeared for a little training, and he was able to work out some of his own frustration in a satisfying series of bouts. When the last of the adults had gone and the last of the daylight faded, leaving the sal in blue gloom, he was more concerned with a hot shower than anything else. He went back into his quarters and got himself cleaned up, coming out of his bathing room to find that the servants had come and gone from the collegium, leaving behind both his dinner and a visitor. What in the bloody blue blazes did you infect your students with today? Misty demanded, peering at him through her thick glass lenses, pausing in the midst of laying out plates, cups, and cutlery. They look like they've been through the wars, and they're chattering like magpies about some ice exercise you invented. He stared at her for a moment, bemused both by her presence and by the question. He hadn't thought much beyond exhausting the worst offenders. It hadn't occurred to him that they'd actually take to the exercise. Well, not really, anyway. Maybe some of the blues, the courtier's children, who hadn't anything better to do with their time. They would not settle, he replied after a moment. So, to exhaust them, I decided, and to show them organization is needed, a battle to win. Well, your little experiment in ice warfare is being talked about over all three collegia, she said in a rueful tone, as if she could hardly believe it. And the ones that hadn't tried it yet were mad to while the rest are trying to come up with rules, so-called proper equipment, scoring. It's all anyone could talk about over luncheon and dinner, and they want to do it in their free time. He interrupted her with a gust of incredulous laughter. No, they mean to make a sport? Evidently. She shook her head and dished out food for both of them. Then she sat down, next to the fire, with a bowl of stew in her hand. I suppose we should be grateful. It's new, it's a good alternative to tavern hopping and getting into pranks, and it's exercise. And they will weary of it soon enough, he said. If they do not, when the ice melts, over it is. He couldn't believe that anything as ridiculous as the foolish melee he'd put them through had suddenly become an all-consuming interest. Hmm. She ate a little, chewing thoughtfully as the fire crackled beside her. I think what's likeliest to happen is that they'll all try it, but the only way to keep from getting bruised up and battered over it is to have a lot of rules, and maybe purloin the padding and helms used for weapons practice into the bargain. But having a lot of rules means that they'll have to agree over the rules. No two sets of would-be players are going to have the same idea of what the rules should be, and in the end they won't have agreed before the ice melts. Probably. He agreed, feeling relieved and irritated at the same time. 
Cadets would never have been allowed such foolishness. But then again, as he had noted before, heraldic trainees were not car-side cadets. I had noted that on the river, the players of the broomball game required much drinking of wine and beer to continue the game past the first few goals. And without that, it isn't nearly as much fun. She chuckled. Right, that's what I'll tell the others. They were afraid it was going to take over the Collegia. He thought about that for a moment, thought about the fact that a certain level of madness seemed to come out of the confinement of winter, and thought about all the high spirits generated by the festival. It will, probably, for a short time, he decided, but that gives a painless punishment as well. For those of the Collegia, at least, who will not settle and study, forbid them from playing. Make playing contingent upon good marks. Blues we can do little about, if they're high-born children. But then again, time they have to waste. At least melees on ice harm them only. Oh, ouch! Very good indeed, Misty laughed. That should do the trick. They finished dinner quickly. So much time spent out in the cold used up a lot of energy, and he was wolf-hungry. Only after they had cleared the dishes away into the hampers did it occur to him to wonder why she had come there tonight. It couldn't have been because she wanted his company, could it? At that thought he got a very odd feeling in the pit of his stomach. Not unpleasant, no, but fluttery. It disconcerted him. It disconcerted him so much that he just blurted out what was in his head. Why are you here? he heard himself saying, and could have hit himself for how it sounded. But she didn't seem to take offense at his words or his tone. Well, she began and hesitated. Mixed motives, actually. I wanted to find out what you'd done with the youngsters. I must say that the ones who had gotten your lesson were nicely subdued for my classes. It was only the ones that hadn't gotten to play that were wound up like tops. And, um, another hesitation. I, um, enjoy your company. And one other thing, she added hastily, before he could decide if she was blushing or not. Karen slipped a little. Well, she didn't really slip, so much as I browbeat it out of her when she brought me a dress, of all things, to mend for her. She laughed. I mean, Karen, in a dress, please, that was odd enough, but a dress that looked like that? Like what? he asked, unthinking. A dockside whore she replied with cheerful bluntness, and it was his turn to flush. She said she didn't want to take it to the Collegium seamstresses because it was supposed to be a secret, and then tried to backtrack. Well, needless to say, I got the whole story out of her. So you know, he asked, feeling a little guilty that he hadn't told her before this, seeing that he'd been thinking about asking for her help anyway. Hmm, I guessed, before this. Too many evenings when you weren't here in the complex— too many times when you knew things you shouldn't have about parts of Haven you weren't supposed to have ever visited, she said thoughtfully. I mean, I can put two and two together, and unlike some of our colleagues with some rather lofty ideas about heraldic duties and honor, I know a bit about the practicalities of life. Anyway, I just wanted you to know that if I can help without getting in the way, I'd like to. Karen might fit in some of the wilder parts of Haven but I know the craftsman's districts inside and out. That stopped him cold. It hadn't occurred to him that Misty might want to volunteer, or that she would actually have some inside knowledge that he didn't. He'd thought he would have to persuade her, then train her. It's not as if I'd have to act a part, like Karen, she continued. I'd just have to be what I was before I was chosen, an accountant, a clerk, ordinary. Believe me, people like me are just invisible as long as we keep our mouths shut. No one thinks anything about having us around. We're a kind of servant, and no one ever pays any attention to the servants. He didn't know how true the latter statement was, but the former was true enough. There could be danger in this, he warned. She raised an eyebrow. You might not think it, but there's danger in being an independent clerk. You don't always know just who is hiring you, or for what, or at least not until they ask you to run two sets of books, or you get a look at papers you weren't supposed to see. That never happened to me personally, but I know those it did happen to, 
and there's stories about people turning up missing after taking certain jobs. She chuckled weakly. Well, that's probably what most of the people who knew me think is what happened to me. I know for a fact that none of them realize I was chosen. Well, she was on that last battlefield for the Tedril Wars, and she'd volunteered for that, too. She'd faced danger there, certainly enough. I might then ask you for help, he said carefully. Ask, and you'll have it, she said, and then seemed at a loss for anything else to say. But he didn't want her to leave. They sat in awkward silence for a long time. And when the silence was broken, they both broke it at once. Can you tell me what of interest have you— They both broke off, flushing. Alberich was just a little angry at himself. Surely he was more than old enough to have a simple conversation with an interesting woman without blushing like a boy. Particularly this one that he had shouted at, cursed at, and forced to learn things she adamantly did not want to learn. You first, she said, gesturing. He paused. What did he want to say? It suddenly occurred to him that there was a lot he didn't know about her. He might as well start with that. So, what was Misty the Clerk like? he asked. What was her life? She laughed. Boring, but, her eyes grew thoughtful behind those thick lenses, but you don't know much of anything about the ordinary person in Valdemar of the middling classes, do you? I know a lot about all of that, in Haven in particular, so even if I'd be bored by it? Please, he said with a slow smile. Tell me. And so she did, and being Misty, she got as much about Alberich of Carsey out of him as he did about Misty of Haven. It was, on the whole, an equitable exchange, and perhaps, best of all, it was one that would take some time in telling. 8. The ice festival had taken place a fortnight after midwinter. Now, another fortnight later, the deep cold finally broke with a grey day, vastly warmer than the ones that had brought the ice festival, and with a dampness to the air that warned of snow. By a candle mark after sunrise, the snow had begun, and it fell thick and soft all day and into the night. Alberich, for one, was very happy to see it, for it meant that all the frozen ponds were covered over, and at least until the would-be athletes shoveled them clear again, there would be no more ice melees. Or as the trainees had decided to call it, Hurley. Yes, they had given it a name. They had agreed on that much and more. It had taken on a life of its own. He had, unwittingly, created a monster. Yet at the same time it was a very useful monster. If at times it seemed that the vast majority of the free time of both trainees and young courtiers was taken up with creating rules and scoring for this combative game, and arguing over both endlessly, at least they were learning about teamwork, cooperation in combat, and negotiation. If they seemed obsessed... At least, as several teachers said with a sigh, there were worse things to get obsessed about, and the slightest hint that falling marks would occasion being forbidden to play or even discuss the game often worked miracles. Still, it seemed that there was nowhere in court or collegia that one could go to escape the wretched game. Even some of the younger guards had started to take it up. For all Alberich knew, it was spreading down into Haven by now and many older members of the court, decidedly unamused by the racketing teams of youngsters surging here and there and practicing on every open bit of ice, or even creating unauthorized bits of ice to practice on, often gave Alberich unfriendly glares when he saw them. The cushion had been replaced by first a child's beanbag, then a tough leather ball filled with heavy buckwheat in its husks, of the sort that jugglers practiced with. The staves now had small scoops on one end. The holes in the snow were now nets, and the teams had been stabilized at five members each, one of which was supposed to guard his team's net. Combat with the staves was still very much allowed. Alberich had the feeling that no few little feuds were being worked out during the games. Half-helms of padded leather and elbow, kidney, and knee pads had been agreed upon. Skates were not allowed, on order of the healers who didn't want to deal with the results. 
Other additions were being argued about, or rather forcefully argued for, by Healer's Collegium, which did not want an influx of trainees and other youngsters with missing teeth or broken jawbones. At this point, Alberich had washed his hands of the entire project and disclaimed any involvement with it. Like the other instructors, he had declared that inattention and falling marks would be grounds for being forbidden to play. He was rather desperately hoping that a thaw would put an end to it, and depressingly afraid that, given the new changes in it, they would be able to play without ice. At least by this point it was very clear that no more than half of the heraldic trainees— and substantially, very substantially less than a quarter of the healers and bardic trainees, were going to actually be playing this game. The rest lacked the coordination, and after the initial excitement was over, the inclination. That did not, however, mean that the rest weren't interested. Oh, no, they were still just as mad about watching it as the rest were about playing it. But he could not spare much time to worry about a mere game— he had decided to start taking Karen out on some of his prowls through Haven, and he had yet to come up with a plan to let him discover just what Devlin and that actor were up to. The main stumbling block was that he could not think of a way to shadow the young courtier or the actor without alerting them to the fact that someone was watching them. For one thing, he was more than a little wary about trying to disguise himself around the actor at all. He could fool ordinary folk, but an actor? The fellow might have a style that was ridiculously flamboyant and exaggerated, but that Alberich suspected was for the benefit of his audience, which was not going to react to a subtle performance. The man could not have come up with so clever a plan for passing information if he was not clever and subtle himself. And if Alberich tried to pass himself off as someone who had business being around either Devlin or the actors, it seemed impossible. Alberich was certain he'd be caught. He might be able to pass off his Carsite accent as Hardornan or Rethwellen down in the slums, but actors had an ear for accents, and might even be able to correctly identify his. And just how many Carsites were there in Haven? Not many. Not many that still had their accent. The paste he used to disguise his scars passed muster after dark, but actors knew about makeup and false hair. He'd never get by an actor without him noticing. How many Carsite heralds were there? A sufficiently clever man could easily put two and two together. As for getting in close, that was impossible. The man, finally Alberich had learned who he was, Norris Letton, and where his troop was operating from, the three sheaves in the cattle market area, seldom went anywhere outside of the inn, and never consorted with anyone except his fellow actors and exceedingly attractive, buxom, adoring women neither of which Alberich was, nor were Karen or Misty. They might be able to feign the adoration, but the kind of ladies that Norris kept company with were the sort that made men turn in the street and stare after them. Not surprisingly, no few of them were ladies of negotiable virtue, but the price they placed on their services was very, very high. They were nothing like the common whores of the Exile's Gate neighborhood, and Alberich could not make up his mind if Norris was paying for their company, or getting it on the basis of his reputation, popularity, stunningly handsome face, and muscular body. If he was paying for it, where was a mere actor getting the money? On the other hand, someone who looked like Norris did generally had women fawning on him, and Alberich saw no reason to suppose that expensive courtesans were any less likely to fawn than supposedly honest women. Thanks to Norris's face and flamboyant style, the troupe was certainly prospering, as was the inn to which they were attached. They didn't even have to give plays every day for the public any more. Once every two days the courtyard was packed with spectators for one of the repertoire of plays they put on, and it certainly wasn't because of the high literary standards of the things. Moving to that tent on the river bank during the festival had been a shrewd move. Putting on their play there spread their reputation to the entire city, and the city evidently followed them back to their home ground when the festival was over. Norris even was beginning to get something of a following among the highborn of the court. While the plays they put on for the public were hardly great literature, evidently they had in their repertoire a number of classical works, and the troupe had been hired to give private performances at least twice now. 
There would without a doubt be more of those, though how lucrative they were in contrast to the public performances Alberich had no way of telling. Which created another problem. It seemed to Alberich that Norris was living somewhat beyond his means, but without getting close to the man, there was no way to know that for certain. He didn't know how Norris was paid, or if, now that he had a bit of a following among the highborn, he was getting gifts or patronage. If so, then young Devlin would have the perfect excuse to add to that patronage, and even visit the actor openly. So Alberich still did not know what was being exchanged, whether or not it mattered to the crown, nor how dangerous it was, and at the moment he had no way of finding these things out. And there was another thing that worried him, that had nothing to do with the Devlin problem. It seemed to him that Selene was not looking entirely well. It wasn't that she looked ill exactly but that she looked far more subdued than he liked. It was the death of her father, of course. It couldn't be anything else. The festival had been an all-too-brief diversion from her grief, he suspected. He wished he could do something for her, but the honest truth was that he was completely unsuited to that sort of task. All he could do was what he was good at, and let others, Talamir, who was, after all, Queen's own, do their job without any interference. "'assuming that the Hurley players didn't drive him utterly mad before spring. "'The problem is,' Misty said, over a good slice of beef in the bell, "'you don't understand the sports-minded. "'Both of them were in disguise. "'He as a middling craftsman, she in some of her old garb from her previous life, "'including the spectacles she had worn then, lenses held in frames of wire.' This was the first time he had brought Misty down into Haven to try out her disguise, but it was more for his benefit than for hers. He wanted to look like an ordinary craftsman in the audience at the Three Sheaves, and if he didn't have to talk, he stood a better chance of passing as Valdemarin. The bloody-minded, not the sports-minded, he muttered under his breath, then said louder, And you do? It seemed unlikely. The spectacled Misty held as much aloof from the hurly madness as he did, as far as he could tell. As a matter of fact, she retorted, I do. I was raised here in an ordinary family, not in a cadet school. People with a bit of leisure time. Ordinary folk like sport, even if they don't play a game, or at least don't play it well. That's why they like to cheer on those who do. That... I do not understand at all, he admitted reluctantly. She sniffed. You ought to. It's part of what makes it easy for a sufficiently unscrupulous leader to get his people involved in a needless war. Look, it's like this, as I reckon it. People like to be in groups on one side, so they can tell themselves that their side is better than the other. They can get the excitement and the thrill of being worked up about just how much better they are than the other side is. And when they're in a group doing that, then the excitement is doubled just because everyone else is doing the same. That I understand, he said darkly. So you are saying that being sports-minded, a little like being in a war, is? Without the bloodshed, she replied and sighed. Without the consequences. People like competition, but at the same time, they like cooperation almost as much. With something like Hurley... You get to either be on a team or for a team, and you get cooperation, like being in a special tribe. But then your team goes against someone else's team, and there's your competition. It satisfies a whole lot of cravings all at once. It's like a bloodless war. And then you get to go out and buy each other beer afterward, and you get cooperation all over again. He shrugged. It made sense, he supposed. He thought about how he had been shouting at the end of the last skating race along with everyone else. If even he could get caught up in a sport to that extent, then what Misty said made sense. And there wasn't any warfare going on. People who had been used to living with a conflict and an enemy now found themselves with nothing of the sort. Maybe those who had actually fought were perfectly comfortable without having an enemy. But those who hadn't, particularly all those youngsters, might be looking for a focus for all that energy. So maybe that was why Hurley had suddenly become an obsession. And probably, as Misty expected, within a couple of months it would turn into a sport like any other. 
at least now that the rules had been agreed on, and things had sorted out into a round robin of regular teams with exact rosters, the situation wasn't quite so out of hand. Certainly the whole scheme of forbidding participation if marks fell off was working. Miraculously, even with the highborn blues, and heretofore if their parents weren't concerned with marks, there had been no way to effectively discipline them. Maybe Hurley wasn't so bad after all. So where exactly is it that we're going? she asked. The three sheaves in, he told her. She nodded, though she looked surprised. He had explained his situation with regard to young Devlin and his contact Norris, and the difficulty he found himself in trying to get close enough to make some sort of judgment about it. I thought, at the least, into the playgoing crowd we can insert ourselves. Good for me, for open my mouth I cannot without myself betraying, so you can do the speaking for us both. Good for you it would be, and it may be that an opportunity you will see that I cannot. Fair enough? she agreed, and glanced out the window into the thickening gloom of twilight. And I might, you never know. Besides, I wouldn't mind seeing this actor fellow if he's setting young hearts afire. Alberich snorted. Not just young, he corrected and finished the last of his meal. All the better, then. She chuckled at the expression on his face, and pushed off from the table without another word. Now, Something did occur to me, she said, as they moved out into the cold, snowy streets, passing a lamplighter who was climbing up to light one of his charges. Had you considered paying one of those low-life pickpockets you hang about with to snatch young Devlin's purse when you think he's carrying what you're looking for? Tell him you want the papers, he gets anything else. Since it had not occurred to him, he almost stopped dead in the street to stare at her, uh, no, he managed at last. Should be easy enough, she pointed out. I suppose you'd have to make up some cock and bull tale about why you wanted it done, and you'd have to work the whole set up just for the other lad to do the snatch and run so he'll get away clean, maybe even interfere with some of the constables to keep them from nobbling him. But between what you paid the fellow and what he'd get off Devlin, I'd have to think that it'd more than pay him to keep his mouth shut about it. His mind was already at work on the problem. He could sacrifice one of the problematic personae if he needed to. If one of them was never seen again after getting the papers, it wouldn't matter if the thief in question couldn't keep his mouth shut, because there'd be no one to betray. It was definitely an idea, and a good one. Not perfect, but... But it opened up a whole new set of ideas. It hadn't occurred to him to make use of the criminal element. There were other possibilities here. If, for instance, he could discover which room in the inn Norris used, perhaps he could send someone to search it. You do know that someone might recognize me at this inn, don't you? She continued conversationally. Not as a herald, of course. I'm certain nobody actually knows that's where I went when I quit my job. My choosing was pretty quiet, actually. And since I was right in Haven... I persuaded Alarian to let me finish out my work for the day, and in my notice, and slip out without a fuss. Modest of you, he began. She laughed. Hardly. I didn't want anyone who wanted a favor showing up at the Collegium looking for me. Anybody who knew me would recognize me as Misty Willinger, the accountant and clerk, not Harold Misty. Except for the wars, I haven't set foot outside the Collegium complex since I was chosen. Really? Well, that would not harm anything. He pulled the hood closer around his neck. This damp cold seemed to be more penetrating than the dry cold of festival week. In fact, it might be a good thing. Re-establish myself in my old haunts. She glanced at him sideways. Well, if you want me to do that, I can. I'll think up something to tell anyone who asks where I've been. He had to snort at that. Where else but for the army working, he asked, at least until the wars ended. She stared at him for a moment and stumbled over a rut, then smiled. You've got a good head for this, she said. You're right, of course, all those soldiers needed feeding, supplying, paying, that needs clerks. And now half of them disbanded are, and no more need for extra clerks. That was certainly true enough.
Just as it was true that an army the size of the one that Sendar had assembled had required a vast force of people to support it. Which is why I'm back. Her smile spread. But of course the reason I'm not back at my old job is because I was replaced, which I was, but when I was chosen. So, a job you must have. He frowned over that thought. Not necessarily. No, wait. An idea I have. The bell, that is safe enough. A note I will leave. It'll be arranged, should anyone ask. Not that anyone would. No one was likely to ask about a minor clerk and accountant, but it was best to cover every contingency. For the master you do records, and the taproom clerk you are also. You board there as well. This was common enough. Just because people were supposed to be literate didn't mean they were good at reading and writing. Often enough they were willing to pay someone else to write a letter for them, and of course any legal documents absolutely required a clerk to draw them up. That'll do, she sighed with satisfaction. I like to have everything set out just in case. As do I, alike we think in that way. And before he could say anything else, although there were a couple of half-formed ideas in the back of his head, it was too late to say anything, because the three sheaves was looming before them, and with it a good-sized crowd milling about at the door, waiting to get into the courtyard for the performance. They joined it, and at that point kept their conversation to commonplaces. The one excellent thing about having Bardic Collegium right on the grounds of the palace was that there were always fine musicians available at a moment's notice. The Hardornan ambassador from King Alessander had expressed an interest that afternoon in hearing some of the purely instrumental music that Valdemarans took for granted, and Selene had been able to arrange for that wish to be gratified with an impromptu concert after dinner. Ambassador Isadir was finally rested enough from his journey and formal reception to show some interest in the less formal pastimes of the court, which meant to Selene, the ones where she wasn't required to pay exclusive attention to him, or indeed to anyone. Bardic Collegium responded to her request for an instrumental ensemble with what almost seemed to be gratitude. She'd been puzzled by that at first, but then after a moment of thought she realized that she had not made such requests more than a handful of times since she'd become queen, whereas her father had called on Bardic, either for simple musicians or true bards, at least every two or three days. Perhaps they took this as a sign that things were getting back to normal. Well, even if she didn't feel that way, was it right for her to impose her depressed spirits on everyone else? No, it wasn't. No matter what she felt like, wasn't it her duty to put on a sociable mask? Besides, entertainments like this meant she wouldn't really have to put on more than the mask. When she thought about it, she realized that anyone who was really listening to the music wouldn't require anything from her, except that she not be dissolved in tears. So when she sent a note back to Bardic thanking them, she asked if it would be possible for them to supply musicians of the various levels of expertise to her as they had to her father, and as often. The immediate response was that they would be overjoyed to do so, and would even save her the trouble of trying to decide on informal entertainments by setting them up with her household, as they had done for Sendar. With great relief she let them know that this was perfect, and she led her court into the great hall for the concert then settled into her seat, enthroned among the courtiers, with Ambassador Isadir at her left, thinking that tonight was turning out to be something of a respite after all. And the gods knew she needed one. She wasn't feeling up to an evening of bright conversation with her foreign guests tonight. She'd been fighting melancholy all day, knowing that it would take next to nothing to make her break out in tears. Now, with not only the ambassador but his entire entourage listening with rapt attention to the musicians, she could lean back in her chair and wait for the evening to be over. Or so she thought. Majesty, are you well? whispered Lord Orthalan. He leaned over the arm of his chair toward her, his voice pitched so that it would not disturb anyone else, and to his credit he really did look concerned. She smiled faintly at him and nodded. He raised an eyebrow as if he didn't entirely believe her, but turned his attention back to the music. 
She glanced over at Harold Talamere, who did not appear to have noticed the interchange. But then it was difficult to tell these days what Talamere did and did not see. It was even more difficult to tell what he thought about what he saw. In fact, he was sitting back in his chair, eyes half closed, and he looked exactly like a statue, except that there was nothing of the solidity of a statue about him. How he managed this she could not tell, but these days Talamere didn't entirely seem to be in the here and now, as it were. His manner was often preoccupied, as if listening to and watching something no one else could hear or see. And, to her mind, there was a suggestion of translucency about him, the spirit somehow shining through the flesh. When there was something that really required his attention, he was almost like his old self, but when there wasn't, he was almost like a ghost made flesh, and not altogether contented with that state. He made a great many people uneasy, without any of them being able to articulate why. He made Selene uneasy, as a matter of fact. She could never glance at him, except in the times when he was very much in the here and now, without an involuntary shiver. And yet there were plenty of people who saw no difference in him at all. People like Ortholon, for instance. They acted in Talamir's presence now, exactly as they had acted in Talamir's presence before the last battle. Before he died and was dragged back to life. That was the crux of it, of course. Heralds, healers, and bards almost all sensed it. Talamir was a man in two worlds now, and most of his concentration seemed to be taken up with the unseen world. That was why Selene just could not bring herself to confide in him, even though that was what the function of the Queen's own was supposed to be. How could I sit there and tell him things? she wondered wearily even if he wasn't a man and as old as my father. It would be like trying to share girl secrets with a particularly unworldly priest. And anyway, Talamir had been her father's closest friend, which was only as it should have been, of course, but how could she tell him how much she missed her father and cry on his shoulder when surely Talamir missed him as much or more? It would be too cruel, too cruel for words. Talamir had already suffered so much pain, losing his own companion to death as well as Sendar and so many other friends. No, it would be too cruel to inflict further pain on him that way. As for sharing her scarcely articulate longing for, well, romance, oh no, he would never, ever understand. And she'd get a grave, well-considered, perfectly reasonable lecture about her duties as queen— and how great power required great responsibility. As if she didn't know. As if she didn't feel all that with every pulse of blood through her veins. But that didn't stop her from wanting it. Even though most of the younger members of her court were probably going to make arranged marriages in the end, that didn't stop them from flirtations and even outright courtship. After all, there was always the chance that both sets of parents would be pleased to find that an alliance had been made. And even if they weren't, well, as one young lady had tearfully put it, unaware that Selene was eavesdropping from the other side of the hedge, it will give me something to remember when I'm wedded to that awful old man. But a queen couldn't have flirtations, and of course she knew that only too well. Knowing she couldn't was bad enough, but being reminded of that fact by someone like Talamir would only make it worse. Her father would have understood. He'd been able to marry for love. He'd always said he didn't want to see her sacrificed to a marriage of state, but with him gone and with no telling what needs might arise, she had to count on sacrificing herself. She felt a lump rising in her throat and closed her eyes against the sting of tears, fighting them back. This was neither the place nor the time to display weakness. It was at that moment that she felt, with a sense of shock, someone press a folded bit of paper into her hand. Her eyes flew open in time for her to see Lord Ortholon, removing his hand from hers. Their eyes met, and he nodded gravely, then sat back again. For one brief moment an incredulous thought came into her head. A love note from Ortholon? No, surely not. He was married. He was older than her father and besides every other counsellor would spontaneously combust with rage at the very idea. 
she looked down at the scrap of paper and opened it. Selene, you used to call me your lord uncle and told me all your childish woes, she read. And if I have in recent days often forgotten that you are no longer my little niece but my queen and fully adult, please forgive an old man for clinging to his illusions longer than he should have. I have seen you fall into melancholy more than once these past few days. I think you might be in need of a friend with whom you can unburden yourself freely. If that is the case, will you honor your father's friend by putting me in that place as he did, so that this old man can begin to see the grown lady of reality instead of the child of the past? Perhaps we can help each other in our shared sorrow. Selene blinked. This was unexpected. First of all, Lord Orthalan was, above all else, a very proud man. He seldom apologized. Secondly, he had been one of those on her council that had seemed the most adamant about keeping her from taking the reins of power into her own hands. But this was an apology, and a tacit admission that he was ready and willing to see her as the queen in fact as well as in title. And the part about shared sorrow. That made the lump in her throat swell all over again. Orthalan had been her father's good and trusted friend. She hadn't thought about how he must be feeling. But that pride of his might well have prevented him from making any great show of his own grief. And who better to talk to? He was safe enough with a wife he honored. He had never ever given rise to a single rumor about his fidelity, unlike far too many men in her court. She had known him all her life. She'd cried on his shoulder before this. Who else was there, really? And she was beginning to think that if she didn't find someone she could talk to, someone besides Cario, that is, she was going to crack. Talking to Cario was a little too much like talking to herself. And besides, even Cario was getting tired of how depressed and burdened with grief she was. She looked up and met his eyes. He tilted his head to the side in grave inquiry. She nodded. He smiled. It was a sad, weary smile, the same sort that she often found on her own lips of late. She smiled back, folded the piece of paper, and put it into her sleeve pocket for safekeeping, feeling a little better already. Better enough, at least, to give the musicians her full attention for the rest of the concert. Rather than joining the people in the courtyard on their benches, Alberich paid out enough for seats on the second-floor balcony that ran along the inside walls facing the courtyard, a balcony that made up a sort of makeshift gallery. It was marginally warmer here, and the folks in the cheap seats were notoriously rowdy. When the troupe had been playing in that tent, there had been no balcony, and the expensive seats had been in the first several rows. Not so here. The courtyard was entirely enclosed by inn buildings. Behind the stage and the curtains that closed off the back of it were the stables. Not the sort of place where anyone would care to sit, so using that wall as the back of the stage wasted no valuable space that could have accommodated paying customers. The other three wings were the three stories of what was a typical market inn, with an arched passage in the middle of what was, in this configuration, the back of the courtyard leading out into the street outside. The ground floor of that wing, divided as it was by the passage, held two separate dining rooms, a tap room for the common sorts of folk, the drovers, the shepherds, the farmers who came to the market, and the second an actual set of dining rooms, one large dining room for the better-off sort, and several private parlors for the gentry, or at least those with enough money, that the innkeeper's servants called them Milord and Milady, whether or not they had any right to the title. Above that, in the second and third stories, since that wing both had the noisy dining areas on the first floor and faced the street, were the cheapest of the sleeping rooms. These were the sort where strangers packed in several to a room together, on pallets laid so closely together that the room might just as well have been one big bed. The right and left wings held more expensive sleeping rooms on the second and third floors, with the kitchens on the ground floor of the left-hand wing, and the servants' quarters on the ground floor of the right-hand wing. When there wasn't a play on, the balconies gave access to those rooms. Now, however, there were benches there, where those willing to spend a bit extra could sit along the balcony railing. 
the view was good from here, and you weren't going to find yourself harassed by someone who'd paid less than the cost of a pint for his seat. Normally, at least with most acting troops, the truly expensive seats were on the stage itself to the left and the right. Not with this lot. Their energetic acrobatics made that a dangerous place to be, and the entire stage was free of any such obstructions. Misty laid her arms along the balcony rail and parked her chin on them, peering down at the stage with interest. The courtyard was lit almost as well as the great hall of the palace, with torches in holders on every supporting beam, and shielded lanterns around the stage. The thing about holding a play at night meant that the players could actually do some things with the scenery, like a paper moon with a lantern behind it, or using foxfire smeared all over someone's face if he was a ghost. Or, as had occurred in the scene they'd just watched, the softer, dimmer light had made the shabby costumes and tinsel and paste gems of the lords and ladies at a grand festival look positively genuine. This isn't as bad as I thought it would be, she remarked to Alberich in mind speech. True, he replied. This is actually one of the plays they do privately. It was a tale of unlucky lovers, who came from feuding families, who met by accident at some celebration, and of course were life-bonded at first sight. The troupe were playing on current events by making the place of their first meeting the ice festival, which worked out very well since it allowed them to bundle up in their warmest costumes. And, of course, the feud allowed for several of the signature acrobatic fight scenes. Down there on the stage, the feud had been acted out by means of a confrontation in the first scene. Then several of the youngsters of both clans had gotten caught up by accident in the party following a wedding. The hero and heroine had met and fallen instantly in love and had retired. Down on the stage, the stagehands were scuttling about in the pause for the scenery change between the first and second acts. I suppose they're both going to end up dead in the end, Misty sighed. Alberich had seen this play before. Well, it is a tragedy. And in fact, that was exactly what was going to happen. Hero and heroine would be wedded in secret in the second act. In the third, the feud would escalate into open warfare— isolating them from one another as the city turned into a battlefield. In the fourth act, the lovers would arrange a desperate meeting, intending to flee the city and seek the help of the king. The heroine's brother would discover the hero waiting with horses and challenge him. The hero would attempt to placate him, but to no avail. He would find himself forced into the duel, the brother would disarm him, and just as the heroine arrived, fatally wound him. She would run screaming toward them both. Startled, the brother would turn, and she would be accidentally impaled on his sword, and the lovers would die in each other's arms. Not before forgiving the stricken brother, however, and extracting his vow to end the feud for all time. Not the worst of plays, by any means, and with enough action to please the male members of the audience. I see at least a dozen people I know down in the audience, Misty remarked. The most interesting thing is, though, that— Look, see that bald-headed fellow down there, stage left? The one who seems to be in charge of the scene-changing. I know him very well. The last time I saw him, he was the butler for an officious little mercer I did regular work for. I wonder how he got this job. Really? Well, that could be interesting, if he happened to recognize Misty. And even as that thought passed through Alberich's mind, the man looked up at their gallery— blinked, and peered upward at them, through the torch smoke and lantern light. He gave a tentative wave. Misty nodded and waved back. He grabbed a passing boy, said something to him, pointed at Misty, and shoved him in the direction of the stairs. A few moments later the boy clambered toward them. "'Excuse me, Mum, but Lorik wants to know if you're Misty. Misty Willinger the clerk?' the boy asked. "'That I am?' Misty replied without a moment of hesitation. The boy grinned. Well, Mum, then Lara could like to talk with you out of the play, if you've time, and could use some work, the boy continued. Cause he's got a job that needs doing. Misty grinned. Tell him thanks. Who can't use extra work? The boy grinned back. I'll tell him, Mum. 
With that, he scrambled back down the stairs, presumably to find the now vanished Lorik. Misty settled down for the second act with a smile like a cat in cream. Well, how about that for an opportunity dropping into our laps? she asked. Alberich could only shake his head in amazement. 9. Alberich and Misty lingered after the end of the last act, assuming that Larrick would seek them out as soon as the audience cleared out. It was a reasonable assumption. Both of them assumed he would not have interrupted his urgent work to send up a boy if he hadn't intended to get to Misty as soon as he could. It wasn't comfortable sitting out there in the cold on the hard benches, but both Alberich and Misty had the feeling that it just might be worth the wait. And they were right. As soon as the actors took their final bows, the audience began to shove its way out. Once the actors were gone, the audience lost interest in what, to Alberich, was actually more interesting than the play itself. In the torchlight there had been a certain something that had given an illusion of reality to the play. Now the illusion was coming apart bit by bit, and it was fascinating to Alberich to see how it had been put together in the first place. First the lamps at the edge of the stage were blown out and gathered up, and the stagehands began clearing away the properties on the stage, carrying them back behind what had looked like a false front of several buildings, made rather solidly of wood. But it was now apparent that it wasn't wood at all, nor solid, but another canvas backdrop of the same sort that the troupe had used during the festival. With no one being careful about how they moved around it, the thing rippled and waved as people went behind it. Two other bits of business that stood on either side of the canvas, hiding the edges, looked a bit more solid. They were only a single story tall, though they had a pair of doors in them that the actors had used to come and go. As two stagehands hauled off the horses that the hero and heroine were to have escaped on, Larek dashed out of one of the doors in the scenery onto the edge of the stage and peered up at the balcony. Ayla! he shouted and waved at her. She waved back. Misty, stay right there for a bit while I tie things up. Misty nodded vigorously. Evidently that was enough for Larek, who dashed back through the false door again. Tie things up, hmm? she said cheerfully to Alberich. I hope that isn't literal. That I could not tell you. I know nothing of all this, Alberich admitted, waving vaguely at the stage. And at precisely that moment the painted cloth at the back of the stage, depicting the outer walls of several buildings, dropped down to the stage with a bang, along with the pole it was fastened to along the top. Behind it was another with a forest or garden scene. It came down next, and finally a third showing stalls of a market and sky. That was the setting for the ice festival. Down it came, revealing the bare front of the stables, which was three stories tall, like the rest of the inn, though Alberich could not for a moment imagine what they would need three stories for. Well, this was a busy place, with a lot of animals coming and going. Maybe they needed all that space for hay and straw storage. A cheerful-looking little boy had been up at the top where there was a crane and a pulley with a rope still hanging from it. Apparently that was what the backdrops had been fastened to. Now he slid down from the upper loft of the stables on the rope there, and he and another stagehand began rolling up the three backdrops on their poles. With another bang, one of the two pieces of scenery that screened each side of the backcloth fell over, and two more men came up to haul it away. The second one followed in short order. In a remarkably short period of time, not only had the sets and properties vanished into the stable, so had the stage itself, which apparently came apart, although it seemed solid enough, even with all of those actors leaping about on it. That explained how the troupe had been able to get a stage into their tent that could take the amount of abuse they had been delivering with every performance. Alberich watched in fascination, until there was nothing to be seen but a perfectly ordinary-looking inn courtyard, with the stables at the rear. And that was when Larek emerged from the stable door again and wearily climbed the nearest staircase, heading in their direction. He mopped his red face with a handkerchief the size of a small sail as he came. He was a very big man, 
with an imposing belly, red-faced, with hair going thin at his temples and surprisingly honest eyes. Not that Alberich was going to trust how someone looked to tell him anything about that person's real nature. His clothing was ordinary enough, a sheepskin vest over a heavy knitted tunic and moleskin breeches. He wore shoes rather than boots, but most city dwellers did. If you had to go out in fresh snow that hadn't been shoveled or packed down yet, and you didn't have boots, you just wrapped your feet, shoes and all, in canvas, and tied it around your calves with twine. Damn me, but if making an honest living ain't the hardest work going, he exclaimed as they both stood up. Misty, where you been? I got hauled into stage manage for this idiot lot, and just when I had some work for you, you ups and vanishes. She shrugged. Army needed clerks, she said simply. Now it don't, so they let me go. Back I came. Got some work at the companion's bell, but it ain't full time. Well, that's a break for both of us, he said genially. Who's your friend? Brett, she said without batting an eye. Carter, from down country on the border. Army don't need carters now, neither. Nothing more to haul down or up. Oh, hard luck, man, the stage manager said with sympathy. Don't feel too sorry for him, Misty laughed. The army may not need him, but damn near everyone else does. He paid my way in tonight. Oto one, Alberich said gruffly, but with as much good humor as Misty, and doing his level best to minimize his accent. Bet her a meal and a rary show, and she picked this. Warn you, man, don't play cards with this one. He hoped that someone who wasn't an actor wouldn't think twice about his accent, and took the chance on actually saying something. It was worth the risk. The big man let out a belly laugh without a single look askance. Misty, you conned another country boy. Listen, man, you're lucky the stakes wasn't more than just a meal and a seat at a play. Larek responded, wiping his eyes with that kerchief. I learned that one a long time ago. Well, a man looks at her face, he don't think of card sharp, Alberich replied. He thinks pen pusher. Which she is, she is, but she's got some system, Larek replied earnestly. It ain't cheating, but she's got the cards in her head, somehow, and she can figure the odds of what's coming up. He shook his head. I can't make it work, but she can, so we know better than to play against her. You get along, Brett, Misty said in a kindly tone of voice. You got a load in the morning, and we might be a while. I can get back by myself. I'm safe enough with Larek, she added. Just go wait at the bell, and I'll catch up with you. Right o he responded as if he was just a casual friend and left, though with a lot more reluctance than he showed. He didn't like leaving her alone, even if she knew the man. He didn't like the idea that she would be walking back to the bell alone, even though this neighborhood and the ones between here and the bell were safe enough. But he had no excuse to linger once Misty had dismissed him, and no place to wait for her to finish her business with the stage manager. Now he was sorry he hadn't scouted this area beforehand and found some place he could have holed up nearby. If she was going to actually get involved with these people... Still, she had her throwaway purse just like he'd taught her. If someone tried to rob her, she'd toss that purse away and run in the opposite direction. And the three sheaves was very public. Even near the sleeping quarters, there were people coming and going all night. If something happened, her companion would be out of the bell's stable in a trice and on the way to help. Surely she couldn't get into trouble, he hoped. He returned to the bell alone, going in through the hidden door in the back of the stable to the secret room. There he changed his disguise for his gray leathers, and waited impatiently in the herald's common room for her to return, sitting right at the window so he could see her when she did, or at least see her if she came anywhere near the front. She won't, Cantor reminded him. She'll use the back just like you did. Albert, she's more used to moving around in a city than you are. Well, that was true enough. Especially this city, at least the reasonable parts of it. It felt like half the night, rather than just a candle mark or so, before he heard, rather than saw, the herald chronicler at last. I'm back. Everything went smoothly. 
It's a distinct advantage to go disguised as yourself. Don't get yourself in a knot, Albridge, she said cheerfully. I've got good news for you. Just let me change into my uniform. He signaled a girl and ordered hot wine for both of them, knowing that by now she must be frozen. She was, thankfully, faster at changing her clothing than most women he had encountered. The hot wine he ordered was barely on the table when she came in, lenses glittering in the lamplight, and fogging up in the transition from cold outside to warm and humid inside. So, she said without preamble, sliding onto the bench across from him. She took off her lenses to polish them on a napkin before replacing them on her nose. Here's what we've got. You want to know how Norris started up this whole show in the first place? All information is useful, he admitted. So I've learned. She took a sip of wine. There were a lot of people displaced by the Tedrils, as you know, and quite a few of them ended up here in Haven. Your boy Norris is supposed to be from near the Rethwellen border, and managed to get separated from the entertainment troupe he'd been with. Larek didn't say how, and I didn't ask. Supposedly he hitched up with a caravan, doing acrobatics to amuse everyone around the fire at night, and ended up at the Three Sheaves along with the caravan. Supposedly the rest of his group was going to come up to Haven and find him, and they never did. He wasn't minded to sign up with the army, but he was running up a big bill at the inn, when he got the idea to put together his own new troupe from some of the other ragtags of entertainers that were drifting in, so he could pay that bill without getting put to work in the kitchen. That's the story, anyway. I suspect at least part of it's true. He's definitely an actor, and he's better than anyone else of the bunch. He's got them all charmed, that's for sure. And now that they're doing just as well as he promised they would, there isn't a one of them will hear a word against him. I don't know if he's from Rethwellen, because he's damn good at putting on and taking off accents. He did at least four in my presence. Alberich almost choked on his wine. You saw him. You talked to him. Misty shrugged. It was after I made the bargain with Larek. We were looking over the office I'm going to use. He swanned in with two women on his arms. Larek told him I was going to be checking the books. He looked at me saw a dowdy lump, wafted a little charm in my direction just to keep his hand in, and promptly forgot me as soon as he turned around and headed out the door. I told you that it's useful being a clerk. Nobody ever pays any attention to us. Even that business with card counting. Lorik's the only one who ever caught on I was doing it. Everybody else just figured I was lucky. Evidently so, Alberich managed. How close a call had it been? He wished he had been there to see Norris's reaction with his own eyes. Anyway, here's the thing. The innkeeper is the one taking in the receipts at the door, because he takes his room and board for the troop right off the top. And now that they've gotten popular, Larek thinks he's skimming. But nobody else can manage to cipher for the numbers that they're bringing in of an evening now. So, from now on, I'm going to go every night they're putting on a play, which is once every two nights, and go over the books, the head count, and the innkeeper's tally. She grinned. And I'm doing it all from the room next to Norris's, which is Larek's office, which means that I'll be in a position to tell you when he's there, where he's gone if he isn't, when he's likely to be back, and to leave my own window open for someone to come and go. If you want to search his room for papers, I can make it happen. Alberich stared at her. And for how long will this go on? That I don't know, she admitted. Lorik wants me to come regularly at first, then taper off. He thinks, and I agree with him, that if the innkeeper is skimming, it's going to be better not to confront him on it. Just bring me in. They know what I was at the Three Sheaves, and they'll know why I'm in Lorik's office with the tally boards. If the innkeeper knows we're watching him, he'll be honest and by comparing the take over time, we'll know if he's been honest in the past. And knowing that Larek has me on tap will probably keep him honest when I stop coming around. So, earliest dawn, the best of our chances will be. Alberich didn't like that particularly, but there was an old saying that beggars didn't get to pick what they were given, and another that it didn't pay to inquire too closely about the age of a gift horse or in my case, the color of his eyes, Cantor said wickedly. And Misty was right. The best way to find out what Norris was passing was to search his room for the papers before he got rid of them.
which meant that Alberich was going to have to find a way to copy them, because they might be in code, and he certainly wasn't going to be able to memorize them even if they weren't. Is there perhaps a way to copy such things? he asked. Several, she assured him. Robbings, if he's using graphite or a crayon. Damp paper transfer, if he's using ink. I can show you. We do that all the time to make emergency copies. Of course, she added judiciously. When you do that, you get a mirror image, but that's no great problem. Alberich took in a deep breath and let it out in a sigh. Misty, very well have you done, thank you. She made a face. Well, if you're doing the dangerous bit, and I assume it'll be you climbing in that window and not some lowlife from around Exile's Gate that you hired. I'm doing the tedious part. Here I was, pleased I'd finally gotten out of doing accounts, and here I am back into it. Then she sighed and looked out the window. And on top of my real work, too. Worse it could be, Alberich reminded her. On the battlefield we could be. She gave him a wry glance. Well, she admitted, there is that. I'll try to keep it in mind when I'm trying to hide you or throw you out a window because your lad Norris came back early. And there just wasn't much he could say to that. So wisely, he said nothing at all. But as Misty had pointed out, just because they were involved in this after-hours clandestine work, it did not make their normal duties go away. He had his full set of classes to train, and as the season edged towards spring, the snow began to thaw, and the blustery winds began to blow. It became more and more of a challenge to hold classes out of doors. At least that wretched game of Hurley was put on hold, for the ice on the ponds was getting rotten and not to be trusted, but the ground was alternately frozen mud or slushy snow, so the game couldn't be transferred to some sort of playing field. And, oh yes, he had already heard that there were plans afoot for that, though the players would have to run rather than sliding. The next thing he'd probably hear was that the heraldic trainees were going to try it companion back. Meanwhile, the replacement mirror finally arrived and was installed. The two miscreants who began that particular adventure were as responsible for creating the new one as destroying the old one, being the ones who had spent an interminable amount of time polishing it to rid it of as many defects as possible. Both deans decreed that their term of punishment at the glassworks was at an end, although they would still be serving double chores at the collegium for well into the summer. They had missed the entire hurly season and whenever an animated discussion of the game began, their faces were a study in adolescent disappointment. Alberich wasn't at all surprised. If ever there were two rascals who might have been born to play a game like Hurley, it was those two. And it occurred to him that this alone might be the worst punishment that could have been inflicted on them. They had missed out on the creation of the game. They had missed out on becoming some of the first experts. From now on, the best they could hope for was to play catch-up to some other ascendant star. And in a way, he felt just a little guilty, for if it hadn't been for his own curiosity about where they had picked up their wild ideas, he would never have investigated the actors, and never have known that there was something going on. He still didn't know what it was, of course, but at least he knew there was something. Now he had a fighting chance to discover what it was, and whether or not it was dangerous. Nevertheless, he had an important duty to perform right there at the Collegium, and it was one that he could not give less than his total attention to during the hours when he was teaching, and no few of the hours outside of that time. He was training those who would one day become heralds how to stay alive, when other people wanted them dead, and that was a massive task. It began with the youngest or the least experienced, not necessarily the same thing, as his tutelage of Misty had proven, and the basic skills of hand and eye, coordination and familiarity with weapons. And while they were learning these things, he was studying them, to determine what their lifelong weaknesses would be, for there had never been a person born who had so perfect a physique that he didn't have one, and how to make them aware of the fact. Then he would move them into the next stage of their training how to compensate for those weaknesses. By then they were roughly halfway through their years as trainees. 
They had mastered basic skills, and they were as strong and flexible and coordinated as they were ever likely to get. There were exceptions to that last, of course, but those were the exceptions that proved the rule. If they had found him a hard master before, he was harder still at that point, because no one, no one ever likes having a weakness pointed out, and human nature is such that when one is pointed out, the natural reaction is to try to deny it exists. Which was why he would go from master to monster at that point, until not even the most persistently self-delusional could continue to believe anything other than that the problem was real, and something had to be done about the problem. Sometimes the weaknesses were physical, restricted peripheral vision, for instance. Sometimes they were mental. Often they were emotional, and the biggest lay in the very natures of those who were chosen as heralds. These youngsters did not believe in the goodness and decency of their fellow man. They knew it. It was fundamental to their souls. And he had to somehow prove to them that their fellow man was very likely to plant a knife in the middle of their backs without destroying that deep and primitive knowledge. As heralds, they had to go into every day expecting that the people around them would all act as ordinary, fallible, but decent human beings who, given the chance, would act decently and humanely. They also had to be prepared for the eventuality that those around them would do nothing of the sort, and be able to cope with such a contradiction without going a little mad. Not that all heralds weren't already a little mad, but not that kind of mad. Then, once the weaknesses had been identified and acknowledged, he had to train them to compensate for the weaknesses. It would have been infinitely easier to do this had his students been, say, car-site cadets. Only physical and mental weaknesses would have to be dealt with, because emotional weaknesses literally did not matter to the sun's guard so long as they were locked down tightly. And he could have proven those weaknesses to them with sheer brute force— by persistently attacking them at those weak points until even a blind man could see what was wrong. Persuasion always took a lot longer than hammering something home. He was generally in that last stage only with those who were in the last year of their trainee status. It was far, far easier to work with these trainees, who were quite ready for whites, if only they had a little more experience and skill. For them he was a mentor, not a monster. It had occurred to him, and more than once, that here in the Collegium the trainees were put through a kind of forced maturation process that sent them out into the greater world at eighteen, nineteen, or twenty with the mental and emotional skills of someone well in his thirties or older. Alas, most of his time was spent in being the tyrant with the heart of stone. This was never more true than when the energy level of those in his class was such that the students were near to bouncing off walls as they entered the door of the salle, and he turned them right around and took them outside to run their drills in the mud, the slush, the half-frozen snow, and no matter if it was too wretched out to be doing any such thing. Cold, dampness, and dirt weren't going to harm them any. If they got too cold, he knew the signs and always sent them back into the salle to warm up at the oven. Not that there was any chance of getting cold enough to fall ill, unless something odd happened to keep them standing about soaked to the skin. The blues, of course, were exempt from this if they chose. However, if they declared their unwillingness in such a way as to be insubordinate, rather than merely electing not to show up for lessons, he had a weapon to either bring them to heel or get rid of them entirely. Such as today with one of the classes that was in their middle and most difficult period of development, and they roared into his sal already in full antagonist mode. The battle lines were already drawn, blues versus trainees, one ringleader facing off for each side. The insults were flying, blows would follow in a moment, except that Alberich waded right into the middle of it and sent both of them to the floor with a blow to the ear and the silence that descended was absolute. Well, he said crisply, before it begins I care not how it started nor who started it. You brought it into my cell. You will take it out again. There will be no second mirror to be replaced. A nervous titter came from behind him. He didn't turn to look. Neither boy had moved, and he gave them both looks that should have turned them to ice. 
I said, he enunciated carefully, you will take it outside. You wish to fight well enough. Outside. It ends when I say it ends, and I will be the judge of the winner. The trainee on the floor had the sense to go pale. He at least must have some inkling of what Alberich meant, which was to let the fight go on until they were both too exhausted, bruised, and battered to stand. There would be no winner, short of one of the two being knocked unconscious, which, with the bare hands of a pair of boys fundamentally unskilled in bare hand fighting, was unlikely. This was, actually, why Alberich did not teach bare-hand fighting to anyone who had not passed into that third and final stage of development. But the blue was one of Alberich's personal headaches. Arrogant, assertive, and unfortunately skilled enough to have earned the right to a part of that arrogance, Alberich would have gladly rid himself of the boy, Cadale Corby, if he could have. Unfortunately, that was out of his hands. Cadale was in the class unless and until he took himself out of it. The boy looked him up and down and sneered. No, he said. Someone gasped. Alberich did not move and did not change his expression by so much as a hair. I do not believe I heard you correctly, he said evenly, trying to suppress the thrill of glee the boy's insolent answer gave him. What precisely did you say? I said, no, I'm not going outside. No, I am not fighting by your rules. Who are you to give me orders, old man? Alberich smiled, and Cadale took one look at the smile and suddenly realized that he had made so fundamental a mistake that there was not going to be any evasion of the consequences. I, he said quietly, and with the perfect and precise control of Valdemar and grammar that came upon him in moments of stress, I'm the Collegium Weapons Master. As such, when I choose to exercise my rank within the four walls of my cell and on its grounds, I outrank by Valdemar and law every man, woman, and child in Valdemar, save only the monarch. And within these four walls, the monarch is my equal, not my superior. And it was all perfectly true. How else could he properly teach the sons and daughters of the highborn? How else could he train high-ranking guards? How could he drill the greatest warriors and nobles of the realm? How could he ever train the heirs, if he did not outrank them? To properly train there would be injuries. They might be serious. And the weapons master could not be held responsible for such injuries. To be trained the weapons master must know his orders would be obeyed, and the only way to be sure of that was to see that his rank on these grounds was higher than anyone else's in the land. Which was why, though he had not learned this until after Daythor had retired, he had that special status within the sal and on the grounds. Cadale looked as if the blow Alberich had given him had knocked every particle of sense right out of his head. He stared, he gaped. He looked as if he could not rightly understand a word of what had been said. But, and since you choose not to abide by the laws of this my kingdom, Alberich continued, still smiling, I banish you, now and forever. What? Cadale stammered. Out. Go. Do not ever present yourself as my pupil. You may tell your father why you are not here or not. I care not. I will report this matter to the Queen the Lord Marshal, and the Provost Marshal. Since you are not a trainee, I shall not trouble any of the deans with it. You can't do this, Cadale protested wildly, paling. Alberich knew why. Cadale's father had watched Alberich fight and train the guards for months before the boy had been sent to the salle with a class. Cadale's father knew that there was not enough money in Valdemar to purchase the services of a trainer as good as Alberich. Cadale's father would be very, very unhappy about this. I can. I have. Alberich eyed the boy consideringly. Should he? Oh, go ahead, do, Cantor answered. He bent down and grabbed the boy by the back of his tunic and hauled him to his feet. Without much effort, be it added, Cadale was just about Alberich's size and weight, but he was still an uncoordinated adolescent, not a trained, honed warrior. 
Alberich tightened his grip just enough that the fabric half choked the boy, eliminating any more babble out of him. I will, because you do not seem to understand your own tongue properly, repeat myself, Alberich said with no anger whatsoever. You are banished from the cell and its grounds. You are no longer a student here. You are leaving now, and you will never return. If you do, I will personally thrash you until you cannot stand and throw you off the grounds again. Training here is a privilege, not a right. You have just proved you do not deserve to enjoy that privilege. And with that, he frog-marched the boy out the door, down the path, to the very edge of the training grounds. And with great care and utmost precision he pitched the insolent brat right into the biggest, muddiest patch of slush that he thought he could reach. He did not even wait to see if Kadeil went headfirst into it, or managed to somehow save himself. He turned on his heel and marched back into his cell. No one had moved. This was good. He wasn't going to have to discipline anyone else. Yet. He raked them all with his stony gaze. More objections, do I hear? he asked, raising one eyebrow. Silence. Then outside you will go, all of you. He turned a stern gaze on the trainee who was still sitting on the floor. Osberic, that was the boy's name. Osberic, he continued, and the trainee flinched. Since no opponent you have now, yet equally of guilt you are to have brought a fight within my walls, it will be me that you face. Fetch two staves and follow. Even practice swords I will not ruin in this muck. He would not be too hard on him. Putting him on his face or back into the mud two or three times would be enough. He started the fight, Cantor put in. Not that Cadale wasn't trying to goad him into starting it, but he did start it. All right. Four. Teach the boy to hold his temper. Good answer. I'm going to watch. Alberich smiled as he walked out into the cold again and saw that there was no sign of Cadale, other than a vaguely human-shaped depression in the slush. Please do. The boys had formed up in a rough circle, and Osberich came up to Alberich with two fighting staffs and a hangdog look. Alberich took one without looking at it. Consequences, Osberich, he said as he squared off against the boy, who began circling him warily. Say I will not that a herald loses not his temper, but aware a herald is that consequences there are for doing so. His staff shot out at ankle level, tripping Osberic. Down he went. He picked himself back up and aimed a blow at Alberich's head. Alberich blocked it, reposted, and let the boy block him. So think you. Had there a fight been, what consequences there would be? Uh, Osberic tried again, was blocked again. Lord Corby would get me in trouble? Wrong. Alberich flipped the staff at Osberich's ankles. The boy dodged, and Alberich flipped the other end around to thwack him in the buttocks and send him into the slush again. Lord Corby would protest to the Queen, who would be forced to go to the Dean, who would have to answer to why discipline was so lax among the trainees that a highborn fought a trainee. Osberich picked himself up, flushing. My fight would get the heralds in trouble? Correct. Alberich let the boy try a few more blows. Not bad, but he wasn't going to get through Alberich's defenses any time soon. And who else? The Queen? Osberic hazarded. Correct. Now, why will there be no trouble for what I did with Cadale Corby? Osberic didn't answer, being a little too busy fending off a flurry of blows from Alberich, only to trip over a hardened lump of snow and land on his backside in an icy puddle. That should count, Cantor said from the sideline. I agree. Because, Alberich continued as Osberich picked himself back up for the third time, a proper and correct order gave I. Insolence I was given. My proper authority I exerted. No temper, no beatings, no punishments, and only when more insolence and refusal was I given did I remove Cadale with prejudice. To his father he will go, yes but his father will likely box his ears. Now, know you why I am drilling you thus? Osbrick came at Alberich yet again. Alberich let the boy drive him back. To punish me, 
Osbrick shouted, his cheeks burning with humiliation. To make me look stupid in front of everyone. No, that would the act of a bully be, Alberich told him. So that should Lord Corby protest it was you who began the fight, I can tell the Queen that you were punished, and all here will swear to that. This is not for you. It is for the heralds that all know that we tend to the misdeeds of our own in our proper measure. He then neatly sidestepped the last rush and tripped Osbrick as he went past. Once again Osbrick measured his length in the mud. A herald cannot merely right be Osbrick. A herald must, guided by the law, be. He cannot dispense the law if he follows it not himself. He cannot dispense the law if he thinks himself immune from it. He cannot dispense the law if he will not deal it to his fellows in the same measure as he does to those whom he has in charge. Yes, sir, Harold Alberich, Osbrick groaned from the ground. And that is why, for fighting, you have also been punished in this way, Alberich continued. Now back into the cell, there is work to be done. They were all quick to follow the order, but none so quick as Osbrick. 